This is Jocko Podcast number 339 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I awoke face down in blood-soaked sand. The world spun around me. What little sounds I could make were muffled and indistinct. It was like I had been twirled around on an old tired swing, then flung into a swimming pool. I couldn't gather my wits any more than I could get my bearings. The harder I tried to get a handle on the world around me, the more slippery my grip became. My eyes strained to adjust to the scene. Pain sunk its fangs permanently. We have just been hit by rockets, I assume. This must be a coordinated attack. My confusion turned to panic. Oh God, oh God, please God. The sounds that surrounded me became clearer. I could decipher some individual words, but they seemed only to add uncertainty. Who is groaning? I heard gurgling as someone tried to force air through a blood-filled throat. The wounded and dying were bellowing in both English and Arabic. Screams of death filled the air. Rage filled our hearts. Medic! Medic! Allahu Akbar! I propped myself up as much as I could. The inch or two that I was able to manage was not enough to make a significant difference in my field of view. I thought I heard the reports of rifles. Is that AK fire? I need to start helping my guys, I thought to myself. We're being ambushed. Shock was setting in. I desperately tried to locate my weapon and return fire, but I was totally unable to move. I wanted to figure out why, but I couldn't get my body positioned in a way that would allow me to look toward my legs. I could see both of my arms and my chest. My arms were definitely broken. Osmosis was spreading blood throughout the sleeves of my uniform, but I could still move them, sort of. I propped myself up again onto my side and peered down toward my legs. But when I finally looked downward in the direction that my legs should have been, All I could make out was thick black blood and a pile of muddy entrails. I am cut in two, I said aloud, unsure whether I was talking to the dying men around me or to myself. I ran a bit of organ through the fingertips of my left hand. I was certain that it once belonged to me. Where did it fit in this mess? I searched the jumbled human remains that rested underneath me and wondered exactly where this little organ went, but I couldn't complete the puzzle. My mind drifted. Distractedly, I wondered what was going what it was going to be like to die. Certainly there would be no way to save a man who had been cut in half. Oh God, oh God, oh God, the screams filled my ears again. I'm hit, Johnny, medic. Was that me yelling, I wondered? I tried to look for the frantic American voice, but all I could see was dark red sand, limbs which had been flung from their torsos, bloody men writhing on the ground, begging for death to end their suffering, and hundreds of empty sandals. Lying there, Still rubbing that piece of what I believed to be a pancreas between the tips of my fingers, I again contemplated what was going, what it was going to be like to die. Was I going to cross over into some other dimension and meet Jesus like I had been taught my entire life? Or was it all just going to go black, like slipping quietly into a slumber, a sleep that one never comes back from? Please, don't let this be my final resting place, I thought. Not this shithole. Not now. And that right there is an excerpt from a book that is called The Glass Factory, written by Braxton McCoy. And the shithole that he was referring to was a shithole that I'm familiar with, a place called Ramadi, Iraq. And the title of the book, The Glass Factory, is a title that anyone who served in Ramadi instantly knows. And I have talked about The Glass Factory on this podcast a couple times. I've talked about it on the Unraveling podcast as well. The Glass Factory 
was the place of a horrific attack where suicide bombers detonated themselves at a police recruiting event, killing over 50 Iraqi police recruits and also two Americans. The Americans that were killed, Lieutenant Colonel Michael McLaughlin of Mercer, Pennsylvania, and Sergeant Adam Can from Davie, Florida. And there were scores of wounded Iraqis and Americans as well, many of them severely wounded. One of them was a young soldier who is also the author of this book, Braxton McCoy. And it is an honor to have Braxton here with us tonight to talk about his experiences in war and perhaps more important, his lessons learned after the war and how he followed the path toward the truth. Braxton, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me, Jocko. Great to meet you. And I know uh, you sent us this book a, a while ago, years ago. And somehow, I look, I, I, I get sent uh, uh, hundreds of books, actually. And I just, it slipped past my radar. And it wasn't until I was on Twitter. And I think someone tagged you and me and said, hey, Jocko was just talking about the glass factory on the podcast. And you came back and said something like, he got it mostly right. Couple errors, which, you know, of course. Uh, I, I, I said minor, minor errors, though. Yeah, minor <laughs> errors. Uh, but, you know, of course, I, I know I'm not going to know everything. I don't ever claim to know everything. But as soon as I saw you had a book called The Glass Factory, that you were wounded there, you know, I said, hey, man, you, 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 you know, you said, hey, do you want this book? And I said, absolutely. And said, let's talk about it on the podcast. So here you are, man. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, thank you. It's really kind of crazy to be here. <laughs> Hearing you read my book is kind of weird. Uh, man, it's a re- it's a great book, and I, I should start off by saying this: you never know what you're going to get when you read a book. And I think one thing that one thing that you can measure a book by is how vulnerable someone is willing to be in order to convey what happened to them. And this book is raw, and you talk about things in this book that I know had to be hard as hell to write, and that's one of the things that make it so powerful. And the other thing that makes it so powerful, even though, look, it's a book, definitely there's there's a chunk of it that has to do with war, and there's a chunk of it that has to do with the struggles after the war, but the most powerful part of the book is you figuring out how you needed to live in a proper way and it's it's just an epic book it's an outstanding book and so anybody that is listening right now jump on there we'll 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 have it on our website and go go buy this book immediately we're going to read some of it today there's no way i could read the whole book I know that you're working on an audio book right now. No. So eventually you'll be able to buy that. But you know, actually never mind the audio book for now. The the cover of the book is awesome. And what's the deal with the cover? I read a little bit about the cover of the book, but where'd it come from? Uh, the guy who designed it was a medic there that was at the glass factory with me. And uh, we I told him I wanted I told him I wanted it to be look like the windows, you know, the the brass over the windows over mm-hmm. there and the copper stuff. But with a, I wanted a buffalo on there, so he kind of worked it in. Yeah, it's a it's a very distinct cover, and plus it's well, this version is hardcover. So are there still hard covers available? There's like maybe three hundred you can get on my website. Those are as good as gone. <laughs> <laughs> those are as good as gone. Anybody that if you can get the, one of those three hundred, get it, order it. What's your website so people can order? BraxtonMcCoy.com. BraxtonMcCoy.com. So. There, we just sold all those 300 books. Um, and then the other ones are available on Amazon. Those are soft cover, I'm assuming. Yeah. And we, we, we actually, you know, without getting goofy political right off the bat, we tried, we tried to work on getting another print run, and white paper stock is short, like, mm-hmm. everywhere. So, or 
at least the publisher that we had before, and then we tried to use a different publish, publishing company mm-hmm. out of Idaho, and they couldn't do it. Check. We so. might have to talk to other publishing companies that other people know, like mine, <laughs> <laughs> figure out what we can do. Uh, all right, so the, again, the, this is a very interesting book, and one of the things that's interesting about the book is it, it basically starts off with the attack on the glass factory. But, and, and it doesn't, you have flash, some flashbacks throughout the book, pertinent flashbacks, but there's no detail, there's not much detail on how you grew up. And probably that's the next book you should write, uh, is just some of the experience that, that made you who you are. But before you write that book, since you're sitting here, let's talk a little bit about you know how you did grow up and where you came from and how you ended up being who you are. So, where'd you grow up? I grew up in, well, I lived before Utah uh, Salt Lake Valley started to get expanded. There was a place called the Rose Canyon Estates up. There's a bunch of just small ranches and ranchettes up south of Salt Lake. It's now kind of all the same valley, but back then it was like, I don't know, 25 miles of town or so that I'd go to school every morning. And we had just a little horse operation out there. My my mother and father divorced, so my mother married uh, my stepfather when I was four, and so we were, you know, pretty much been in my life. And he's, I, so what was going on in the horse ranch? Like, what were you doing? Uh, when I was a kid? Yeah. Man, uh, <laughs> uh, feeding and watering and hitting <laughs> golf balls and shooting arrows into the haystacks and, <laughs> and <laughs> shooting rabbits and lizards. And, man, I'd get home from school and get my chores done and go grab a backpack and throw a water bottle in there and get my baby gun and just head up the mountain because there was nobody behind us. Mm-hmm. And there was this creek called Yellow Fork. And you can go up Yellow Fork all the way up and just shoot every bird known to me. I, <laughs> <laughs> I must have smoked 500 woodpeckers this time I was 13. <laughs> and my grandpa had a thing for songbirds. He just loved songbirds. And I kind of get it now as I age. I like having them around my place too. So if I got caught shooting songbirds, I get in big trouble. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But woodpeckers all day. All day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, did your stepdad have any military experience? No. No, his father's a... Uh, his father was a – he grew up on a ranch in Scipio, Utah, which is where we ended up moving when I was 13. But he, World War II – or right after World War II, I guess, he joined the Navy, ended up an air traffic controller, eventually ended up an air traffic controller out here at Top Gun. Huh. And then he got out and uh, came home to the ranch and sold it. He said, I never want to do another day of farm work in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and moved up to the city, and uh, he was an air traffic controller for – uh, Delta Airlines or something, I don't know, Salt Lake International uh-huh. for years, and then he ended up moving back after he retired. And so, and, and what about your mom? What did she do? She was uh, she worked for Cisco as like a food sales rep for a sure. while, and then she went to, into real estate. Now she's a real estate broker. And your what, what grandfather, the grandfather that you write about in the book, what, primarily what was his background? He was a Marine and then a plumber. Uh, he's a plumber my whole life, just big time outdoorsman. Uh, he was all like everything for him was hunting and fishing. I mean, work, working just so he could get out and hunt and fish with his grandkids mostly. Dude, I got pictures of me. I'm like two years old in his cowboy hat with a damn deer leg in my hand, like walking around deer camp. <laughs> like that was his jam. So, and that was my mother's dad. And then you said you moved from one ranch to another ranch when you turned 13. Yeah, we moved down. We sold. Uh, we sold out up there and then moved down to Scipio, Utah. And my stepdad had about 40 head of horses down there, and or, yeah, roughly 40 head. And then he's an electrical contractor, mm-hmm. helped make ends meet. And then the horse market went bust pretty hard back in 20, 2000, let's see, what was that, 2002 maybe? I can't remember the first time. Anyway, when they passed the, the no-kill bill. Oh, the, yeah. I can't remember if it was 2002 or 2004. And anyway, it hit hard. I mean, there was good horses on the market for nothing. People were just taking their horses out and turning them out in the desert and stuff. Like, go on, live free. I mean, those horses just died. Yeah. They have no idea what to do. No, I, 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 the reason I said, oh, yeah, because I read an article about that not too long ago about how people were just letting their, mm-hmm. dom- I guess their domesticated horses go. Yeah. And they're not ready to survive out there. Well, especially most everybody has gildings. And no no wild horse herd is going to let a gilding in. I mean, the stud's just going to kill him. Mm-hmm. It's not a mare, and it's you know it's a eunuch, and he doesn't need that around. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you maybe mares could make it, but but even then, it's doubtful their hooves are not 
they're just not built for it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really bred out. How does a horse kill another horse? Uh, they kick, by, like so. A lot of times they'll break their backs, like stud horses. They'll get up on their hind ends like this and flip them, <laughs> um, break their necks or backs, and bite and kick. And I mean, they can kick. Uh, if they kick, a horse kicks another horse in the head, it kill it easy for mm-hmm. sure. I had a horse kill one of my cows last fall. Kicked it. At least that's all we can figure out to it. Cow was fine. Next day was still <laughs> <laughs> there was a horse around there. So. Uh, now you were, you were pretty into sports too, right? When you were going, yeah. when did you start like wrestling and what other sports did you play? I didn't start wrestling until I was a freshman in high school. Um, I played baseball growing up and did some boxing. My family's friends with, uh, Jim Fulmer was a family friend or Gene Fulmer. I'm sorry. I was a family friend growing up. And so did a little getting punched in the head for a bit. <laughs> uh, and then I got in, it was, a. it was, I think there was like a middle school. That's what it was. It was a middle school PE you know, uh, where you'd go through like all the different sports, oh, yeah. be like badminton and shit like this. But then there was like <laughs> a, a red a wrestling section. And I was like, man, I like this. So well compared to badminton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. So then uh, my mom signed me up at the treehouse with Yvonne Ivanoff for a while. Uh, that was in Traper, Utah. And I was like maybe an hour drive. And so I was taking his classes for a bit with like Cam Jones and some of these other studs from like high school wrestling studs uh-huh. and Cam went and wrestled college. But, uh, and then uh, then we moved and I went, or no, I wrestled that first year at Riverton High School. And then after that, I went, moved down to uh, Fillmore. And did you still wrestle when you got to Fillmore? Yeah, Scipio, yeah. What, what year was this? What year did you graduate from high school? 2003. How did you do wrestling, and did you make the state or anything? Yeah, I, yeah, I won districts my senior year, and then at state, uh, I ended up. I was man, it sucks so bad. I got super sick. I had to drink. Yeah, my wrestling, my wrestling coach and I still talk about this all the time. But I was weighing in with a gallon jug of water, trying to Oof. get up to weight because uh-huh. I was wrestling at eighty nine, and I just was burnt. I like, just didn't weigh enough. You know, you got to make the one sixty weight limit. Uh-huh. I wasn't making it at state. Well, plus. Uh, two pound allowance, I guess. Uh-huh. So, anyway, yeah, I, str- I struggled that year. That's still pretty impressive that you only started wrestling your freshman year and you made it to state in your senior year. That's yeah, pretty impressive, man. My man, my junior year, I think I was probably a better wrestler, but I got in trouble. Um, I was kind of an idiot. And what'd you do to get in trouble? Um, this is where the good stories <laughs> come on, man. So, well, I uh, <laughs> I got. Me and my stepdad got in a fist fight, and I got kicked out. We, he and I had butted heads since I was little, big time. And I ended up, we got in a pretty good scrap. And anyway, we, had, we couldn't live in the same places anymore, so I went to live with my other grandpa in Salt Lake, and I went back to Riverton that year, Riverton High School, and uh, I just was an idiot, you know. I was like, <laughs> just not going to school. Man, and my dad, my whole life, my biological father was like in and out of jail and stuff, in and out of prison. And For like, what? What was he doing? Man, I, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I get stories. I don't know what's. I know at least one thing was a white collar thing, and I know there were some violent things, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know what you know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> like I don't know. I don't. So I, he he was out for a minute, and so I was like, well, I'll just live with him then, and that was a bad idea. That lasted for like. Man, he was out for like a month or something, and then being a stepdad's like a tough, like a really tough job. Yeah, and he's man, he's I don't want him sitting. He had some issues mm-hmm. of his own, mm-hmm. so man, like whiskey bottles in the damn grain bins and shit. <laughs> I can be out trying to feed horses. You're like, oh, here's some rich and rare. <laughs> so, Check. when did you? So you were hunting your whole as growing up your whole life. Oh yeah. Bow hunting too? I started bow hunting at about 14. Okay. My cousin Cody Hassan got me into it. He's uh, actually, I think last week, I think it was, he went and tried out for the world team. Dang. For a uh, uh, stick bow. Dang. Yeah, he's pretty solid. At what point did you start thinking about joining the military? Uh, I, You know, G.I. Joe and shit as mm-hmm. a kid. Oh, I yeah. always thought about it, you know. <laughs> but I was, you know, what I thought for sure I was going to go into the military, but then, like, there was nothing going on, mm-hmm. you know. I'm like, I don't I mean, I don't understand why anybody would join without a war. <laughs> like, what's the hell's the point? So then I was just, I, you know, for so anyway, anyway, went through a stretch where I thought I won't do this, and I was an f off and just riding bulls and just being dumb and partying and every other thing that young cowboy kids do, chasing girls and such. And then nine uh, eleven happened, 
and I was, this is when I was actually at Riverton High School. So you were what, a sophomore maybe? Sophomore. Just starting your sophomore no. year? Yeah, sophomore year. Yeah, sophomore year. No, junior Good, year. Oh yeah, because you said you graduated in 03. I was a junior. Because yeah. I was at Riverton, because my sophomore year I was at Millard. Um, yeah, and we were sloughing school, and which, you know, it's like the first period of the day, but we were all over at my cousin's house, and one of the kids that was there was a, uh, I can't remember if he's from Pakistan or whatever, but anyway, a, a friend of ours was from the Middle East, and he was there with us, you know, watching this stuff go down, and I feel like that always kind of helped me, mm-hmm. like, view things differently. Mm-hmm. Um because he was still a buddy, mm-hmm. you know. But we so we saw the towers come down. I was like, man, I want to go. I want to go fight over there, you know. So I finished up school and then, or well, actually, I enlisted as a junior. Uh, I was first recruiter that talked to me. I'm just enlisted. And I was going as soon as it was over. And you just the first recruiter you talked to was an army recruiter. Yeah, that was that. Yeah, I didn't know crap, man. Mm. My grandpa didn't really like the Marine Corps very much, and the only thing he says, "I'll kill you if you join the Marine Corps." <laughs> <laughs> he told me that at least a dozen times growing up, uh, and so I thought, well, it's not the Marine Corps. So. Wait, w- w- did your grandfather fight in, in w- which war? Or no, war? he 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 split Vietnam and uh, Korea. Mm-hmm. And then his bro- his two little brothers went over to Vietnam, and I think he was bitter about mm-hmm. that. I I mean I've never I never asked him why mm-hmm. he hated the Marine Corps, so I really don't know. I'm just, I know he had a tattoo of a bulldog over here, <laughs> and when he was older, he used to say I used to say Grandpa, or when I was little and he was older, he said Grandpa, what's that? You know, he said oh, it's a picture of your grandma. <laughs> 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 so you did you know what kind of job you were having in the army? Did you even know no, that no. the army oh, had jobs or no? Well, I mean, not really. No. I, so, so he shows me this video. Okay, this is the recruiter. Yeah. Uh huh. I almost want to say his name, <laughs> but he uh, he's not a bad guy. He just did bad things. But <laughs> so he shows me this video and he's like, "Check that out." And these dudes are like jumping out of planes and shit. I'm like, "Oh yeah, that looks bad." Hundred <laughs> percent. You know? Yeah. I'm like, he's like, "This is what you want to do?" I'm like, "Hell yeah!" And he's like, "See that one guy?" And it's like the I'm assuming it's the Echo, the 18 Echo or mm-hmm. whatever. And he's like, see that guy with that radio? I was like, yeah. He was like, he gets paid six extra grand to join if he carries that radio. And I, was like, I mean, that's not exactly how he said it, but mm-hmm. he's like, you get a signing bonus, and all you got to do is carry this extra 20 pounds of gear or whatever. You know, and he's like, you're tough enough to carry 20 extra pounds, aren't you? I'm like, oh, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he run that racket before, had <laughs> Yeah. He's playing psychological mm-hmm. warfare. You're tough enough, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was just, yeah. I still, It still frustrates me. So, I mean, I don't hate the guy. It worked out, but. So that so what did you enlist as? Did you have an MOS when you enlisted? Yeah, it's a comm job. It's a thirty one series comm job. It's thirty one uh, uniform. They changed it, but I think it was a thirty one uniform at the time. And it's like just like signal something. I, I honest to goodness did not a single thing of signal. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I had I had dudes. I I, I could barely feel a singar when we were over there. Like uh-huh. I didn't know shit. In fact, one time I was dating a girl, and she was like, "What's the smartest thing you ever did when you were over there?" And I was like, "What are you talking about?" She's like, "What's the thing took like the most brain power?" <laughs> and I was like, uh, "I set up a tax at one time on this island." And then I was, I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh, shit, I just carried it. I was like, but I really, you know, <laughs> you didn't even say it. I didn't even say it. But, but really in my head at first I thought yeah. I did. But then I remembered I gave it to Adam and he set it up. So. <laughs> and you joined the National Guard, right? Yeah. Did you yeah. know the difference between the National Guard? No, I, I don't. I, I swear to you, I think maybe 20% of kids at that time had any idea what was going on. Mm-hmm. It's like small town Utah has a bunch of those. National Guard recruiting stations. Right. They don't know. Yeah. Uniform says the same thing. You don't know shit. Yeah. Unless you have like a family member that's in or something. And then that's different. Which my buddy who I enlisted with had a family member that was in. So that would have been. Did they tell him what was up? Did he know what was going on? Here's what I think happened there. His, his brother-in-law, really good dude, I think was like, let's not get you guys sent over into a meat grinder. Got it. I think that's. If I had to guess. Little did he know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. The guard thing works out better for me because had I been in an active unit with that shit MOS, I would have never did anything. I would have been stuck in a freaking comm oh, cage the entire time. Yeah. So it kind of worked out. Yeah. So you did you go to boot camp in between your junior and senior years? No. You So you had to fully graduate. Yeah. You fully graduated. A delay, delayed entry or mm-hmm. whatever they called it. And you, so you fully graduated. At what point did you 
know that you were going to be activated and sent to overseas? I volunteered for it. So we, I got to, so I went through basic training and then they- What did you think when you got to basic training? I'll tell you. So my recruiter, <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I always tell people, I'm like, when you get to boot camp, you're not gonna like me anymore. There's gonna be two to three weeks where you're like, Jocko, I hate that guy. If I ever see him, I'll take a swing at him. Cause <laughs> no matter, almost no matter who you are, when you get to boot camp, you think, uh, uh oh, <laughs> this yeah. was a mistake. Yeah, especially them first three weeks. But then yeah. toward the end, it starts to be kind of, right. you're like, this is cool. And so I went to Fort Benning, but Pogue side, Fort Benning. And again, you wake up every morning screaming infantry and all this shit. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. And then, <laughs> so, um, my recruiter had also, he put me through MEPS with the airborne physical and all this stuff. He told me how to airborne on my contract, all this shit. I get into boot camp. And, you know, like two weeks before when you're at Benning, they call up and there's like, everybody with the airborne on your contract, come here and line up. I come line up, you know. I go in there and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you ain't no fucking airborne on your contract. Let's get out of here. So. It yeah, wasn't even in your contract. He, he went as far as to put me through the airborne physical. Yeah. But it wasn't in your contract. Yeah, like why go through the physical if it's not like why no one else does. Um, so anyway, I felt like I got kind of – but it worked out. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to complain, but I do feel like he – I'm a little irritated. So I'm salty <laughs> like, <laughs> like tw almost 20 years later about this. Um, but when you're, going in, when you're going through boot camp in the National Guard to be a reservist, you must also – that's like make it a little bit more comfortable – because you can find some comfort in the fact that like, God, well, at least I didn't go active duty. Sure. Whereas if you're active duty, you're like, oh, this is the rest of my, this is the next six, four years of my life is to be in the, surrounded by these crazy people yelling and screaming because you think that's what the military is like when you go to boot camp. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess, but I just want to go to the war, man. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got back to my unit after AIT and all this stuff. So you went to boot camp, AIT. Were you kicking ass in AIT since you killed so many freaking woodpeckers growing up? <laughs> were you like, <laughs> no. did you, did you, were you marksman expert and all that stuff? I mean, I shot fine, you know, I don't think I was, but, but the, the triggers on those were really hard to get used to the M16 mm -hmm. trigger at first, but I mean, I shot fine. What about, what about just like being out in the woods and yeah, just oh, feeling yeah. good about all that? That was great. Yeah. Did you kind of kick ass in the AIT? Yeah. Especially like the FTX stuff. I mean, it was like nothing, man. It's like all these dudes are all worried about like three days in the mud. It's like, bro, <laughs> it's, like, it's like camping, man. <laughs> the only time it sucked is when it uh it banning on our final ftx it rained which i think is true for like almost anybody that goes through banning but it rained for like the entire time so all of our hasties were like water up to our chest and stuff mm. like that you know in fact what, uh, one time during night guard my buddy you know he had your, your ankles interlocked and hasties or whatever mm -hmm. well he was on he was sleeping and i was up and it was his turn i turn around and there's a wolf spider like this big Jeez. and i put that sucker on his just right. <laughs> I just tapped him. I woke up. His eyes are like, you know, you can't make noise, you know. So his eyes are like, I'm trying to get it off and shit. Anyway, yeah. Um, I was in Fort Lewis, Washington. I was going through SEAL tactical training, which is what what you do when you're a new guy. And we there's some pretty heinous mosquitoes where we were. And I had learned to carry a, a mosquito. I would just carry like a like a one yard square of mosquito netting. And that way, if we laid up, I could just take that thing out and just put it underneath my floppy hat and, and tuck it in my collar and I'd be good to go. Well, my, my, the officer that was in charge of us bought, brought like a full on mosquito net like you see, I don't know, like maybe in some British a uh, colonist would wear in like <laughs> Africa in like 1875 or something. You know, this big giant screen with the wicker uh, bands around it pushing it out. And so we're in this layup position. And this other friend of mine didn't have any net. And a lot of guys actually didn't have any net. And so my buddy was sitting there catching mosquitoes and putting them into the dude <laughs> while he was sleeping, catching mosquitoes. And so the mosquitoes were actually trapped inside this guy. He woke up in the morning. <laughs> so I got a kick out of that one. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, though? So you, 
you you put the spider on the dude. Oh yeah, yeah. It just it was just funny to watch him <laughs> spaz out when he knew he couldn't make noise. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mosquito. This mosquito one's better though. So you feeling good at AIT? And the war's no, in full it. swing right now, right? So what year is this? Uh, t- this would be 2000, 2003. Or no, uh, what was that? 2004, 2003. Probably getting in. You, you said you graduated in 2003? Yeah. And you went right to boot camp? Uh, there was a couple month break because I was doing concrete. So I did concrete. So I must have went to boot camp around October, mm-hmm. something like so that. So it's probably 2004. Could have been. Well, that would have been. No, because... No, because, well, maybe it was. I can't remember. I'm sorry. It no. could have been 2004. I'm just trying to think time, phrase of what, time frame of what was no, going it could on have been in Iraq at the time. Because we shipped. Oh, shit, maybe. I'm sorry. I keep doing this. Now, I, now I'm thinking. We shipped out on January 21st of uh, 2005 for mm-hmm. Iraq. So it probably was 2004. Yeah. Yeah. So you got. When you got done with it, it's like 2004. So the war is going, but it's not gotten crazy yet in 2004. No. It's yeah. still like pretty low level conflict happening in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you got, so you got done with AIT. Then what happened? Did you go home and you would get attached to your unit? But you didn't deploy right away, did you? Uh, it wasn't very long. I can't remember how long, but it wasn't very long at all. I, I went to the first drill thing. And I was like, this is horrific. Um, what, going to drill? It was just, <laughs> I, I, dude, it was terrible. Because you wanted to be a Well, and it's also soldier. just, yeah, and it's just like sitting, doing radio shit. Oh. And like in a, a cl- like a office and stuff. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not about it, man. <laughs> so <laughs> as soon as there was somebody deploying, uh, they said they had, they, so I was in drill. I can't remember which iteration drill was but i was in drill and they they said they had someone downstairs doing srp to go or it was an srp um what's srp i'm trying to remember i'm trying to remember if that's the right well it's like where you're getting all your checking all your paperwork vaccinations getting stood up to go out i can't remember the right if that's the right acronym but anyway they were downstairs doing that crap and they said that they had slots and so i went and talked to my first line leader and i was like i want to go you know, I want to go on this. And he was like, fine, you know. So he let me go down there and go. How long did they do extra training? Did they yeah. atta- Who'd they attach you to to get ready to deploy? Gronsky's 28th ID. Um, they sent us to, so after we, yeah, and so that was actually, yeah, so we went straight from there to, from Utah to uh, uh, Mississippi, just north of Hattiesburg. What the hell is that? Camp Shelby. And we did a couple of months at Camp Shelby, and then we did a month rotation at NTC, mm-hmm. and then we shipped after yeah. that. And how was that? Did you feel like you were getting pretty well prepared? Yes. Well, because by then I, they put us, they stood up an actual PSD element, and so we had a separate training uh, cycle. We had the same cycle, but separate training pathway. So other than like company live fires and stuff like this, we were all getting spun up by and most of the ocs were like rangers because the they were the only ones that had really been doing psd mm-hmm. for real so we had good ocs i felt like and training was pretty good it was better training than i got anywhere else so you immediately got attached to a group that was going to be doing psd which is per, uh, personnel security detail that's where that's what they told you your job was going to be yeah they pulled from within the unit and <clears throat> and developed a psd element because they didn't have one and then you went to you ended up going to ntc which is in fort Irwin, California, which is freaking awesome training. I mean, yeah. they have whole cities set up and villages and role players and pyrotechnics. Did they have all that stuff for you guys? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were you feeling pretty good about it? Man, we were living in those circus tents <laughs> yeah. for like 30 days. <laughs> that part's not fun. <laughs> yeah, the training was good, I feel like. Yeah. But the two uniforms for like 30 days in that circus tent was not my favorite. But. Now, at this time, Ramadi is start. Do you know when do you find out you're going actually we, to Ramadi? Like, you don't know. Day before we shipped. Or <laughs> Get some. <laughs> was like, they were just, they just kept telling us, take this training serious, man, because you might have to use it, you know, that kind of stuff. And you'd hear like grumblings, Sunni Triangle, you'd hear this kind of stuff. And uh-huh. like, All right. Okay. You were ready to rock and roll. Dude, I want How, to how old were you at this point? 19. Yeah, hell yeah. Just young and dumb, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so then you get done with that. Now it's time to leave. 
did you freaking blow it out before you went overseas? Yeah, we uh, yeah we went. <laughs> we spent some time in Louisiana for a minute. <laughs> Check. Uh, and and when you feel when you're leaving, what's your what's your parents saying? What's your mom saying? Oh, what's my, your grandfather saying? Are they worried sick? Yeah, my mom for sure was. My grandpa just didn't say much, honestly. Um. He really never did about any of this. But my mom was definitely terrified the whole time, for sure. She wasn't happy. And I yeah. just, almost, I just like, kind of laughed a little bit. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm horrible. Because I'm thinking you're 19. Like, there's nothing else in the world you want to do. And your mom's just horrified by the whole thing. And Sorry, I, Mom. And honestly, as a father now, I got three boys now. I have a daughter and three boys. And I think about it all the time. Yeah. I think it be, must be much, much much worse to send a kid off to war than to go to war yourself. Yeah, it would have to be. And I've also always felt that it would be worse. Like when I was overseas, I think it was worse for my wife than it was for me because I know what's going on. Yeah. If I die, it's kind of like, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not really going to like care too much. I mean, I guess no. I would be bummed for that split second. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, my wife is going to be you know stuck with all these kids and everything so i don't know i always felt like uh it was much harder for the people that are staying home than it is for the people that are going overseas yeah but worse even still for kids i think like the children of yeah parents, you know? yeah i think my kids were actually too young to even understand they were mm, between the ages of like i guess seven and three Mm. Is that right? Yeah, seven and three or something like that. So I don't think they really even comprehended. And I don't know. You know, like one thing with me is I never I never like wore a uniform home. Mm. In the SEAL teams, you just don't. You just, you know, you got all your shit at work and you just put your uniform on to get there. When you get done, you put on shorts and a T-shirt and flip-flops and you go home. Mm. And your kids just don't even know what's happening. They don't understand any of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um they just think you just go to work sometimes and you travel. I don't know. I don't think my kids really connected it too much that they were that I don't think they had the mental capacity or understanding to actually worry. Mm. I don't think they worried at all. I don't, I don't think they worried one second. Not like my I'm, my wife did, you know, especially when she was going to, you know, going to the hospital, visit guys and stuff like that. Um, I guess when the kids are a little bit older. Yeah, you're probably right about all that, though. Yeah, it's like when I think even now when I go hunting for a week or so, I probably worry more than my kids do, or miss my kids more than they miss me. Yeah, know, yeah. Until I get home. Yeah, I had my buddy Leif. Uh, you know, he's got young kids right now, and he was talking. He's like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you went on deployment. Like with, you know, he feels bad when he goes on a work trip for a week. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and I get it. You know, and maybe it's because, you know, he's older than I was at the time, and and I guess I had a that like kind of mindset that was a little bit maybe not super good <laughs> yeah. uh so you find out a day before you find out you guys are going yeah it was, it was it was either like a day or two before it wasn't long i mean i don't think it was a week was, did, you, did you know anything about ramadi yeah i mean we were, we were watching the news mm-hmm. i mean and yeah flu had happened about eight months or so mm-hmm. before something like that uh maybe a full year when was Phantom Fury? May? Yeah, something like that. So yeah, about a year before flu should happen. So we had you know, we had some idea. Uh-huh. And but, every all the bad guys pushed into Ramadi at that time. Yeah. At least that's the story we always heard. Yeah. Well, I think it was pretty accurate just when you look at the level of violence from Fallujah and then the level of violence in Ramadi at that time, it definitely flared up a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you guys just fly over in like a C-17 or something? How'd you get over there? No, we flew over in uh, like Delta or something. It was like a, a civilian jet. To where? To Kuwait? Yeah, we flew into Kuwait. We Yeah, we went from Mississippi and then fueled up in Maine and then from Maine to Shannon, Ireland and then from Shannon, Ireland to Kuwait. And then you get to Kuwait. Now they throw you on C-130s to bring you into Ramadi or how'd no, you get I there? No, I drove you up. You drove up? Huh. Yeah. We, we were, Your whole unit? No, they flew them up, but our team was security for the log pack and all that. And all Got that. it. So we drove up. So I drove through Navstar. 
And so now it's 2005. Yeah, now it's 2000. But what month? I think May. No, June. It was June, I think. June of 2005. Yeah. You're rolling up. So that's a freaking transit right there. Yeah. Because speaking of the SUNY Triangle, you're going right through that trip. It's a whole SOB, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, the first day was not, I mean, it, it was interesting. You know, once you cross those gates in there, it's like oil wells on fire and stuff and bullet hole cars here and there scattered, but there's really not, like, anything going on in mm -hmm. the south of Iraq. So for the first day, the first nine hours, I, I, I can't remember if it was uh, – so we left Buring is where we rolled out of in Kuwait. And the, was it Scania might, well, might have been the first stop? Um, I think Scania was the first stop. And anyway, so throughout that, like, nothing happened. And then – but other than, you know, just kind of taking in the culture. And it is, it is a for real culture shock. Like southern Iraq, you know, you see, anyone who's spent any time in Mexico, you've seen poverty that's different than poverty in America for sure. Like, But the poverty in the south of Iraq is a whole new level. I mean, dudes, like, stealing pieces of tarps from Americans just to, like, patch holes in their tents and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a shock. And then, you know, kids coming up asking for water and food and, and this kind of shit. You know, that was, like, new. Or if you get slowed down somewhere, dudes wanting cigarettes, tapping on your window, you know, like, so it was, um, it was interesting to just sort of, it was kind of a, it was, and in some ways it was good to get acclimated, but nothing really happened on that first two days. And then on day three, we ended up hitting, a, well, I mean, it didn't detonate, but ended up discovering an ID. The lead truck did, and this was between Fallujah and, and Baghdad. And so that was like our first real experience with doing anything for mm -hmm. real in country, you know, how many vehicles, like, just estimate like how many vehicles oh, are in this log pack is this like a 40 vehicle I, I it could have been more than that so it's massive yeah it took it took like six hours or something i can't remember three or, it took hours and hours to fuel up you know all these i can't oh. it took a long freaking time oh man <clears throat> so when so when did you finally pull into ramadi how many days did it take you to get there three three days you pull into camp ramadi and they what what's that like? I mean, settling in, you get get moved into a barracks or what, where'd you where'd you guys stay at? No, yeah, Tent city. No, <clears throat> they didn't have any of that yet. There was a big, there was a big MWR building at the front, and they mm -hmm. just put us up in that. You know, where they had that boxing ring and that stuff in there. Okay, they just put us up in that in cots for a week or two. I can't remember, but it was easier. I think it was easier for us in some ways to transit for for the people that were going to go outside the wire. I think it was easier for us for the first, like, mentally for that first week because when we hit that, when we hit that, uh, or didn't you know, when I say hit, it didn't detonate. But when we hit that IED, it's kind of like, you know, uh, bathed in fire in some ways. Like, you just see all, like, what this war is really about to be for the next year. You know, it's like middle of the night. They can't, The Marines that were helping us, they came, you know, tapped on the door and were like, hey, we need help. You know, and you want to go? I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I want to go. <laughs> so it's like AT4, and, you know, like, let's go. And so it was me and uh, Johnny and these two Marines went out up this deck cord. So what they, they'd they found, an IED, and, you know, it's like, honestly, after I'd been there for a while, looking backwards, it's a very obvious setup, right? There was an IED, and then the dude's prayer rug and his driver's license was just left there. You know, it's like... <laughs> Or his ID card, not driver's license. But um, so th we were told we, we don't have time. You know, EOD can't make it. Whatever. Uh, just trace that debt cord, and if it goes into the house, because it was going out into this compound, you know, mm -hmm. like olive orchard type stuff. It's like uh, if it goes into the house, just frag the house and come back. And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was so freaking stoked, man. <laughs> so we we hit the edge of this compound, you know, under knobs. And this is you. And then two Marines and your buddy Johnny? Yeah, my first line leader at the time. Yeah. And well, I guess he stayed my first line leader, but uh, it was before I got promoted. Um, and it was, you know how they'd have those big, obviously you know, but they'd have those walls, you know, cinder block walls. Mm -hmm. Well, there, this one had a gate that was locked, and then it had a, you could see there was a hole in the sides. So we're like, well, we'll just go through the hole. So we go around, and as we come around that hole, you could hear a generator running. Uh, I just assumed that it was in the back or something, but you could hear a generator running, and then this dog starts barking, like this little yappy dog. 
and we're like in my mind the only thing we got going for us right now just four men is that nobody knows we're here you know within this compound i don't exactly want to take plunging fire in this compound with mm-hmm. just four dudes very badly so now i'm like i can't wait to blow that effing dog up man <laughs> like, i'm trying to hit that dude with my frag <laughs> so i'm thinking that as we're coming around uh toward the front of the to the toward the front of the home and then once we take the right uh you know so we skirt in the house here and then take a right toward its actual front and you could see the deck cord going into the house and i was like oh yeah man this is it's about to be on <laughs> so we go around the deck cord and then there's a like uh, kind of a half ass like a stoop not a not a true porch but like a stoop and on that stoop was these sandals all laid out in like succession and you could tell it's like mm-hmm. dad mom you know son older daughter and then baby daughter with like these little two inch pink sandals man that i had a i had a little sister i still do but i was very close to her at the time she was like six or seven at that time and man that hit me like a, a freight train you know like whoa you know it's not it's you're not just killing bad guys mm-hmm. all the time you know so what ended up happening we can went all, <clears throat> we went all the way around <laughs> It ended pretty good, actually. We went all the way around, and the deck cord came out and went into his uh, orchard in the back. So we traveled through it a little bit, and then one of the Marines said, hey, I'm going to pull a pin flare out or pop a pin flare, and Johnny didn't hear him. So I'm, like, over here, like, in a small echelon, and Marine pops out the pin flare, and Johnny just hits the deck. (laughs) (laughs) So I got a good kick out of it. But we stopped there for a minute, and we just see that the deck cord was going out somewhere, and there was two dudes up in another home on a balcony smoking cigars, you know, with AKs. I was like, well, anyway, depending on the situation, but – we weren't, you know, we didn't, nothing happened. Mm-hmm. But so you just walked back to the vehicle. That's basically it. Up. But the thing is, like, almost guaranteed those dudes were waiting to see what we would do. Like, almost guaranteed they were the ones that set it up and everything. And, I mean, what are you doing smoking cigars on your deck at 240? Yeah, I, you can't, you, unfortunately, you can't even answer that question because they would be doing the most wild, crazy, <laughs> like, unknown true. things <laughs> that you'd ever true. have imagined in a million years. It's, that's true. You know, like, like for instance, 240 in the morning. I mean, I had a guy approach a target one time, and my Terps yelling at him, and the guy's, like, got carrying a box with him. And he's walking towards, we're assaulting a target. This was in Baghdad. We're assaulting a target. And this guy's walking up, looking super suspect. And my Terp's like, hey, there's 50 cows pointed at him. And like, like, hey. And so finally, I just like, I just like aggressively approach him. And, or no, we told him put the box down. So he sets the box down at his feet. And I get over, I so I, so I go like grab this guy. And as I'm going to grab him, he like pulled something out of his pocket and I'm so close to him. I had my weapon. I like smashed his hand with my weapon and he dropped this little remote that he was carrying. Oh, shit. And yeah, it sounds all cool. Here's the deal though. This dude was drunk. <laughs> you know, once we got to the bottom of it, he was drunk and in the box was a video machine and he had been over at his buddy's house watching porno mm-hmm. and getting drunk with his buddy. Mm-hmm. You know, and he I almost smoked him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you might uh, have deserved it. But they do some dumb shit, man. Oh, yeah. And so you never know. Uh so what you're saying is since you had a little bit of experience driving up there, the guys that the guys that arrived via air were sort of had to get used to going out in town. Yeah, they didn't they didn't get experience any of the culture, you mm-hmm. know, or at least even not necessarily that we experienced, but even get a taste of mm-hmm. it. So their first time interacting was maybe not the best day. Yeah. You know, and we gotta have, kinda ease into it a little bit. So then what was your data what was your what was your mission? So your mission as a PSD guy was to protect people, you know, important people, whether that's a battalion commander, a brigade commander, support I don't know, support EOD clearances. That was basically what you were doing. Yeah, well, yeah. But then the command, the our principles never really left. So we ended up just doing whatever came down. Lots lots of QRF stuff, lots of EOD support, uh, quite a few like log packs. Those are the most miserable missions on the entire. You got to drive all the way around Lake Havanaya, and <sighs> absolutely nothing's going to happen except for you're going to get smoked with an IED. Mm-hmm. Like there's just... 
yeah those were terrible because they're boring and it's just like a crapshoot yeah you know? boring and waiting to die at the same time yeah <laughs> it's like the worst <laughs> so we that's like mostly what we were doing uh and then we you know a few raids come down here and there and need somebody and we go do that stuff what was your op tempo like uh it's it varied a lot uh, it, yeah, it just varied a ton. It depended, or pr like if we were doing like prisoner transport, then that would be like a two day boring ass thing. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing with log packs. But then if we were back home and there was none of that going on, then we might have a little higher op tempo, you know, mm -hmm. just wherever's coming in and out. But you were basically work. Would you say you're working every day? Yeah, for sure. Definitely working every day. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Rolling outside the gate every day. day. Off. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think we had a day off until they brought in. I don't know if they did this, you guys probably not, but they ended up bringing in shrinks. Uh, I can't remember what month. It might have been December. I can't remember what month it was. Anyway, they ended up bringing in shrinks to, like, that. the Army was starting to have a problem with PTSD stuff on mm -hmm. at home, but they were still kind of PTS back then, I think. And so they brought in these shrinks, and it was like, if you've done this many missions outside of the wire in this amount of time, then they were pulling you off the line and putting you, like, on a guard tower. Uh, For how long? Two weeks. Mm. Off the line, yeah. And when they did that with us, I was telling my first song, I'm like, "Top, this is the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life." <laughs> <laughs> you can't. I mean, yeah. You, you don't want to come in and just get soft, you know? Yeah. Like so. Yeah, and then also you might start to not want to go back out again because you know you get that you get time to too much time to think about it. Haunt you. Uh, was there any missions that you did? that stood out to you that were particularly uh, interesting or important missions? Uh, not really, man. We did, I, I was a normal dork guy, man. I did a lot of cool stuff. We did a raid with, we just supported 1st Marine Recon one time on a raid between Ramadi and the Syrian border. They'd, someone, once we got Predator drones, they discovered this compound out there that nobody even knew existed. It was like out in the sand dunes. Mm -hmm. I think call it uh, Big Wadi Farm, I think. I hope that's not, I, mean, I hope that's not like some classified shit or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't think Big Wadi Farm could be that classified. <laughs> 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 if it is, they need to work on their freaking classification <laughs> Well, system. I know that's what we called it. <laughs> okay, then yeah, you're yeah. good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, that one was cool. Watching Recon take that down was pretty cool. But, like, we just did normal, like, day-to-day. -day. Try not to get blown up, you know, try to shoot the people that need to get shot and not the ones that don't. Um, I mean, just really, it was kind of – that's why when I was writing the book, you know, I, I had just, like, a very basic normal guy's soldier's story. So I don't think there was any, for me, it didn't seem like there was any sense in going into all these little minor, you know, this day we got shot out here. Like the first time I took sniper fire was for sure memorable. Um, in fact, I'll tell you that story really quick. We were out on, do you remember Trooper Recon? It was just outside of the, the yep. North Gate. Yep. Before they had fortified that, we just had a, we just had like a big Texas barrier up there. And we were just sitting there waiting. I can't remember where the heck we were going, but we were staged to go somewhere. Yeah. And anyway, we just take two or one round first and then another round, but it goes right over my gunner's head who was sitting in, in the Humvee on the gun, you know, but he's just daydreaming, you know. <laughs> and it goes right through. They had a piece of camo netting. It goes like right through the camo netting. And he hit. And he, he looked like uh, when you, I, if you ever slaughtered a bull when you shoot him, and it's almost like their legs come up and they hit the ground <laughs> like a cartoon. <laughs> that's like what he did. We thought he was dead, man. Like it sounded like he just piled up in that Humvee. And so I was like, where's he shooting from? Where's he shooting from? And I was like trying to find where he was coming from but also not keep my head out for you know five minutes at a time <laughs> so we're like moving from side to side up and down just trying to peek and then finally i said the only thing this could be is this covert like there's nothing else it could possibly be so we radio up and we radio up and we're like hey we're gonna go get this you know this this is or we're gonna go check this covert it's the only place we can figure that we get shot at from now it's also possible that he was just like out in the desert somewhere and shooting further than we thought they were capable of. But when you see a handful of Iraqis shooting at you with like AKs with no front sight posts, <laughs> you know, like you're not you, thinking they're pulling off the 1100 yard yeah, shots. Exactly. You're looking at that culvert that's 200 yards exactly. away. There he is. <laughs> so we, the captain 
is like, I want to go out with you guys. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. So we wait and we wait. And it had to be 15, 20 minutes. Had to be. Waiting for the captain to show up? Had to be. Could have been longer. So by the time he gets there, we're all talking. We're like, there's no way this dude's still there. There's no freaking way. He's just going to lay there for 20 minutes. Like, <laughs> he's, he, oh, they're dumb, but they're not that dumb. So the captain gets there and we roll out and he's like, okay, you know, we so we got truck here, truck here on this side of the covert. And I was like, I'll go in. And I pulled the flashbang out and he goes, McCoy, don't you throw that flashbang in there? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, could be a, a UXO or, or a, excuse me, an IED in there. And I was like, okay <laughs> he's like well i want you to set this ied off while we're standing on it and i was like dude i'm not going in that without throwing a banger bro i think i'd much rather have the flashbang <laughs> set the id off than mccoy yeah no. <laughs> That's freaking crazy. i'm like it's not happening man <laughs> and he he goes uh if you if you throw that flashbang in there i'll write you an article 15. And I said, get your fucking pen out. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. I know it sounds pretend. I swear to God. <laughs> so I throw it in there. And this is how you know it's a true story. Because I throw that sucker in there. And I jump off. Johnny comes in. I mean, we're going in. And I panicked myself. So I saw my own banger. And I thought it was UXO. So I was like, UXO, UXO. <laughs> I'm trying to back out. And Johnny's like, what? I'm like, UXO? He's like, sure, it's not a fucking flashback. I like, yeah. What's UXO? Mind. Unexposed or unexploded ordnance. Oh, so he damn. flew his flashbang in there. It went off, but there's still like little chunks yeah. of it, you know, that are sitting there. <laughs> he <saw> that. <laughs> that. I'm just an idiot. Backed out to get his freaking article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, that's classic. Man. He, he, and that captain was a good dude. He just, I don't know what he was thinking on that one. He didn't write me an article 15. Yeah, I mean, it, man, it's hard. I'm assuming that he was fresh in country as well oh yeah, yeah and he you, was young man you have no idea of like what's going on when you first get in country you have just no idea it's hard and a young guy like he was he 25 or something 24 yeah. i don't know how old are they roughly when they yeah he's probably captain. something like that probably maybe 20 maybe 26 something like that but yeah he's not old takes four years takes four years to make captain yeah. or make oh three so he might have been 20 yeah so he's like 24 maybe 25 yeah um, and he doesn't know anything. He doesn't leave the wire. He's, you know, he's running a battery. Like, he isn't, you know. You know, uh, just on what you said earlier about, hey, you were just a regular soldier. All of my guys, we all just, we all looked at you all like, damn. Because you guys were out going out there, like you said, every single day you're going out there to do random searches of culverts where you're just taking fire from it, just like shit like that on a daily basis. And you, uh, we we just held all of you guys in the highest regard for what you guys were doing every single day. You know, we'd come back and we'd go out and up and come back and we had good chow and a place to chill out a little bit. And if a guy was like tired, it was like, okay, you know, and you guys are just getting that tasking every single day. There's another thing I've talked about where it's like, I don't know which one of these, there's, there's a different psychological impact a lot of times, army guys, like we'd be working with army platoons, and they're like, oh, this is what we're getting tasked to do. We're going to go out and patrol this area. We're going to go out and clear this this block. We're going to go out. They're just getting tasked with what they're going to do. They don't have any real say in it. Mm -hmm. And we had a complete, we had complete control. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, this is what we want to do, then we'll go do it. Mm -hmm. If we didn't want to go do it, we wouldn't go do it. Uh, like, pretty much, we just made up what we wanted to do. And there's pros to that because... You know, you can say, hey, I don't think this is a good time to do that. But also when something happens, it's 100% because you said, hey, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a different uh, psychological impact, depending on who you are, of how it ends up in your brain. Because for us, anyways, on that deployment, we did what we wanted to do. We picked and chose exactly what we wanted to do. We watched army guys getting tasked. Hey, you're gonna go out. You're gonna, you know that road you got IED on yesterday? Yeah, you're going down it again today. Mm -hmm. You know the one you got IED two times before that? Yep, you're going down that one as well. And guys just had to grit their teeth, and oftentimes just that was the mission. They go execute it. We had more flexibility, but then again, like I said, that means when something does go wrong, so there's only it's 100 percent on me. As mm -hmm. yep, that's my mission. I'm approving it. Let's go. Um, but yeah, you guys, you know, you talking about you just being a normal, oh, I didn't do, didn't do much, no big deal. Um, going out there every single day into that city, 
is a freaking salute to all you guys. Uh, how often would you say you were, you were taking contact when you guys would go out? Um, we we didn't. There, a lot of guys got way worse than us. We didn't take it a lot. Um, we really didn't take it a lot because we would also end up on dumbass like log pack shit. Mm-hmm. You know what like I'm saying? So then we're way out and to quantum, but even on stuff like that, it's like ID every single time mm. or every other time or something. Uh, but in town, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, I, I don't know if anybody didn't at least get shot at every mm. single, like you couldn't, you sure as hell could not go down route Michigan and not at least have someone <laughs> shoot at you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I had some guys over in, in Eastern Ramadi and I was briefing the Colonel of the siege of soda for awesome guy. And I was just briefing them on what we were doing, how we were doing it. And I said, you know, sir, my element that's out in Eastern Ramadi, they've, they've, been con- they've been contacted by the enemy the last 23 operations in a row. And then my intel guy or my talk guys came in like while I'm saying that and they're like, sir, just to let you know, troops in contact and the guys in the house like, I said, sir, make that 24 <laughs> times in a row. Uh, so yeah, you were gonna, definitely going to, the enemy was there. Yeah, the enemy sure. was definitely there. Well, it didn't help that everyone was just retaking the same ground every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, and every every idiot on the line was saying it. You know, like, this makes absolutely no sense. What mm-hmm. are we doing? You know, we eventually ended up starting setting up cops and stuff like this. But in the beginning, it was just essentially glorified presence patrol mm-hmm. after presence patrol. You know, <sighs> it's just very stupid stuff. But yeah, I mean, like I say, other guys are doing way more than we were too. So like, way more. So. Um, from a leadership perspective, what did you see from the good leaders that you work for? What did you notice about them? What made you want to follow them? Uh, for uh, integrity is huge. When somebody, from a leadership perspective, it's in, uh, when, actually maybe integrity is not the right word. Yeah, uh, if when you start seeing your like your brass bullshitting you, you know. <laughs> It, it's you. I mean, it's really hard to get that trust back. Like, just don't bullshit me. Tell me what it is. I mean, I, I don't want to name anybody or even tell certain stories. But there was a couple where it was like, man, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and here's just a little warning for leaders: if you think that your frontline troops don't know when you're lying to them, you're so wrong. You tell that frontline troop that. Hey, they'll know this is no, don't worry, because we're going to do this later, or this is what's really happening. Everybody can see right through it. Mm-hmm. So, if you're lying to your people, they're going to know you're not smarter than them. They know exactly what's happening, and you can't bullshit these guys. Um, so, don't try and do it. Yeah. Like one time, one of them came up with this plan. Uh, I don't want to say who, but he called it Operation Decoy. And we had a, Apache gunships for the day, you know, but it was like supposed to be two weeks out or something. And the plan was that our team would just take our trucks and roll through until like IEDs went off, you know. <laughs> I'm like, hopefully you see them, right? But we're like, listen, man, what, what? <laughs> you're going in lead vehicle. Bitch. <laughs> yeah, like what is this? You know, <laughs> like you're just happy you got some helicopters. <laughs> it's like you're just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we ended up not having to do that one, but that was legitimately the plan. And mm-hmm. yeah, my my NCO was like, "Nope, you can bust me. We're not doing this." Check. Um, with that, um, that kind of covers uh, some of the stuff leading up to anything else you want to cover leading up to Glass Factory. No, that's fine. All right, let's get into this book, man. Again, book is called The Glass Factory. You're gonna hear me read parts of it. That it has got. It's great. It's great story. You're a great storyteller, but the internal dialogue that's going on in here of what your thoughts are, the pr- progress you're making as a person is um, it's a, it's just an outstanding book. So get the book. Here we go. In. The Glass Factory starts like this. The whole recruitment push had gone smashingly thus far, but we were on our fourth day of this same drive and we had already hugely surpassed our initial goal of 200 new recruits. The men of Ramadi had lined up in droves for the opportunity to become one of the guys chosen to fly to Jordan for the high-speed training the U.S. government had funded for them and later returned to their hometown to clean it up. In fact, we had processed hundreds of candidates already. The catch was this was going to be 
day four of this particular mission and we had only been promised three peaceful days. The problem was all the spots that we had for these future Iraqi police had been filled days ago. This was all just for show. No one on our team felt like it was a good idea to put ourselves at risk for almost nothing, but we were soldiers and that's just part of the job, or so we are told. When we got into our home V, I cracked a joke. Well, let's go get blown up, boys. I was just trying to cut the tension, probably mine more than any others, but I'm not sure it had the desired effect. Um, actually, talking to General Gronsky on here, you know, he talks about the fact that as he looks back, he's like, I, the four days in a row didn't need it, shouldn't have done it. You know, that's, that's his, that's what he feels. Um, that's what he said. And, you know, you're in a, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, well, I know why I did it, though. We, the, the thing that was frustrating for us was day two, they had shot us. I mean, they missed wildly, but they'd shot at us with rockets. And then day three, and that's just, I mean, maybe they were just shooting a camper model, mm-hmm. but they, like I said, they missed wildly. Day three, two dudes sat at the bus stop for like four hours, <laughs> and we reported it up. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, who's, first of all, what, what are they waiting for? You know, mm-hmm. um, so anyway, we reported that up. And, but the reason, you know, to defend Gronsky here, the reason that he went on with it is we had guys process and queer up until like midnight and it was dark and we turned away a couple hundred people. Got it. So he didn't want them to feel like they didn't have the opportunity, even though no one was having the opportunity by then, yeah. but just the show of that. At least that's, that was my take. And, and then just from a strategic perspective here, the goal was to have the local people from Ramadi join the our Ramadi police and then police up their own city so they could they could fight against the insurgents there and as you said there's hundreds of them that showed up so that's pretty awesome that's a pretty great feeling and as all those people are showing up you want to help them and the call was made to try and get these guys in there um you actually and again I'm not reading the whole book right now I'll let people get your uh, audio book but you had an uneasy feeling about this op yeah, I, th- in, I think in, we all did. Yeah, in fact, you wore like your winter, your shitty winter warfare boots, right? Those boots sucked. <laughs> yeah, because you knew they were going to get cut off you yeah, at some it, point. I mean, that's the that's what you're thinking anyway. You know, or at least if you're going to live, I, you know, I want to keep my good boots. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there was just too many things, and then I, I do, I don't know if it's premonition or what, but you, I just, I just felt like I knew, mm-hmm. just knew. Fast forward a little bit. We put our team members in their places inside the glass factory's walls and went outside and went out ourselves. I was oddly calm as we walked out the gate. Not that I generally feared of being among Iraqi people. It's just in a situation like this where you are surrounded by roughly a thousand men whom you have no ability to directly communicate with. Things can spiral out of control very quickly. The otherwise peaceful crowd could be overtaken by the chaos of the mob in an instant, and that should be frightening to anybody. Up and down the line of Iraqis, we walked, checking the crowd for threats as we went. We stopped frequently to interrogate Iraqis who looked eager, agitated, or uncomfortable. Honestly, most of them looked nervous and unsettled, which was perhaps the most reasonable way to feel in that moment. These guys knew they were in danger just as well as we did. After all, they lived in the city that we fought in. The danger of terrorist attacks had become just another part of daily life to the citizen of Western Anbar province. At one point, a man approached us uneasily, instantly causing my blood pressure to rise. He stood close to me as he began to talk, too close. Back up, I said. He has something to tell you, Carlos, and Carlos is the nickname that you guys gave to your interpreter. Carlos leaned in and told me defensively, grenade, you found a grenade, our interpreter continued the conversation. Yes, the man responded. A grenade with a wire, Carlos relayed to us in English. You gotta be shitting me, I said. There's a fucking tripwire out here somewhere. Ask him where the hell it is, Carlos. Carlos turned to the man and asked, but we, but they were having a hard time communicating because the guy was so scared. It was like watching a kindergartner tattletale on his classmates on the playground. God damn it, we are out here in a cloud of a thousand unpredictable Iraqis, and there's a fucking booby trap somewhere, I said aloud, but to no one in particular. So there's a... This is just, and I'm only again, I'm only reading chunks of this thing, um, but this is a this is a rough situation to be in. Yeah. How many people you guys got? Like, uh, we had twelve that day, and then 
Yeah, we had 12, and then they had um, the one seven deuce had uh, an Abrams on the road, and then the Marines had a, uh, a little bit of security. I mean, we probably uh, anyway our team had 12 people. Mm-hmm. How so. many total? What do you? What was the total coalition forces? Probably 40, I bet. And there's a thousand. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something roughly, yeah. I mean, you know that that joint recruitment checkpoint up the road by the bridge from the glass factory. It's I don't know. Like, it's like it's got to be a third. It's got to be a third of a mile or so, maybe even a half a mile, or maybe it's a quarter mile. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you know, it might have changed too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could have took it out. That's true. Um, anyway, they were lined up damn near to like damn near to there, three three deep. I got pictures of it. I should send you. But there was a lot of people there. So. You're at this point. You're trying to locate the IED. You're kind of like you're focused on that. You got, of course, you can't just totally focus on that. You got all these other guys walking around. You're asking questions, and then uh, going back to the book. I heard a strange sound to my left, followed by the report of rifles and bursts from the machine guns set atop the Abrams tank that had been positioned to a block of street. I dropped to a knee and began to scan for targets. Bang, 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 crack, crack, crack. The round sounded off as they hit, struck their target. Men began shouting in two different languages. The confusion of combat sets in rapidly. Iraqis were running around frantically screaming in high-pitched tones and flailing about in the streets. Others stood frozen as if in fear and curiosity had stiffened them. Still scanning for a target that I could positively identify and engage, but but coming up with none, I was getting worried that I was missing some obvious ambush coming from the buildings to our south. Then I saw it. A semi-truck had crashed through our perimeter a few hundred meters away. Our fellow soldiers and Marines had immediately recognized the threat and eliminated it before it could do any more damage to our position. That's one hell of a V-bit, I thought to myself. The acute problem had been solved. I hoped, for all I knew, that thing might be filled with explosives. But an even larger threat now loomed, a terrified mob. Civilians were running around horrified, shoving each other, climbing over the Jersey barriers, screaming, lost in the confusion of the moment. It did not take long to decide that we could not allow them to get any more riotous. It was time to start wrangling non-combatants. Johnny was within earshot, so I asked him what the new plan of action was. He radioed the talk and briefed them on the current situation. Our commanding officers verified that reinforcement troops were now en route. All we could do in the time being is keep the Iraqis contained until we had enough help to reorganize them. So there's a big vehicle approaches, machine gun on the tank, the coax or something stops that vehicle. Yeah, yeah, a couple. Yeah, we had a we had a machine gunner set up in a position, a kind of a blocking position too, and so they were that was in, you could you know hitting the engine block and disabled it, and it ended up turned out he, it was just a. You know, Iraqi being an Iraqi, and he just drove through our concertina yep, wire. But you, yeah. But you can't. I mean, in a situation like, this, especially when you've been told all morning that's a V bed. Yeah. And and by the way, that means there's concertina wire. That means there's signs in Arabic that say "Don't yeah. pass here." Deadly force will be used. There's several layers of that stuff, mm-hmm. um, which is why I was saying earlier, like you could never imagine that someone would do that. And and oftentimes also they're. Well, and in this case, likely true, and probably a distraction to get right. people distracted from what, what else was happening. Right. So, they, maybe they didn't have time to build a V bid, and so they just sent this guy in there to start the distraction, which is okay. what it looks like to me. Um, going back to the book, we started yelling at the civilians to get back in line as Carlos translated for us. A few listened, but most pretended not to hear what he was saying or just plain too afraid to move. We ratcheted up our anger a little and looked them dead in the eye and let them know we were still in command of this circus, but it was of little use. Whether we wanted it to be or not soon became apparent that we were going to have to be more forceful. Some of the men had to be physically dragged off of the, t- the tops of barriers Some had to be shoved, others conformed when they saw that we were no longer messing around, still others ran away and escaped the scene altogether. Fast forward a little bit. Two of our new Marine friends were there asking whether we wanted them to get their dogs. Roger, please do. These two Marines were canine handlers and by reputation, damn good ones. One of them was Sergeant Can. 
He had already be- deployed to Iraq before. This round for him had started at a small base out in western Iraq near the Syrian border, but that area lacked the action he longed for, so he had requested transfer to the hottest area of the fight, Ramadi. He was a true badass warfighter, and in my experience, the military has no better tool for safely changing the minds of stubborn Iraqi men than a canine warrior at one end of a leash and a cocksure marine at the other. So you got dogs on station now. Um, at one point, you sort of lighten your load a little bit. Mm-hmm. Where, so what, did you go back into the gate to do that? Yeah. Yeah, to the man gate and just started off because there was so many grab hands going on. We were so undermanned, and I started worrying about, especially my smoke up here, getting hit with flak. You know, mm-hmm. I just didn't want to burn the shit out of my face. Mm-hmm. So I started offloading stuff, and and then I I chose to keep my shotgun, which I still it's, it's still weird to me that I, but I didn't know like my shotgun is what I really needed in the moment for the crowd, but. You know, what if we'd had to push out? And anyway, I talked about that a little bit yeah. in there. So it was. A, I mean, if you had had to push out, maybe you'd just go, go back and get your rifle. You right. know, like. Um, but you but you made yourself a little slicker is basically what you did. Yeah. So that you could do more crowd control without worrying about one of these guys grabbing something. Um, there's some Iraqi policemen with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Twelve. these guys started getting. They started getting hyper aggressive. Um, that was the best one we had, by the way. That, the one that this one, this one that's going off here, here, here. You so so this guy like basically is pointing his pointing his AK at everybody. You know he's getting ready to freaking looks like he's getting ready to start shooting people. Well, when I found him, they they had him in, encircled, and he was in the center circle, and they were hollering back and forth. I don't know what the hell they're saying. Mm-hmm. And then I see him jack around <laughs> out of that. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, man, he's about to light these dudes up and. I mean, I I don't know. I didn't. I don't know if I'd have hated him for doing it in that moment. You know, I was pretty frustrated. At everything. I didn't want him to shoot me. Yeah, I'm making a joke, but but yeah, he was he was scared. You know, they they don't respect other Iraqis, and it, there's a really weird customary thing. I, I don't know if this was throughout the whole of Iraq, but for sure in Ramadi, where they're really like not afraid of AKs. Mm-hmm. You pull out a pistol, and those mofos get mm-hmm. all kinds of like, you know, it's an attitude changer. Huh. And I've always heard that maybe it was because of like hit squads and stuff like that. Oh. But yeah, so if you just have like an AK pointing at them, they're like, man, I've been doing that to my brother since we were five, you know, <laughs> like not even not even worried about it, you know. So that he was like jacking that round in to be like, no, I'm seriously going to shoot you, for uh-huh. real, you know. So then all of a sudden, hey, I heard yelled in an authoritative and powerful new American voice. We don't fucking act like that around here. That's Saddam's tactics. We don't pull that shit. Lieutenant Colonel Mack had arrived and he was not pleased with the behavior of our Iraqi comrade. Apparently, Colonel Mack had heard that things were getting out of hand and had decided to gather up his personal security detail and come see the mission through. With the help of Max team, the dog handlers, we began to and the dog handlers, we began to regain control of the crowd. We separated civilians into three lines heading east and west along the large concrete wall that formed the outer border of the glass factory. Fast forward a little bit. The entire morning, my good friend and medic, whom we affectionately called Z, had been hounding me to have him relieved of his post. He was manning our 50 caliber machine gun within the walls of the glass factory, which we had set up to defend us from the crowd and from potential attacks. For me, though, the problem at hand was a personal one. Z was, oh, so he's, he's like requesting yeah, he'd been, to get out of there. He'd been hollering at me for an hour by then. And your basic thought was, don't come out here. You just want to, A, he's the medic. If something happens, you don't want him to be involved in it. Yeah. Um, so you're, you, you basically, you're basically like, okay, just a minute, just hold on. Mm-hmm. And you're basically just trying to put yeah, it off until the. Yeah, man, I've told him no for hours and he just wouldn't shut the hell up. I'm like, all right, man, just give me a second. Give me a second. Like, th- try that tactic. <laughs> Slow rolled him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Fast forward a little bit. Hey, Corporal McKay, M- McCoy, get over here. Lieutenant Colonel Mack yelled at me. I'll be right back. You know what to do, I told Rick before I jogged over to the colonel. And again, this seems a little bit like stilted when I read it. Maybe you don't recognize all these characters. That's because I'm not reading the whole book, so buy the book. Um, hey, McCoy, you got any dip? Yes, sir. Mack was a commanding but warm leader. 
You could not help but feel a little stronger when you talked to him. He was straight to the point and would, and I would not use the word friendly per se, but he was certainly not the typical overbearing, massively insecure curmudgeon that some officers or even NCOs for that matter can be. He was a warrior, a man you respected and admired. He went on to give me a, a new set of instructions that I cannot quite recall and then sent me off. Each of us heading back to our positions about 50 meters apart. When I got back to Rick and stood in front of him with my back turned to his direction and picked up instruction right where I had left off. Then Z called me on the radio again to say he was on his way out there because he had found relief. I reached up with my left hand to key the microphone on my left shoulder and bent my neck to respond. Raj, see you out there. Suddenly there was a loud bark followed by a violent growl coming from somewhere just in front of me. I peered under the brim of my helmet to figure out what was going on, neck still bent to the radio mic. Sergeant Can's dog, Bruno, had grabbed an Iraqi man in the midst of the first line by the arm and began to shake him violently. Sergeant Can threw himself at the guy. Boom, boom. Deafening blasts rumbled out back to back accompanied by two rapid white flashes. A burning, stinging sensation shot through my entire body. It was as if I'd been struck by lightning. I felt my muscles and bones contort fiercely, almost like they had flexed in succession so swiftly that their mere compression had been enough to shatter my skeleton. Then followed an an unimaginable pain. It felt like every nerve in my body had been set ablaze at the same instant. Then, blackness. It's, you have a pretty good memory of that. Yeah. Surprisingly. Up up until that moment, I think I have a pretty solid handle. And then afterwards, it's a little looser for a, a, a period uh, because when Johnny and I talked about it, he had said that he thought he got to me within like a minute or so, which would, is totally plausible given the distance. But to, in my mind, it seemed like it was quite a bit longer than mm-hmm. that. Uh, so I don't know, after getting your head bell rung that, you know it's hard to but uh my psychologist told me that the reason <clears throat> that that's, that's actually not uncommon as far as like leading up into something it's called a flashbulb memory or something like this your brain like imprints oh. you know uh, like one moment in time yeah like apparently this often happens to people in violent situations i think it's called a flashbulb memory mm-hmm. i wish i'd have my phone on google it, but mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and so, and again, like, it's only as accurate as I can be. I, I'm sure there's mistakes. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I've, I've got friends that got blown up, and they don't literally don't remember anything. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just they don't remember anything. They don't remember, you know, they maybe remember 15, 20 minutes before it happened mm-hmm. and then just blank until they wake up in a hospital somewhere. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and that's, you know, from that moment, that's where I started the podcast, you know, when you were faced you wake up face down in the in the in the sand and covered in blood um going back to the book here fast forward a little bit you say when the blast went off they had thrown dozens of men including me some tens of feet when we had all landed i met up at the bottom of one of the piles of dead and wounded johnny pulled the bodies off me as he continued to shout Corpses lifted one by one. I believe there were three bodies on top of me. The weight lessened. I could move a little more freely. Then, when one of the corpses was pulled off of me, I saw the mangled parts which had blocked the view to my own hips leave with it. For the first time since the initial blast, my waistline was exposed. I was able to see that my hips and at least my uh, the upper portion of both of my legs were still intact. I had not been cut in half after all. Great news in the darkest of moments. But I still could not see below my knees. Johnny grabbed my body and rolled me over. I realized my legs were still fully attached and fully articulated from feet to hip. The pain was extraordinary, but things were looking up. 
My friend kept on talking to me as he patched me na- my now exposed wounds. He assured me that both of my legs were still there and that they were not missing any joints, which I thought I saw with my own eyes, but his reassurance sure didn't hurt anything. He did his best to keep me calm and relaxed. I did my hardest to tough it out for him. On every mission, I wore Nomex gloves, which I had the fingers cut out of early on deployment. Because my right hand was so mangled, Johnny and Lyle, another soldier who had who was helping administer first aid, thought it best just to get the bleeding stopped, so they bandaged my hand right over the top of the glove. They had my right hand elevated and bandaged up by the time I saw it, but both bandages and the glove quickly ran through with blood. There was a three-inch long gash across the top of my right forearm just above my wrist. It had been opened up so wide that it revealed the bright white bones and my warm and pink muscle fibers which twitched on either side of the wound as it bled. There were approximately seven holes in that arm and eight more in my left. They were all leaking. Hot, thin looking blood traced ghastly lines down each arm from shoulder to hand. I had still yet to see what my legs looked like under my uniform, but it was obvious that even though all of each leg was still attached, the situation was dire. Every time I shuddered, convulsed, or worse yet, was bumped by someone else, I grunted and moaned in agony. Otherwise, I either gritted my teeth to get a handle on the pain or babbled incoherently. I'm sorry, Johnny. I'm trying not to be a pussy, but this shit really hurts. I know it does, bro. You don't have to apologize. When Z, our medic, finally reached us, he looked over at me and said, Mac, I've got to go help a Marine. He's worse off than you are. I'll be back as soon as I can. His voice was stricken with panic. I heard it, but I felt a deep sense of pride at how well my friend and teammate defeated that trepidation and did his job right. Z stood up and hustled over to Sergeant Can's side to begin treating treatment on him. Z was worried about my future as any close friend would be, but a basic army medical procedure had a very strict rule of progression. A medic is to start with the American who is most gravely injured. And you gotta, one thing that's cool about this book, you got a bunch of footnotes in there where you'd kind of just add some detail, and I don't know how many of them I'm gonna read, but this one is pretty pretty cool, uh, pretty interesting anyways. I just wanna reiterate this point. It could have been upsetting to watch a close friend walk away while I was clearly on the brink of death, especially since he left to go help a warrior who had almost surely already passed away. But that's not how I felt at all. All I remember feeling was a deep sense of respect and the strength of character that my friend had just displayed. He had been forced into an extremely uncomfortable and complex situation with nearly no time to think it over. And he had demonstrated the courage to put personal loyalties aside and do the right thing. Just imagine the world we would live in if more people had that kind of fortitude. Yeah. Because Z's like your boy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and he has to just be like, hey, I'll be back, man. Yeah. And the and my buddies that were there trying to pat, I mean, you could tell just from reading that uh, that are not exactly medics, mm-hmm. you know, if you couldn't get hands to quit bleeding, you know. I mean, they're doing their best. But yep. They're just like wrapping gauze over, open, like, you mm-hmm. know, you got a hole all the way through my hand right here and then all the way through my knuckle and my thumb and you know i mean i can't even move my finger like so it's like this is all mangled and they're just like wrapping gauze around it like we're going to work out or something you know what i mean it's like i mean they're trying but you know what i'm saying and then like this one up here you know that was all opened up they were just like wrapping it you know and that was from just a ball bearing and just ripped the uh. you know what i mean so they just didn't really know what they were doing and so it's not like zane could what i'm saying is it's not like zane couldn't see that mm-hmm. when he first looked you know but and the one thing I I, will, I can't remember if I wrote about it, but I will say is the com, the compartment syndrome part, which maybe which maybe you might read, mm-hmm. but uh, with the way the legs sucked up, probably saved my life really, because like creating an internal tourniquet on mm-hmm. your femurs, you know. So at least my my legs were not bleeding as badly as they could have been in that moment. Ta- tell us about that compartment syndrome. So when uh, your femurs break. Uh, especially if they break in multiple places, but if any, any, any time they break, your femur is always at risk of a compound fracture anytime it breaks because your glutes and your uh, quads are just strong. So the, my femurs were broken multiple places, so they just folded like a, 
you know, almost they just folded up anyway, and they went beside each other like this, and then you're just cutting all kinds of blood vessels in there and potentially arteries and all of that. But so that creates some internal uh, swelling and pressure, and then you get like blood that gets locked into in between two like the it can't go above or below that spot so it's like a, a tr blood that's trapped in an area but it was almost acting like a tourniquet yeah you, you basically you got lucky yeah in the fact that you had compartment syndrome that's swelled around your arteries and shut some of that bleeding down yeah because otherwise yeah <sighs> um at this point z's back working on you and you say, my clothing all removed, I could finally see the multitude of holes in my legs clearly. Z began to patch what he could, but they were even worse condition than my arms were. Each leg had more than 10 different holes in it, some of which were nearly two inches in diameter. Most were not that big. They were the size of, they were about the size of a small marble on average, but they had gone straight through both sides of my quadriceps. At this stage, the wounds were not pumping out as much blood as one might have expected. It was more like a steady leak. He says, I lay there watching them bleed for a while, thinking to myself, holy shit, Saving Private Ryan really got it right. These wounds look exactly as they do in the movie. Um, <clears throat> so they are now packing you up, and they're trying to get you onto a, onto a damn litter. Eventually, they get you on the litter. Um they get you on the litter now it's each time the truck would bounce in and out of potholes my bones would rattle and rub together the pain at this stage was so intense that when combined with my heavy blood loss it caused me to pass in and out of consciousness but because of the condition i was in z was doing everything in his power to keep me awake mac mac don't you go to sleep he yelled i moaned a response as best i could and then forced my eyes open this is fun when we finally reached the rear entrance of Camp Ramadi, we ran into a whole new set of problems. Our own soldiers' ineptness. We rolled up only to be immediately stopped by the soldiers who ran the gate. They would not let us in because we did not have a convoy number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can't make this shit up. That's 100% true. Yeah, Z was losing it on those boys at that point. Um... Back and forth, our driver argued with the gate guards until eventually Z, standing in the bed of the truck, lost his cool. We don't have a fucking convoy number. I can't let you in without one. This isn't a fucking convoy, you idiot. We got a wounded American here. Eventually, the soldiers at Ogden Gate let their better sensibilities take over when we allowed to enter our own <clears throat> home. And the the evac that we were using by that point, medevac, was a five-ton. You know, it's like so. That's where you run you in the back of a five ton. Yeah, that's a comfortable. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's like riding on a brick with wheels. Yeah, <laughs> so they just had like the litter stretched between those two benches. Uh huh. Yeah, that was it was misery. And then some sergeant major had this, you know, bright idea. He was gonna, he was, you know, too many guys were rolling over. I guess. I never heard of a single person rolling over. Uh, I mean, maybe they did, but anyway, he put speed bumps. All the way then, you know, so it was like speed bumps all the way to the damn uh, Charlie Med. Each one of those freaking personally built for Braxton McCoy's <laughs> yeah, guys are back. Sometimes I wonder if any of those guys ever read some of this late, these kind of books that yeah. come out later on, you know, and just think, man, maybe that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Well, when I first got to Baghdad, this is like 2003, and there are all these potholes on like the road around the base. Mm -hmm. And like deep potholes are kind of jacked up and then they filled in all the potholes and then they built speed bumps <laughs> no way <laughs> i was like bro you you had it and then you <laughs> filled it in <laughs> and now you're building speed bumps come on man um <clears throat> yeah Going back to the book, I began to pass in and out of consciousness so frequently that I was having a hard time telling the difference between reality and whatever dream world I was off to in between once they carried me to the medical facility, they realized there was an, another problem. It was already filled with wounded Iraqi men in one side of Charlie Med. We, we went one, in one side of Charlie Med and right out the other. Down the road a little way is another aid station which belonged to our brigade's engineers, so we headed there. Once inside, the first thing they did was 
was only start transfusing blood. In the beginning, they only had lines containing a quart or so a piece into each arm, but eventually they had to stick an IV into my jugular and start pumping in fluid that way. Damn. Yeah, they put a pick in. After establishing a steady stream of flesh, fresh blood into me, they fixed as many bandages as they could and rushed me out to the PLZ to board a medevac flight containing several other wounded people bound for Balad. While en route to Balad, the flight crew decided that because some of us had lost so much blood, an emergency landing in Fallujah was necessary to save our lives, mine included. I was passing in and out of consciousness again. My grip of reality, if you could call it that, anymore was so slippery that it was like I was that was like trying to squeeze a wet fish. The harder I tried, the worse it became. The darkness that awaited me each time I passed out was becoming more and more welcoming. I was exhausted. All I wanted to do was sleep. To put it into a sentence, I was starting to give up. What will death be like? Everyone always talks about a white light near the end of a tunnel, but I'm, I am not seeing shit. <laughs> yeah, man, and it was cold too. Mm. This is January. I know, like it's Ramani, but it's still cold. It's like sixty-five or something, and mm. when it's been a hundred and twenty for eight months, sixty-five feels cold as hell, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you run out of blood, so you're just even colder. Yeah, it was at that point. I was I was pretty close to just. Saying hell with it, you know, whatever that means. I, I, like, I don't know if you really have control of that or not, but I, I like think I you do have some level of control of it. I mean, I've heard plenty of stories of people that had that will to survive and are able to stay alive. And uh, you know what? You know what I actually think of that the most is hearing stories from guys that were in prisoner of war camps mm. and the difference between someone that lives and someone that dies. It's like this person was just like, I'm going to make it. And this other person said, I'm not. Mm. So I think. There's definitely something to that. Um, you get here where guys are Braxton, Braxton, stay with us. I know it hurts, but we've got to stretch your legs out again or you're going to lose them. Okay, I moaned. Then I passed out again, blood stained tears running down both cheeks. I'm not sure how long I was out for and I was not fully awake, but the next thing I distinctly remember was the sound of my flesh tearing under a scalpel. Scalpel. The surgeons were slicing the side of each quadricep to relieve my compartment syndrome. Blood and pus practically spewed out of my swollen legs, split wide open. I will never forget the way that cutting sounded inside my head. It was reminiscent of a muddy zipper being forced open. Something stick with you forever. Hearing your own flesh being cut apart is one of them. <sighs> Yeah, that shit sucked, man. And it's it's knee to hip on both sides, like point of the knee all the way up to the point of my hip. And they split, and then they once they got me in that traction splint, then they put in these wound vacs. It's like a big sponge, uh, and then they wrap it. So it's like a, a big spongy looking thing, and it's got a vac set up across the back that like pulls the shit out of the sponge. Mm-hmm. So I think this, <clears throat> the way it works is the sponge sucks up the you know, moisture, whether it's, you know, the liquid, whichever liquid it is, pus, internal, like water from your, I don't know what the hell it is, blood and all that. And then the vacuum sucks it out of the sponge, I think. Mm -hmm. So they cut you open and then they slip that in to the wound. And it's like, it's like this big, you know, as far as width wise. And then they put like a plastic thing over it and then just pump that. Yeah, you got some pictures on your website of like your legs splayed open like that. It does not look, doesn't even look survivable. I mean, how much they cut you open, it's freaking crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's wild. I, th- my IT bands are still like, you know, your your IT bands are like supposed to be one band, right? Mm-hmm. And I got like two of them or four of them, I guess. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> two on got, each leg. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did they like? Did they cut the IT band open, or did the yeah, IT they band had, just stretch open? No, they had to cut through it to get to the to be able to get that wound vac in there. At least that's my understanding of it. You can stick your finger through it, like you mm-hmm. go all the way to the muscle. Yeah, it was it was nuts, man. It, and you were conscious during this. Yeah, well, no one hit you in any morphine or anything. By then, I was starting. Now, once they got me stable, then they could start hitting me with stuff. But in Ramadi, they weren't going to give me anything because my blood pressure was super low, and they just didn't want to, you know, zonk me, which I think is probably a good idea. I'm glad to be here. 
yeah, we'll take it. Uh, whatever call got made, apparently it was the right one. Yeah, and I, so, you know, I think probably what happened is I had been another thing is I'd been. I don't know if Gronsky's talked about this, but they had. I was one of the last people getting evac because they just it, it was just a wreck, mm-hmm. and they had a bunch of Iraqis that were already in Charlie Med by the time they got me there and stuff. So they just screwed up the triage. Um, so I think probably the call was made because it had been quite a while before they got me in there. So they were like, well, if he's, you know, making it like, why don't I just like, why risk it now? He's mm-hmm. made it this long without it, you know? And so then they, they, I'm sure they hit me with it in Fallujah mm-hmm. because I don't really remember Fallujah to Baghdad or I mean, Balad hardly at all. And all of this, I'm still f- pretty hazy, you know? Yeah. You say I was put and wrote in route to the big Air Force Base Hospital in Balad. I guess I'm still alive, I thought. The question became a common theme throughout the following hours and days. Um, and like you said, you know, you write about in the book, you you can hear doctors talking, but you're like partially coherent, you're tired, you, you're you just like in and out of sleep um, for a while. That's pretty much your memory of Balad is just, you know, in and out of consciousness, little bits and pieces. Um, you say I woke to the loud rumbling of an airplane engine. I was being pushed across an airstrip towards a C-130 medevac flight headed for Launchstuhl, Germany. Fast forward a little bit. I had to read this part because it sounds freaking horrifying. Later, I woke up choking and in sheer terror. I felt like I was drowning, but how? Instinctively, I tried to turn my head to one side to get a breath, but I couldn't because it was so tightly fastened to this bed. I wiggled as much as I could, gagging, hacking, trying desperately to draw air, still unsure of what was happening. Left and right, I moved my head, only managing a centimeter or less in either direction. I groaned for help, still too tightly restrained to move. Help, I screamed inside my head. I desperately needed to breathe. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. Yes, you can. Toughen up. My thoughts ran wild. Help, I gurgled aloud this time. It was completely unintelligible because my mouth and nose were filled with water. Fear turned into anger. Inside my head, I had screamed a series of idle, senseless threats and cuss words. Suddenly, I felt a strap loosen. My head shifted to one side. As soon as I felt cleared, I coughed and hacked out all the fluids that were lodged in my throat. I was still in a daze, but at least I could breathe. I gasped for air and muttered thank you to the nurse who had just saved my life. Inside my head, I was calling this flight and all the unwounded people on it every combination of curse words I could dream up. Yeah, I, I, I think I probably threw up. Yeah, while you were, and that just woke you up as you probably drowned in your own vomit. Yeah, like probably, like I thought about this later on, and that's probably what happened. And you know, they strap your head to that that litter, you know, Mm -hmm. so you can't move, and then being on drugs and in the air and, and she's who knows how many you know people she's attended to I mean I can't see shit except for the roof of the aircraft you know and you're all drugged up so you're barely even coherent anyway and yeah I was not that's scary how old are you are you 20 yet are you yeah 21? I turned 20 over there yeah I turned 20 I turned 21 back home and you had gotten married when was like oh. did you go home on leave yeah. and get married yeah I did yeah <laughs> I, yeah, oh Jack. man, that's um always a tough but understandable call that soldiers can make from time to time. Everybody in the whole world tells you not to do it, <clears throat> but you're like, oh man, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I have personally given that advice to many, many young men over the years, and have almost never been listened to. <laughs> Uh, so is it you went for oh, you went home for two weeks of leave mm-hmm. during deployment? Yeah, and that's when you got married. Yeah, check no. um, World Series and the deer hunt. Mm-hmm. Check. Uh, later on, a surgeon came and told me that they had planned on trying to put rods in my femurs while I was in surgery there. So now you're in Germany. 
but the doctors thought it would be best to wait for the infection to clear up. He explained as I lifted the, as he lifted the sheets and showed me my legs for the first time since I left Iraq that they had instead placed external fixators on each one of them. These metal cages were implanted just to get me stable enough to be flown back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He told me I was headed there that night. So they put these freaking external fixators on your legs mm-hmm. to try and let them heal up more before they would eventually put internal rods inside your legs. They're trying to get the bacteria <clears throat> out. Uh, there was uh, some bacteria that they had discovered that guys were coming home with from the sand in Iraq. Some mouge freaking bacteria. <laughs> yeah. So when you get, yeah when you get to Walter Reed, if you have that, they put a blue like a blue label on your door or whatever. So th- they can't put a a rod in your femurs while you have an infection because it could it risks introducing the infection to the inside of your femur, mm-hmm. and then you're really in trouble. So they had to get that cleared out, and then they could get rods and end up taking like a month or something to get everything. Oh, it, oh sorry, really yeah. quick. And the way that those things work is – it's what, like the external fixators? Yeah, it's like a big cage, like you're saying, almost like a series of halos. But then those halos have a uh, like rods that come out of them, and those rods have screws, like drill bit screws or drill screws, wood screws on the end looking thing, more like machine heads or screws. And those are screwed into your bone in your, to keep your bones stable, mm-hmm. and then they go back out through that halo and they bolt into that halo. So it's like that thing's actually screwed to your bone. Yeah. You it's, I had a friend of the family, little girl, she was probably nine years old and she broke her femur. She had an external fixator on her femur. Jeez. So you, you don't even think, if you don't think that seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> like, like if you're a, if you didn't know anything about medicine, which I don't, and you told me, hey, what we're gonna do is we're gonna screw rods through the skin into the bone and have a whole contraption on the outside, You'd be like, you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <For> sure. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. God, it's true, yeah. Like, it's crazy. It's a crazy idea. You'd think you'd just uh, it'd be infected. Yeah. yeah. That's freaking crazy. Um, this is, you, get, you go into talking about a little bit like what's going through your head at this point. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. This feeling of helplessness and confusion lasted in varying degrees for days, if not weeks. During this period, I had surgery nearly every morning to clean and irrigate my wounds and change the bandage that swathed my body. From what I, un- from what I understand, the doctors had to put me under for these daily hygiene sessions because the sheer number of open wounds and their depth made scrubbing too intrusive and time consuming to do while I was awake. I had a dozen or more wound channels which were through and throughs, a term used to describe a wound that starts on one side of the body and passes through its other side, exiting entirely. Usually on a limb, I, I also, usually on a limb, I also had dozens more wounds caused by projectiles which had penetrated my flesh, but it stopped in something more dense like bone or thick muscle. What do you think they, this, this, uh, S vest was just like filled with ball bearings or something, and that's what you got shredded with? Man, I'm packing like eight or ten of them still. How big are they? Uh, are man. they all the same size? Yeah. So it's like a uniformed They're, kind of professionally built S vest. Well, so we found some before where they, they were just filling up water bottles with wheel bearings so and then just mm-hmm. taping those that – those water bottles to the front of the explosive. So I guess like professional yeah. trained by the Iranians, I think probably. Yeah. I got one in my ass that really messes with me when I'm riding horses sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like tried to get him to cut it out, but it's like too deep, deep I guess. But. God. Um, You say this, I spent the next few weeks in the same bed lying around and thinking about what my new life was going to be when, if, I got out of the hospital. When I was not caught up daydreaming about what my long-term recovery was going to look like, my mind was on my brothers back in Ramadi. I knew the morale-crushing war that they were living every day and I had begun to feel an enormous amount of guilt at the thought of them facing those trials without me. The thought was only made worse when I considered that they were doing it while I lay safely in a bed back in the States. 
I felt grief as I think anyone would for the memories of lives lost and my role actively or passively in their deaths. I also felt guilty for being the one, for being one of the people who survived. I could have, should have done more, I often thought. By this point, the story in my mind had cleared through to recall the scene at the glass factory in detail. I remembered seeing Sergeant Can and Bruno confronting the suicide bomber. I remembered Z telling me that he had to go check on the Marine who was injured worse than I was. I remembered almost everything from that morning, including the courageous action Bruno and Sergeant Can had taken, yet somehow, ridiculously, and unfairly to Sergeant Can's heroic memory, I had saddled myself with the guilt of his death. It was not in any way my fault that he had chosen to give his life trying to protect the Marines and soldiers around him, but that, was, but that is much easier to write now with the rationale of hindsight than it was to convince myself of it in the hospital bed. That's like the, 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 they interview all these wounded soldiers, you know, and they all say, I just want to get back to my unit. Just want to get back to my unit. Just want to get back to my unit. Mm. Yeah. Um, did, as you, so as time went on, your memory of what happened, did it become more clear? Uh, as far as the suicide bombing, I, I don't think, not really. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard to. It's really hard to know because I, I got into psychology for a minute, and now I know that your bot, your brain, often like rewrite stories back or backfills. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's one of those questions that seems really easy to answer, but if you're, you know, if you're being honest with yourself about the way the human brain works, you really, it's really not that easy of a question to answer. Mm-hmm. You know, because you do backfill. Uh, do you backfill with? Memories that are subconsciously there you backfill with like sort of what you assemble From what you can kind of put together logically as to what happened. Yeah, it could be that and then also talking to your friends and hearing their version of stuff over time uh, And then maybe your brain just fills in gaps. Mm-hmm. I got I don't really know. Like, no, that's that I actually do We I did a podcast about that the way you're the way you can hear part of a story and part of a story and your mind will fill in the gaps it okay. will fill in the gaps with things. They'll kind of just figure it out and take the best guess, and then you'll kind of you can very easily believe, oh, this is what happened. This is what I saw. Yeah, and that, and you know I can't say that didn't happen because mm-hmm. there's no way for me to know. But I feel like I don't, I don't, I don't know that it really ever changed. I know that um, you know I talked to Johnny. He's before we ever put this out, and he's like, yeah, man, that's like how I remember. It. You know, sans this or that detail. Mm-hmm. The one detail I know that I absolutely did lose was uh, a friend of mine, Casey, was out there, and I don't even remember him being there. Mm-hmm. We were just driving to Texas to do a long-range course the other day, well, a couple months ago, and he was like, dude, I was there. I was like, well, I knew you were there later. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, man, I got to you quick. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I was to you in, like, minutes, you know, and I didn't remember any of that. So I know there's got to be problems, you know, with, with my memory. Oh, yeah. Well, it's also everybody's memory, you know. There's everybody's memory is different from witnessing the same things. I, I know of, you know, Leif and I have memories of things that we did where he literally remembers something and I literally remember something else. Mm. And we we're both there and our viewpoint, and there's no reason, it's not like, there's no reason we should remember different things, but we just do. Yeah. Um, people just have a different perspective of what's going on and that locks into their memory. Yeah. And then you can only store so much shit in True. There. <laughs> that freaking hard drive gets filled up. Yeah. yeah. So if you do a whole bunch of dumb shit when you're young, man, you're going to be, you're going to suck at like this stage of your life. You're going to lose all the good stuff. Uh, fast forward a little bit. You got surgeries, you got doctors, you got psychologists, uh, physical therapists, just lots of things going on. And again, I'm fast forwarding through it, not because it's not a really interesting read, um, because there's all kinds of, I was learning all kinds of things and, 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 you know, the, the story itself is just, it's an awesome, I hate to say we use the word awesome, it, I don't know what other word to use. It's a very well told story. Uh, so get the book. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to where 
you say these new training aids, or you're doing this physical therapy, you're, these new training aids were useful and they did help me pass the time, but at this stage in my recovery, the only lofty goal I had left to look forward to was getting, ex- getting the external fixators removed and moving into a wheelchair. Not more than a month before I'd been a young man, a warrior in his prime. Now I lay in bed doing my level best to avoid sleep and my grandest physical aspirations were to have the cages removed from my legs and be fitted for a wheelchair. Yeah. 20 years old. Yeah, and because like my hand was messed up, I only had one hand that went my left humerus was broken, so I had like a plastic they didn't cast it because they wanted to leave me with a limb that would was like still functional. Mm-hmm. So I had like a spiral fracture here, and they just put like a plastic, almost like, I don't know, almost like the stuff motocross guys wear. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like didn't really. I don't know that it really did anything, but other than like remind you your shit was broken. <laughs> I, got, like, I don't know what it was doing, but so the the what was occupational OT occupational therapy? They they bring like these tools. And you learn how to like pull a sock over this kind of conical shaped thing, and it's got a couple of strings hooked to it, and throw that shit at your foot, and so you can pull like your own sock on and get started. Or yeah, they'd bring like this uh, kind of circ- conical shaped deal with buttons on it and zippers, and try to learn how to manipulate stuff with one hand. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if they were doing that to prep me because they weren't sure how much my hand would ever work again. That I mean, that could honestly be possible, but I don't know. If, so I'm saying, I don't know if it's routine. I don't know if everybody does this, but they brought me all these aids that I was, you know, trying to, trying to learn how to do shit with one hand, which anyway, so that was like, how I was passing my time that and watching like Dukes of Hazard on a DVD thing and Seinfeld and shit. By the, by the time you were aware of what was going on, were you, was it seem like pretty solid that you were going to keep both your legs? Oh yeah, it did uh, it, for sure. By that point. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> going back to the book here, fast forward a little bit. I laid in bed for the next few days, a little more beaten down than I was before. I raised the sheets now and then with my left arm, my only limb that sort of functioned and wondered whether this was finally going to be the thing that took my legs from me. I was physically tough and was tolerating pain, but the roller coaster of emotions and the all around uncertainty surrounding my life was starting to get me down. I was nearing that breaking point again. I spent most of my time just watching the yellow green pus ooze out of my thighs. They look like Swiss cheese that had been aged way too long and the smell radiated throughout the room. This was a gnarly infection that you had. Yeah, the gangrene. That was that was like my third infection too. And I don't know if you remember, like I'm not trying to throw Walter Reed under the bus, but right around that time was when CNN did that, uh, that or maybe it was right after that, when CNN did that. Uh, like an expose. expose type deal. Um, and I remember some perhaps unsanitary stuff, but you know, Walter Reed was like loaded with people at that point. There were a crap load of dudes there. So Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, Mm -hmm. but there was definitely some stuff that was not being like, there's too much infection going around to not be having some procedure. Something's being screwed up here. Yeah. So, um, but they rescheduled the surgery. Um, they get done. They they take off the fixators and then they put rods inside your femurs, mm-hmm. remove the freaking spongy vacuum machine things. Yeah. Let the wounds close. Um, hundreds of stitches, you say staples. Yep. And and you had been in bed at this point that you so long that you had a bed source. Yeah. Like gnarly bed source. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're still scarred. God. Yeah. And when they put those rods in, they. Uh, because of the way the brakes were on my right leg, I think they called it a retrograde nail, but they went, they flip your kneecap over and come up through the bottom and then it screws up into your hip. But on my left leg, I, they put a rod, in, a rod excuse me, in my left hip as well. Mm-hmm. So they put that rod through the hip into the femoral head and then it has like an eyelet at the top and then they put the other rod through that eyelet so it's like tied together. And then that one screws down into your the head of your femur on the bottom head. I don't know what the proper, I, I mm-hmm. felt anatomy, but it <laughs> down here, 
so they went both directions. So it's kind of a, like like a, my hip sucks and my right knee sucks. <laughs> like at this point, you know. So they gave I mean, you one, they gave you one of each. Yeah, right. one they went from the bottom, one they went from the top down. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't put a rod in my my right hip because it wasn't broke as bad. So, <sighs> um, at one point, your uncle. Justin comes mm-hmm. to visit you, uh, and you call him Juddy. That's his nickname. He says to you, uh, one of the days he was there, he discovered some information that had been kept from me. Hey, bro, I need to tell you something. Okay, I said, expecting the worst. Colonel Mack died. Nobody wanted to tell you because they were not sure how you, you were, it, whether you were healthy enough to hear that. How? He was killed by shrapnel from the suicide bomber that hit you. Oh, thanks for telling me, I said, slightly in shock. It was particularly devastating news. I already knew that Sergeant Cannon had passed away, but Colonel Max seemed impossible. But he, he was way too far away to have been struck by any significant amount of shrapnel, I thought. As it happened, he had been quite a ways away, and he had only been hit by a few pieces of shrapnel, but those ball bearings had hit him in the back of the head, killing him virtually instantly. Survival in war is random, I have learned. Yeah. Yeah, that one tripped me out, man. He was he seemed like a long ways away, like seventy yards or fifty. I mean, it seemed like a long ways. I don't know how far it actually was, but it seemed far. And you know, I was a twenty year old kid. I didn't really have shit to lose, you know. And he had three kids at home. Probably, probably like the age I am now is probably how old he was then. You know, Mm -hmm. I think back at stuff like that, and I don't know if I'd have had that kind of sand at this age. You know, with all that, to put that much on the line, especially when, you know, you're a light colonel or you're a lieutenant colonel out there with a bunch of E4s, E5s, mm-hmm. e, and the highest ranking guy is E6. I mean, that's quite a gap. Yeah. You know, that was just, uh, um, yeah, no, I even when I got there, because I got there, this was in January, I got there in April, and people talked about him like, totally revered him as a leader and what he was doing and what he was making work and the effort that he was putting forth. I mean, he just was, everybody revered the guy. Um, you say learning of the death of Colonel Mack was another psychological set back in time rife with them. My bout with survivor's guilt was getting more aggressive by the day. I was still having serious trouble sleeping and my overall emotional well being while awake was so fragile that even I was beginning to recognize it. This was roughly the time I began to use physical recovery as a distraction from mental anguish. I have often heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. I'm not exactly sure where it originated, but I was about to take my term at the strategy and would do so for years to come, flagrantly unsuccessfully. Um. Yeah, I think that fake it to the make it shit, it's bullshit. <laughs> it's complete bullshit, man. You got to fix your foundation, you know. Yeah. That's the problem. You can't just fake shit. Yeah. You got to go all the way to the root and start working there. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when someone's talking about going to do some job somewhere, they think they can fake it till you make it. And it's the same thing I said earlier. I wrote about this in Leadership Strategy and Tactics. If you don't know something and you're trying to fake it, Everybody can see it. <laughs> yeah. Like even from a leadership perspective, it doesn't work. But then when you start trying to put together your your psychological well being by faking it, it's not gonna work out good. Right. It's not gonna work out good. Um the physical therapy, you got this guy you're working with named Solomon. Um I'm fast forwarding. Now you're 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 starting to you know, you're starting to heal up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey man, when do I get to walk down those bars? My remark was said purely in jest because I'd already been told several times it would be 18 months, if ever, before I was going to be able to walk again. You're going to use them right now, he said, obviously seeing through my lame bravado. I can't walk, Solomon, I said coldly. Coldly, Yes, you can. I'm going to help you. I was starting to get irritated at him because I knew I could not walk. I can't even stand for hell's sake. I was frustrated and embarrassed by the whole situation. I was frustrated because I thought that this guy I liked and admired assumed I was capable of more than I actually was and I was about to let him down. Does he not know how badly injured I am, I wondered. 
I was embarrassed that I couldn't dress myself, embarrassed that even if I could have, I could not wear clothes that were not several sizes too big because they had to fit over my casts and braces. I was embarrassed by the fact that I could not do up a button on my own underwear or use the bathroom without help throughout the entire process. I was literally unable to wipe my own ass, as they say. Little more than a month before this moment, I had been a roughly six foot tall, 190 pound warrior in the prime of his life, proud and full of all the arrogance of youth. But there I was a few months later, sitting before a man who wanted to help me, deeply wanted to help me, but I just physically could not do what he was asking. Then there was the fear, fear that if by some miracle of the imagination I was able to stand up and try to walk, I might fall. And if I fell, I would surely lose all the independence that I had fought so hard to achieve. It felt like an exercise in futility to even speculate about what it would be like to walk again already. Then Saul loosened the braces on my chair, bent down in front of me and said, are you ready? I reached out, put what I could on my arms on his shoulders, and lifted, and he lifted me out of the chair. My heart raced as I stood up for the first time. A feeling of anxiety, fear, and triumph washed over me. Though they were hardly supporting any body weight, my legs shivered beneath me. Then we started walking. We only covered a few feet distance, but I could hardly contain my joy as Saul half dragged me over to those parallel bars. The instant the cold stainless steel touched the fingertips of my left hand, an invigorating dose of adrenaline shot through my body. Even though Solomon was bearing most of my weight, I had to overcome an obstacle I had not at all anticipated. I don't know if it was because of my brain injury or just because it had been so long since I had last walked, but I couldn't make my muscles move my legs like they were supposed to. I knew how walking was supposed to be done. You just lift up and step out in front of your lead foot, then repeat on the other side. I could have drawn you a picture or describe what walking is supposed to look like. I knew how to do it, but I didn't know how to make me do it. Each confusing attempt at the process sent intense bursts of pain to my brain that I was quite that I was not quite ready for, but the torment mixed with the excitement of discovery kept releasing more of that ever intoxicating adrenaline. That's got to be freaking weird when you it was weird. You like your body doesn't know what to do. It was it was weird. I I still don't know how to really describe how, how that felt. It is weird. And yet you have a guy like Solomon there who I still to this day admire. He was a, he was a really freaking neat guy. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure he's still alive, but mm-hmm. you know, out of, out of my life cuz thank God I'm not still there <laughs> in the hospital, but um yeah, and you got a guy like that with you that you really care for and yeah, yeah, or uh, respect or whatever you want to do as good as you can, and and you know your body's just like not not working. It, it's almost it's almost like you know when you put a limb to sleep sitting on something, uh, yeah. but like do it bad, uh-huh. not just kind of a little bit of sleep, but uh-huh. uh, it, like fall down kind of asleep. I've yeah, d- I've done that before. It's like oh, I'm gonna fall down. Exactly. That's kind of how it was. Like I knew it was supposed to work. I just couldn't, or, you know, you could feel, I, that's the best I can describe mm-hmm. is if it was something like that and the muscles were not firing properly. And then the, my right quad had a, a real good hole through it. And that one, even my physical therapist that I got later on as a civilian was not quite sure if that femoral or excuse me, uh, which head is that? Anyway, if the, if, the, if the actual head of that part of the quad would ever fire again because it was just not, like the muscles were not going around the way they should have. It, it does kind of now. but mm-hmm. So there could have been like some muscular damage involved too. I mean, there was muscular damage involved, but that could have been part of it too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Wow, That's freaking crazy. Um, it's hard, and, you know, that it's not like uh, you're – you're making progress, but the progress is so slow that you still feel like you don't even know if how how much you're going to be able to heal. And at one point, you're talking to your cousin Juddy again, and you say, uh, "You say, Juddy, I meant I might never walk again, and if I do, I'll probably be assisted in some way. I don't want to push around a walker for the rest of my life. I can't help hunt elk on a cane. I'll never feel that icy mountain water roll past my waders as I cast." flies at fall browns i'll only have memories of sliding into a saddle on a crisp october morning when at dawn you can see your breath and by noon you're you've sweat through your hat band i have done my last bow hunt no more dirt bikes or bull rides 
I basically just started up my twilight years in my early 20s. I'm in a fucking nursing home for soldiers right now, and I may always be. I was being a negative, whiny child. There was no doubt about it. But I was trying to explain to him everything that made me, me, was gone. Those were not just activities that I liked to do. That was my identity. I hunted, fished, cowboyed, and soldiered. Those were my essence. If I was too broken to do those things that distinguished me, then I was too broken to live as far as I was concerned. Yeah. That's everything you like to do. Yeah, I think a lot of guys. And you think you may never do it again. Yeah, I think a lot of guys go through that. And even I think some, like you look at guys when they're getting ready to retire from MMA, you know, I feel like everything's – I mean, maybe not in the same circumstances. There are some guys that are in similar circumstances mm-hmm. with their brains, mm-hmm. but, you know, maybe not exactly the same kind of circumstance, but they're going through a similar, like, period. Yeah. Like, everything that they are is, in some sense, being taken away from them because Father Time's undefeated, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a similar – you know, I think it's similar. In, so I, I, I'm definitely not alone in having experienced these sorts of feelings, but it's a, it's a really weird place to find yourself in for sure. Yeah, and I think the fact that you're 20 at the time, you know, at least an MMA fighter that's retiring or can't fight anymore and he's 37, 33, whatever, you know, that's that's a different deal. Um, This is a real important conversation that you have here. Uh, Fast forward a little bit. A member of the surgical team, which monitored my progress, walked in near the tail end of this conversation. He was just there to do routine checkups and to introduce himself. He was a young guy who seemed very well put together in high speed. I ch- he checked my limbs one by one for circulation and feeling. Juddy put a question to him. Hey, Doc, Braxton has been told that he may never walk again. He thinks he is never going to be able to stand in a river to fly fish or hunt or hike or ride horses again. Can you talk to him? I concentrated on him, hoping to read his expressions for tells of lies. He proceeded to give me all the reasons why I may be able to do those things again. He covered every angle, including some caveats, such as I may have to use a cane to hike or limit the distance that I traveled and only fish shallow holes, etc. But he was telling the truth. Then at the end of his answer, he said the most important thing I have ever been told either before or since. Braxton, I think you can walk again, but you are going to have to do it soon. You have too much soft tissue damage to risk allowing your muscles to atrophy any further. If you don't start now, you may never walk again, at least without the use of a cane or a walker. Even in everyday activities, it is all up to you. It is all up to you, I repeated. It's all up to me, even in a situation like this one. My body may have been badly bruised, but... It's one spirit that determines the outcome of a tragedy, not a doctor's prognosis. That was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. I needed decisive language and a kick in the ass, not some sugar-coated version of what may or may not happen. There was probably not anything that young surgeon said which, would, which I had not been told before, but I had never heard that truth until right then. The words he said, the order he chose to use, and the conviction with which he said them were as perfect for me as if the universe had handcrafted that message. It's on you. I can see how, you know, when someone when someone says, Well, you know, it could you know, it could happen. You know, you could walk again or, yeah, you might be able to do this. And it's almost like people are inviting you just to leave it up to fate. Yeah. Well, it's almost like they're they're trying not to tell you that it's not possible. You know, like almost like how women will sometimes do with their kids. You know, mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, yeah you, you, you're great. You draw great. That's beautiful. <laughs> Man, we might send you to art school. You know, it's kind of like that kind of uh, – it feels like that a little bit, especially coming from a primary care or a, a surgeon or something. Yeah, yeah, you probably can do this because you know that they're pushing it off on to the next guy. They're pushing down the timeline, you know. So when you get a guy that's like, no, nah, man, you can do it. If you want to do it, you can do it. You know, just figure it out. It's really – which is the truth. I mean, it's true of virtually everything mm-hmm. in life. You know, I mean, if you're if your spinal cord severed, you know, you're in a different circumstance. You know, but 
if it's not, you can probably get out of that, whatever that circumstance, you know, or whatever that health situation is, you can probably change it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. You're still, you're still not, it's not, I'm not fast forwarding that far, but you go to Arlington Cemetery. And, and you're not really truly walking yet, um, but you go there and you decide you're gonna, you're gonna walk. You say, my, my legs trembled underneath me. I saw another sign that read simply, silence and respect. My arms shook as I pressed into my canes to grind myself forward another step. It felt like my bones were going to explode under the force of my body each time I transitioned my weight. We trod on slowly. We made our way by the rows and rows of heroes sacrificed on the altar of freedom at a snail's pace, but with the same determination they had brought into combat. I was either going to walk the entire way or die trying. I don't know how far we walked that morning exactly, but it was at least a mile from the gate to section 60, and I had trekked every step of it. My arms ached and shook as my quadriceps quivered their way through the steps. The rest periods between legs of the journey grew longer as we went along, but I never went back to that wheelchair. When we reached the sign that said Section 60, I did not want to stop anymore. Braxton, you should probably take a break here. Don't overdo it. No, I'm okay, I responded, the sweat pouring from my face. When we were inside Section 60's boundaries, it must have taken us another hour to reach Sergeant Can's graveside. Along with the slow pace we traveled due to my fatigue the weak, and the weakening pain threshold, I read nearly every headstone I walked by on the way, each one adding more time and new significance to the journey, but also giving me a little more fuel to feed the desire, the desire to remain erect. Every step made me miserable. Pain radiated from my hips to my knees. The agony had grown so immense that several times I thought that I might throw up because of it, but we never gave up. I trudged every torturous pace of that march out of respect for Sergeant Can and the 250,000 fallen warriors he lay with. When we finally reached his graveside and read, Adam Lee Can, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, January 25th, 1982, January 5th, 2006. BSM with the Purple Heart, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I lowered myself to a knee and wept. Not because of the pain I was experiencing, but because I had the nerve, the flat out audacity to complain about it. These hundreds of thousands of heroes had given their lives to provide me with a safe place to recover, and all I'd thought about up to that point was how hard my time had been. Whatever I'd given in service to my country and my brothers paled in comparison to what they had done. Who was I to feel so sorry for myself? Who was I to complain about my situation? I was above ground. There was not a soul laid to rest in that holy shrine who would not have gladly taken my place if they could have. It became clear to me in that moment that I really did have nothing to complain about. And every time I did complain, it should be seen as a slap in the face to far better men than I will ever be. When I had finished Fang paying my final respects to Sergeant Can and the men immediately surrounding him, I stood up on both canes and began my long walk out of the cemetery. A brand new sense of urgency to recover, a newfound pool of motivation to draw from. I was going to beat this thing. I was going to fight to take my life back again, not just because I wanted to, but because I had to, because they couldn't. Now, that pledge was not an easy, uh, not an easy pledge to take, not an easy pledge to keep. Mm, no. Um, 
even coming back from that, I mean, you, you, you know, you're, you started swelling up. Everything started swelling up from doing that long walk. Um, Later on, you say, oddly enough, just sitting there trying to knead the pain from my legs did help ease the frustration a bit. I stopped thinking about the things I couldn't do, like open a cab door on my own, and started thinking about what I just accomplished, walking some real distances. Distances no doctor who had operated on me had ever imagined possible. How did I do that, I wondered. It took me years to get to the bottom of that question. The truth is that the only reason I had walked that far in that condition was because I had read a sign that reminded me that Arlington was not about me. I didn't care enough about myself or my future to grind through that kind of torment. Self-gratification nor self-improvement was enough to motivate me. My own ego was nowhere near big enough to carry me through that. I had done it because I did not want to disrespect Sergeant Can or any of the rest who had given their lives at war. I made that journey because I had a reason bigger than myself. I needed to cling to that maxim. When I read that, and that's one of the one of the points in this book when I when I'm talking about these sort of internal thoughts that you've had and things that you figured out along the way. I was thinking about the fact that oftentimes we don't mind letting ourselves down, but we just wouldn't want to let down our friends, our teammates. Mm. I mean, I know for a fact in the military and the SEAL teams, the worst possible thing you want to have happen. You know, look, if you disappoint yourself, okay, that's bad, that sucks, but you don't want to let down your teammates. Mm. And to me, that, you know, you said it took you years to get to the bottom of that question. And, that helped me get to the bottom of that question you know, of how, what is it that these guys will do anything for their friends? They'll do anything for their friends. They'll take better care of their friends than they will of themselves, mm-hmm. which is, which is a, a crazy thought. I mean, I, I know you, uh, you listen to some Jordan Peterson and read some Jordan Peterson, and one of the things that he says is, well, it's like treat yourself as if you were someone that you would want to take care of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a similar thought. Oh yeah, it is. And like I guess I'm probably where I got it, and just had never put the two together. Actually, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's also true. It, like any time you're doing anything hard, yeah. It, like if you're ready to quit, if you can find something, you you know, like find some other reason, it'll put like your ego is just only so big, and it's also really easy to be like. Man, no one's even gonna know I quit right now. Rationalize. You know I mean? yeah, no, like, man, no, no one knows that bull's out down there. I'm the only one that knows that bull's in that canyon. You know, no one's gonna know if I don't hike down there. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> like you, like you, you just gotta find something to force you. You know, um, like for me, it's like I gotta go home and tell my buddy that I pulled that bull out of that canyon. You know, like it, it's like I gotta talk shit to my buddies too. You know, like just as much as you love them, it's like it's kind of like that give and take of the relationship. Yeah. You know, yeah. both ends. Yeah, that was a that that was a moving uh, section of this book, man. That whole section was uh, rough to read. Um, yeah, and those canes are the ones with the four ends on them. You know, not like a regular cane. I ended up getting regular canes later from Walter Reed, but those were the different kind and so it gave me like a little bit more stability i think on a regular cane i'd probably fell a few times for sure um and you know that road is it's like a good good road and everything so it's like the walking wasn't that bad it's just it's pretty busted up and and yeah and i had never i had never been to arlington before i'd never seen it and there really is I don't know if spiritual is the right word or, or what, but it really conveys some sense of reverence, especially once you get into the actual grounds. You know, the the, the tour center is one thing, but the you know, once you actually get in there, it's a very powerful moving place. Yeah. And then you start to realize like every one of these stones is an actual person. Not just like a picture you saw in a movie or something, you know. It's like here's his name. And in many cases, here's his wife on the other side. Right. And, you, know, you just see, like, generations of dudes who have died, you know, and, and, and women, too, now. And 
yeah, it's 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 really it's one of those places in the world where or in this country where you just have to go experience it. Mm-hmm. I and mean, there's really no, it's, I don't think anyone can write powerfully enough to explain what it's really like there. Yeah, and I think um, you know when you know guys, when you know guys that are buried there, and you can kind of relate relate that individual when you look at all those graves you just th- you know that every one of those is like you said a person it's like that's a that's a mother a father a son a daughter it's like like someone that was known and and i think it's easy to fall it's easy to just call a soldier a soldier right and not remember that that soldier's a person mm-hmm. and i think when you know when you know some of those people in those graves it's easy to expand and connect that uh personal side to each each and every one of those gravestones um knowing the the sacrifice isn't just somebody in a uniform it's a person like i said it's a a brother a a sister a father a son a daughter a mother and it's freaking heartbreaking to be in there um Meanwhile, um, as this is going on, you still have, um, you know, you're still working through like your physical issues, and it sounds like your hand was just like, like I can't. When I look at your hand now, when I was reading this, I I, I would, didn't think your hand was going to be in the kind of shape looks yeah, pretty, good. pretty freaking good to go when when i read stuff like this large this is from the book large chunks of skin were falling away from my hand they were not thin and dry shit strips like those shed from snakes but thick and wet like scales floating away from a rotten fish that's washed up into the shallows i couldn't help but feeling like this part of my body belonged to a corpse the visual is bad in Ramadi, but that day it looked as if it were dying. This day it looked like the hand was already dead. Like it was foreshadowing all that was to become of me if I were to succumb to my wounds. And though I was still doing much better, the fate of my the, I was still the fate was still far from out of the question. I still had an infection in my body, blood clots in my legs, an IVC filter that could break apart at any minute, and no one's addressing my brain injury yet. Even if I did live through the whole ordeal, I would be doing it with most of the function, uh, without most of the function of my right hand. All that I had ever done in my life, which I had found worth doing, whether it be shooting, working, weightlifting, boxing, wrestling, cowboying, bull riding, or even war fighting, had required not just two hands, but two strong and capable hands. This hand, which had once defined me, now looked as if it were gone forever. I had not given it permission to give up yet, yet there it was and sat crippled atop my wrist, a symbol of not just what could become of me, but of how little control I had over my fate. The futility of resistance can be maddening. Yeah, and it's it, that's another thing that's interesting about this book is you can tell a freak, you can tell it's not a Hollywood movie because in a Hollywood movie, it's like there's some point where everything turns and everything's like good now. You know, <laughs> they write the book with that perfect story arc. And this ain't a perfect story arc. No. It's like up, down, up, down, up, down. Sometimes the down is way lower than the up. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes it powerful is this freaking, it's like realistic. And it's also it makes it powerful because like every time I would read something and I'd be like, oh yeah, there it is. Like I'm, I'm like uh, brainwashed by Hollywood, you know? I'm reading it like, oh yeah, he went and visited the grave. Here's the turnaround. And then no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're like, oh, you know, this happens, and we're gonna hit some more of those. But that's life, right? Yeah, that's the real thing. Yeah, there's a couple even after the book was over that happened too. But yeah, that's that's gonna be in the second book, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, what about this? There's one section where this physical therapist is is she comes in to bend your finger. This one, yeah. She's, she says, hey, I'm going to bend your finger. And you say, don't. It's fused. 
Yeah. And she says, no, no, it's not. We just need, you need to just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was trying to get me to do this church and steeple thing. Uh -huh. Do this. But this finger, this knuckle doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like pulling on it. So <laughs> you're telling you're telling her it's fused. It's, fu it's a funny part in the book. Dude, how bad did she feel? I, th I think she felt pretty dumb. I was I was sitting there waiting like uh, for it you know, to break. Yeah, you know when you got a cyst when you were a kid and your grandpa was go get the Bible and whack it with a hammer. <laughs> you know, I was just waiting for her to come hit it with a book. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, tried. I was like, whatever. I can't really feel it worth a shit anyway. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I my right here in my wrist is where that median nerve was transected, so I really couldn't feel this part of my hand. Like hardly at all at that time so it wasn't like really hurting i mean a little kind of sort of in like <laughs> the, pulling, the, way, but. the way you describe it she's like getting tired she's like she getting was. tired <laughs> <laughs> cranking on your she, freaking knuckle well, she's, hey, she was like this big around <laughs> yeah and yeah she was and kind of attractive too so i was just like well, yeah. <laughs> like go for it man oh uh, <laughs> there it like, is sucker <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get all kind of sympathy when that thing crack. <laughs> uh, you end up getting this deal where they're going to send you the community-based healthcare organization, which is, mm -hmm. which is you get to go back home basically to heal up. Yeah, th I think they've since ended the program. But, but it seemed to you at the time great. like freaking awesome. Yeah. You didn't have to be stuck out there at Walter Reed anymore. You could, you could head home. Yeah, and, um, cause it's, so I'm sorry to cut you off. The traditional path at Walter Reed is you're inpatient and then you're an outpatient, but you stay on Walter Reed campus in like, you know, these barracks and mm -hmm. stuff. And then you're just doing all of your outpatient work at Walter Reed. So guys are there for like two, three years sometimes yeah. like going through all their outpatient. And so the army is like, well, let's just send them home, do outpatient care at home. Yeah. And that's kind of how the, I mean, I, you were stoked. You were yeah, stoked so, to get oh, the yeah. hell out of there. Hell yeah. I can go back home. I freaking hate cities, man. <laughs> <laughs> get me out of this place. Uh, you got some, again, there's so many, so much stuff uh, that people got to get the book for as you're, as you're making progress and as you start driving across the country and as, you know, you get a new car, you get in some situations that are all in here that are g good reading, man. Not always the not always the most positive thing, but it's at least it's good reading. S smartest kid. <laughs> uh, fast forward a little bit. Now you're driving across country. You're getting home. Even in the dark night, the green agricultural fields of home seemed to glow as our headlights shone on the little mountains in the valley. It was too late to see my family. They were all in bed long before we arrived. For most of our drive, I had been communicating with my two closest friends, Dan and Josh. They had planned to meet us at the house when we arrived. I hope... They were still awake. I sent them another message. We're just getting into town. The words, welcome home, Corporal McCoy, were written in big block letters across a banner that spanned the two-lane road, two, two road at the northernmost end of town, at the southernmost end of town. Home at last, I belted out through a grin. The steps to my house had been covered with a homemade wheelchair ramp engineered by my stepfather. My wife went to the door, opened it, and carried our bags inside. Another bit of my pride died as I helplessly watched her do the heavy lifting. I reached across my body and jerked the lever which bound the vehicle's door. My right hand was still too weak to perform the tasks. So, of course, what's the smart move at this juncture? Start drinking with your friends, which is what you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, opioids and every other kind of thing in there. Yeah. Um, you start drinking with your friends. And this is, uh, again, when I talked about like one of the things that makes this book so good is just the fact that you're just gonna tell the truth of what you did and how you did it. And this is one of those things where I was reading, I was like, okay, check. Um, so you're drinking with your friends, this is literally the first night you're back and finally someone says, you know, so what happened, how'd you get hit? And you say in the book, I started the story with why the why my team had been at the glass factory in the first place. I tried to inform them of the political climate in Ambar and how the arguments at home were shaping the battlefield over there. I gave them as much backstory as I could, hoping to give them enough to gather a layman's understanding of our experiences. Then I got to the to January 5th and the buildup to the explosion that crippled me and killed our brothers. I had been descriptive and honest up to that point, but for some reason that I may never fully understand, I started lying. I said that I acted in heroic ways after being wounded by the suicide bomber when I didn't. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe it was just the whiskey. Maybe it was insecurity. Maybe it was survivor's guilt screaming in my head that I could have, should have done more. Whatever the motivation was exactly, I will never know. But there I stood in my kitchen, pants down to my ankles, leaning awkwardly on my canes, pointing at the scars, covering my limbs, and lying about battlefield heroics I never exhibited. Yeah, she makes me cringe still, um, but I mean, it's true, so. You wanna hear my assessment? Sure. Of this situation? I think this is what happens to dudes. You, what, when you're trying to tell somebody a story, what your goal is, is to make them feel what you felt. Mm. And so, if I'm looking at you, and I'm telling you a story, And I want to tell you that, like, a mortar hit. Let's say a mortar hit 50 yards away from me. Mm -hmm. Which mortars have hit 50 yards away from me? Mm -hmm. It's scary. Mm -hmm. And it scares the shit out of you. It goes, bah! And you're like, whoa. (laughs) And, like, it can kill you. Even 50 yards away, it can kill you. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. So if I'm telling you a story, and especially if you're a civilian, I want you to know. I want you to feel what I felt. That freaking explosion scared the shit out of me. So when I tell you some of the details, I think there's a tendency to say, this freaking mortar hit five feet from me. Mm. And I'm just trying to let you feel what I felt in the best way that I can. So when I'm thinking, you know, even going out, like, going outside the gate, going outside the wire, walking out there, trying to capture what it's like. It's hard to convey those, and you want someone to feel it so bad, what you felt. I don't know, I think that drives guys sometimes to say things that maybe aren't 100% on point, they're not 100% true. The spirit of what they say is true, but the but the facts aren't, you know? Mm-hmm. So. I think that's some of it, you know, just when you when you rattle through the, like you're not really sure why you did it, I think part of it is because you want people to feel at least some of what you felt. Mm. And you know, we're not always the best at, at conveying the feelings. And especially when people are looking at you and you can see that they're not quite getting it, mm-hmm. you know, and you go, ah, some, you can see the look on some civilian's face that's like 50 meters away. That doesn't sound like a big deal, you know? I'm looking at Echo right now. He's kind of like 50 meters. <laughs> what are you kidding me? No Across factor. Across the football field? Yeah, yeah, half the football field. <laughs> yeah, are you kidding man. me? What yeah. a joke. Um, so that's what I, that's one of the things. Look, are there other new candidates? Sure. But when I've talked to guys, um, or when I've heard stories from guys where I'm like, mm, where I'm suspect, I usually just take into account, oh, they just want me to feel what they felt. They just want me to feel what they felt, and I think that adds to it a little bit. This is a really interesting per- perspective I've never considered. Yeah. Um, and this is what's weird, and you, this is what you say. The lies and embellishments I was telling were chipping away at what was left of my pride even as I spouted them, but really, what did I have left to be proud of? That, see, that's the other crazy thing, is like you're talking to civilians. Like, they have, you, you don't, <laughs> You don't need to say, like, you're like, hey, I got blown up, man. <laughs> like, that's good enough of a story as you're going to get, <laughs> you know? Uh, I was a shortened, pasty, frail, and morally compromised shell of whatever kind of man I had been once before. Pride, what pride could be expected of a man who's forced to urinate in a plastic bottle next to his bed because he's too weak to walk to the bathroom at night? So, again, in your mind, you think you got to build up like yourself, but bro, I mean, anybody that's sitting there looking at you like, hey man, you obviously freaking, you know, got after it. (laughs) Or in front of it or something. (laughs) 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 Yeah, man, I don't know. You're right. I had really never considered that, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird when there's civilians involved too because they literally have no idea, you know? Like, it's only in your head, you know? It's only in your head that you think, maybe, you know, I need to tell them that I did this. They're, they're, bro, you went to Iraq. These people were sitting around in freaking Utah, whatever, drinking beers, you know? That's true, yeah. 
Well, I, I'd been, you got to remember too, I've been in the hospital living in my head 24 hours a day for God. months at that point because they can't really talk to anybody. Even though they're army nurses and stuff, they're, they might as well be civilians too. They never, I mean, they just work in a hospital. I'm not saying they don't do power, powerful and great things. I just mean, so far as like being able to relate or understand, they can't, you know, they can't relate. And the, when I was in the neuro ward at Walter Reed, the, a kid got a kid, not a kid, a soldier that was like my same age, got put into a room next to me that got shot through the throat in Afghanistan. And once he got to where he could talk again, at least every once in a while, we'd be able to both, you know, shoot the shit a little bit. But outside of that, and he couldn't talk for, you know, he was struggling. I mean, he got mm-hmm. like a five four R, I think it was, through his through his neck. But so yeah, so you're also just constantly living in your own head. So maybe when I was home like that perspective that you shared earlier I'd, I'd never considered maybe i was doing exactly that uh but to myself you know like mm-hmm. yeah, i don't know i don't know um so i'm gonna i'm gonna fast forward a little bit again um you go to visit your you go to your mom's house and your grandma and your granddad are there and you know, you, you make it in, your your grandma's there, she's like glad you made it home. Um, you are you're you know, hey, where's grandpa? He's over on the couch, she pointed. I plopped down beside my childhood hero and clung as tightly as I could manage. His arms felt weaker than they once had, but not a thing could diminish his mountainous stature in my eyes. We sat there for a while in embrace. I almost felt like a kid who had fallen down and scraped his knees. I just wanted to hear him tell me that it was gonna be all right. I'm so proud of you, he whispered. I love you, Grandpa. I'm sorry. Tears welled up in my eyes. He told me that he was proud of me, just like I had hoped he would, but it didn't make me feel good. I didn't deserve that accolade, and I knew it. When he said he was proud of me, he was talking about who I was as a man, not what I had accomplished physically. I knew that. The very night before, I had demonstrated a lowly character. Why should he be proud of me? He wouldn't be if he had known that I was a kind of man who lied to his friends. Oh, you dummy, what the hell are you sorry for? Knock it off before I kick you right in the ass, Grandpa responded. I buried my head into his once broad and muscular shoulder, trying to hide my shame. I don't know how long I stayed there for, but I would have stayed longer if he'd let me. I spent the better part of a week building that damn wheelchair ramp, and you didn't even use it. My stepdad quipped. I'm never getting back in that goddamn chair again, I bellowed. Braxton, watch your mouth, Mom yelled. Watch it or I'll sock you one. Grandpa joined in. Um, fast forward. Like many other soldiers at war, my, my home front had changed considerably during my absence. My great-grandmother, whom I had been very close to, passed away, but she had written a letter while I was in Ramadi saying she expected to go soon. Her death was not so unexpected. My step-grandpa never seemed to age a day in his life before I left for the war, but while I was gone, he developed prostate cancer. The chemotherapy aged him dramatically in just one year, but even this was less jarring than the sight of that wheelchair. Everyone's life has an event horizon. My grandfather's had just come earlier than I anticipated. That was all there was to it. I just wasn't ready for the sight of my hero, the man who raised me when no one else wanted to, crawling into a chair. And that's because he's, you know, basically he's he's now in a wheelchair. Yeah, and I, I'd watched him battle his back injury for since I was like 14 years old. And he just kept working because mm-hmm. he had to pay for feed his family, you yeah. know. And so I knew exactly how he ended up in that chair. So it, it kind of hit even harder, you know. Um, so the whole reason that you came home, the whole reason you were able to come home was this community-based health care organization. Uh, it's two and a half hours you had to drive to get there. Um uh, Kind of checking in here. Corporal McCoy, how the hell are you? A deep, familiar voice boomed out from behind the vehicle. I'm rolling along. Top, how you been? It was Sergeant. It was First Sergeant K, a senior NCO that I knew well. In fact, he had been the guy that approved my request to volunteer for deployment to Ramadi. I've been well, cowboy. I wanted to introduce you to your new platoon sergeant, Master Sergeant Dillinger. 
Hello, Sergeant, I said, extending my hand. He grabbed my hand and proclaimed, young man, I expect to meet a soldier in a wheelchair. You seen him around anywhere? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm doing my best to stay out of that damn thing, Sergeant. He's a grizzly old bastard, Corporal. Most of us around here just call him Bulldog. First Sergeant K chimed in. Master Sergeant Dillinger, Bulldog, was a short, stocky combat veteran of the Vietnam War. Usually he paced around br- briskly with a cigarette in his lips, looking for someone's ass to chew. He didn't beat around the bush about anything. If he had a thought, you were liable to hear it. But he cared about a man, the men in his platoon, and he played no games, especially the armies. <laughs> Later on in our relationship, when there was a mandatory formation upcoming that he didn't think I needed to drive up for, he simply called me on my phone and asked me where I, where I was and whether I was okay. Then he told the commander that I was accounted for. Over time, I developed a deep admiration and respect for that man, the kind that no rank or ribbons can earn. He's, he sounds like a character. He was so funny. And, <laughs> and just the best guy. He got me my first job after I, after I got out. And he's just a really good guy. He ended up dying uh, a couple years, five years ago, six oh. years ago. Just lung cancer. <sighs> but he was 70 or so by then. Yeah, he was a hell of a guy. And he was he was the kind of he was the kind of leader that expected you to do whatever you were supposed to do, but he would really shield you from nonsense that you didn't need to be involved in. You know. Yeah, <laughs> you say in the book here, uh, Corporal. I know you've been through a lot of shit in the last year. I'm old enough to know what it, what this shit is like. I did my time in Nam. Our war wasn't squat compared to yours, Sarge. I interrupted. Shut the fuck up, McCoy. You cut me off. I've seen plenty of war. It's all the same shit. Our wars might have been different, but you did your time in the shit. You don't owe me any. You don't owe me or anyone else a fucking caveat. Understood? I nodded. What I'm trying to say is this unit is different. This is a medical holdover company. We're not a line unit. But don't get it wrong. This is still the army. There's still enough bullshit here to pack. 10, five tons. I will do my best to make sure you only eat the shit you have to, but I swear to God, if you fuck with me, I will have your crippled ass on the next fucking flight to DC, understood? <laughs> Roger, Sergeant. I will call your cell phone anytime I feel like it, and if I want to, and if you don't answer, you better be dead, dying, or in the middle of a medical appointment, understood? Yes, Sergeant. You call me first thing in the morning, I will know everything, I will know about every medical appointment on your schedule, and if you leave your house for any reason, I don't give a shit if it's just to go outside to piss on a tree, you will ask permission first, cop. Roger, Sergeant. All right, now get that pretty little wife of yours home and let her relax, Corporal. You're free to go. Roger, Sergeant. I had only made a few steps when I heard his voice call out again. Corporal McCoy. Yes, Sergeant. Welcome home, son. Glad you made it. Thank you, Sergeant. So there you go, man. Freaking Jesus, stud. 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 Um, again, you know, that sounds all cool. I'm all happy I'm reading that part. I'm like, oh, here's the good turning point. Uh, then you fast forward a little bit. I told myself that my none of my behavior was an overreaction when taken in context. After all, these little bursts of extra pain may have been slight when considered on their own, but when piled on top of the constant and never-ending aches I endured, they seemed excruciating. I hurt every second I was awake, and nighttime brought me no reprieve. When I lay in my bed at whatever time seemed appropriate that evening, I didn't sleep. What's more, I never expected to sleep. How could I sleep when I hurt so much? What had, what had I become? I was being weak. I had once thought my mental toughness was as sure as the sun coming up in the morning, but I was broken down again. Before I was wounded, I used to claim that I had never quit in my life and nothing could make me, but I was wrong. I had hit many, many breaking points during recovery. The internal dialogue whirled about my head in an endless cycle. I was being soft and I knew it, but rationalizing the pain was so damn easy to do. I had made it all, I had made all sorts of excuses over the course of the past few months, and although it should have been the last time I had made such justifications, it wasn't. So... You mentioned in a brief moment, a um, little bit ago, opioids. Scary thing. They've been in the news a bunch. Uh, you say on the question of addiction, many of us had little to say to begin with. This is an interesting point. I didn't choose to be addicted. I didn't even understand the deg- degree to which I was addicted. 
There was no true first time, so to speak. I never had the, an opportunity to debate the potential pitfalls of drugs with a sober mind. The fact is, like with so many other soldiers, my addiction was little more than the tragic side effect of healing. I left Walter Reed taking, a hundred, taking hundreds of milligrams of Oxycontin a day. One civilian doctor told me that I had been prescribed dosages in multiples of what he wrote his terminal cancer patients. I didn't choose that. Neither did thousands of others, thousands of other men and women who found themselves in similar circumstances. I did, however, make things much worse. And that can't be hung on anyone but me. This caveat to the story is meant to be read as a sort of table setting, not an evasion of personal personal responsibility. I have learned many lessons through my journey, probably the most important of them being taking ownership of one's failures is the best way to avoid making the same mistakes in the future. If there's a way to rationally place blame on another or on fate itself, that is all the more reason to look inward for a culprit because that knave is the only one you can reliably alter. A little bit of extreme ownership going on there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I took that from you. <laughs> Sorry, man, I appreciate that. By all means, that. Oh, by all means. <laughs> you can't take what's free. <laughs> it, it is true, though. It's one of those deals I'm sure you've, I know I know you wrote similar things in, in your first book that um, and, and there is a way to view this these sort of situations where you can look at it like well sure maybe I was forced into this and that wasn't my fault but the only way I get out of this is if I just control the parts that I can control mm-hmm. and I can't I can't do that without taking ownership of the things that I'm screwing up mm-hmm. So you, you almost have to just say, okay, we, we, the first play doesn't matter anymore. Now it's, you know, third and 10, and I got to figure out how to crunch these yards. Like, that's it. That's you know it. I mean? That's it. And, I, you, you know, you say you stole it from me. You actually talk about you, – you give credit to uh, Extreme Ownership, the book, in, in, in this. So I appreciate the, the shout-out, and I'm glad that it was able to – something that you were able to connect to. Um. So that's sort of the the opening that you give on this dealing with Oxycontin and whatnot. You say the hardest part of managing pain was not dealing with the sharp, often crippling surges, it was the constant aching. In retrospect, I think the most profound effect of the Oxycontin was on my sanity. The continual never ending dull aches that engulfed my lower extremities, spine and right hand were psychologically torturous. It wasn't exactly excruciating, but the utter lack of respite was brutal. And that's, um, you know, you, you, you kind of go into that, but I, I wanted to highlight the fact that you say a couple times, like it was just absolutely constant, unending pain all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about that, what, what would this, if it's, let's say the Soviets had the ability to inflict this kind of thing, like invisible damage i mean it's not invisible but like let's say they could make invisible damage and chronic pain that's the that would have been the preferred torture mechanism you know because mm-hmm. they could just send you back into the real world and they'd be like whenever you're ready we can push the button or you know remove the device or whatever and make the pain stop yeah but you got to do what we told you to do yeah but that's how a lot of these guys are living for months and years at a time and i i think we don't really I, I don't think we don't go deep deep enough into the psychology of that often enough when we tell our own stories we just sort of kind of gloss over that achy you know dull almost maniacal pain and a lot of dudes even just like construction guys are living like this mm-hmm, for sure you wonder why they're drinking like 30 pack a night or whatever it's because their backs jacked up or they're whatever yeah. they're hip or something and like you said they still got the bills to pay the family to feed yeah. And speaking of drinking, at this point, you say you're drinking a half a fifth of bourbon a night yeah. on top of the painkillers. Um, at one point, one of your friends, I guess, yeah. teaches you how to snort Oxycontin. 
Yeah, some things had changed while I was gone. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'd, like, seen this kind of stuff done as a kid. Like, you'd see people, you know, you'd a party or something, you see people, like, roll up a dollar bill or something, and you're all just drinking. But there's, like, a whole process to be able to snort Oxycontin, and that was that was news to me. But you, When you – so you do it. Mm-hmm. This guy kind of shows you what's up, teaches you how to snort Oxycontin. Once you do it, you feel like you you feel like you're gonna puke. He tells you to go puke. You go puke, and then you say from the book. After I vomited, I felt better than I have ever had in my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. That I it, when I was speaking at schools for a while, I used to tell teachers and like the worst thing you can tell a kid is that it's not fun because then they know you lied to them. Oh. Like. Because it is, it's it really is like the most invigorating. It's it's really as bliss. Uh, it's a it's it's honestly it's difficult to put into words how good it feels. It's like euphoric. But if you if you lie to people and say drugs are all terrible and you know and then their first experience is like what have you been hiding from me, dude? Like this is amazing, you know. <laughs> like, then they're more likely to. You know, like it's it much better to focus on how bad things can get rather than tell them it's not fun. You know, same yeah. thing with like drinking. I mean, I mean, how many preachers' daughters end up, you know, <laughs> doing preachers' daughters things? <laughs> uh, one of the guy I knew, um, a friend of mine, told me he he ended up in jail and whatnot. But he said the first time he ever did crystal meth, it was the only thing he ever wanted to do for the rest of his life. No shit. Like it was just like so. He just loved it. Very first time, done. He was done. He was addicted, and he ended up, you know, addicted until he went to jail. Uh, You say, my desire to continue on was eroding. Many factors were contributing to this, like the impossibility of finding refrain from the physical torment, but my inability to come to terms with the fact that my best friends were still in harm's way, living in the hell that was Ramadi in 2006 without me, and my own be- poor behavioral choices were the worst of them. Once I had scrawled the timeless military mantra, death before dishonor, d- death before dishonor on the walls of my hooch in Iraq. Now, here on the home front, where that code should be easiest to live up to, I failed and I continued to fail every day over and over. The surest form of justification ran through my head. What does it matter anyways? Once I started abusing pain medication, my mental health went downhill rapidly, but I didn't care. I felt nothing. Even chasing the dragon became a sort of mundane routine. Doctor appointed visits, doctor appointments, visits with specialists and physical therapy sessions were too similar to tell apart. The only piece of me that had grown was my opioid addiction and it had metastasized. In the morning I'd wake up, wheel into the bathroom, grind up another Oxycontin and eagerly devour it as if it were the cure to, rather than a cause of, my self-hatred. After my usual half day's work at the hospital, I stopped by the liquor store and picked up a fifth of bourbon. Oftentimes feeling safely away from the presence of the local law enforcement, I opened the bottle the moment I exited the freeway. Most days I drove right past my house, headed for the nearest solitude I could find. I longed for a place where I could be alone, just me and my thoughts. My thoughts nearly never left Ramadi. It was almost as if I still lived there in my mind. I had become bitter and angry. I hated everyone and everything around me. Don't any of these assholes realize we're at war right now? Good men are dying in ungrateful countries half a world away. What the fuck is everyone smiling about? The only people I still loved were thousands of miles away and I had no way to talk to them. I slid my way out of the truck, placing most of my weight on the cane in my left hand and the, le- and the rest on my left leg as I had become my new normal pain shot through my body. My hip wobbled. It couldn't handle the redistribution of weight. I let out a short groan, fuck this shit. I yelled aloud, broadcasting my complaint to God, the universe, and whatever else may be listening. I emerged from my home a short while later with my semi-automatic 45 caliber handgun and a fresh bottle of pills in tow. 
I climbed into my truck, yanked the lever into reverse, and started for my favorite little mountain valley in those east hills. I pulled my truck back up to the edge of the valley in front of the old cabin, hoping that someone might find me before my decomposing corpse began to bloat. I didn't want my mom to have to deal with that image for the rest of her life. I retrieved my lighter, bill, credit card, CD case, and Oxycontin. I was ready to get on with it. I kept pounding whiskey while I crushed up my narcotics. I was anxious to feel the warm blanket of euphoria their imperceptible chains would bring. Lines spread across the CD case placed in the middle of my center console. I rolled up an already chalky bill and snorted the first line. I feel better already, I thought to myself as I chased it down with another swig of the bottle I was holding between my knees. My pistol sat on the passenger seat beside me. I reached over with my right hand, wrapped its two working fingers around the grip, and pushed the frame into my thigh to stabilize it. Then I racked the slide with my left hand. The gun, now main ready, I set upon my lap, muzzle toward the front of the cab. Never point a weapon at anything you are not willing to destroy. I took up the bottle again and had another slug. I retrieved the loosely rolled bill and tightened it back into a cylinder. Then I placed it at the tip of my other nostril, leaned over and softly breathed in the last of my respite. Calm. I stared over the dashboard at the valley that had once held many of my fondest memories. The world around me slowly closed in. My eyes darkened. I fumbled for the pistol in my lap. I longed desperately for the bite of its cold barrel on the side of my head and the hot, leaden delivery it could bring. Every ounce of my soul begged for its one-way ticket to anywhere but the nihilistic hell I lived in. My eyes opened some time later a near empty bottle of whiskey on the floorboard and the song I just got back from hell by Gary Allen reverberating throughout the cab. So thankfully, you passed out. Yeah. Yeah, it had a had this mix that I'd made at that truck just had a CD player. So I'd had like this mix of songs and that they, they were all those kind of songs. Like, and I drove up to this valley that I used to go, you know, go shoot rabbits or hunt snakes or party with the girls and this kind of stuff. And I just wanted to be done with it. I was just frustrated and done. And luckily, like uh, as you said, I passed out, man. She could have been really bad. And luckily, I didn't, you know, like hit a, acute liver failure or some shit from opioids and alcohol and um and yeah, like physical therapy every day. I was just setback after setback, and then you know my my entire recovery was like setback after setback, and everybody was in Ramadi. And I was on, like, all kinds of fucking drugs and, you know, psych drugs and opioids and every other, you know, and my body didn't work, and I was just I was just over it, man. I was just completely over it. Didn't that, you know, it wasn't, like, in the best marriage at the time, which how could you be, you know, when you're, like, how could your marriage be good when you're behaving like this every day, right? And so just, like, everything is, it, had like, spiraled down the toilet. Um... And that's, it's not an uncommon, it's really unfortunately not an uncommon occurrence. Uh, it's kind of why eventually that I wanted to write the book in the first place was I was reading these other books here and there and I just didn't, I didn't feel like I didn't see anybody that was going, it was, they weren't being like, the, the stories weren't reflecting everything that I was seeing, you know, in my own life and my friends and, you know, some guys were doing great. And then other guys were really not doing great. How is it that no one, like, saw 
I mean, if you're drinking that much and you're free, uh, are they not blood testing you to see how much opiates or opioids are in your system or shit like that? So I was getting blood tested every day for, uh, I think, I can't remember if I was off of blood thinners by then or not. When I was on blood thinners, I had to get tested every day. But they don't test for anything but, like, the, I don't know if it's viscosity or what, but uh, how, mm-hmm. like how thin your blood is. And so then they just adjust your blood thinner medication to that. So no one was like piss testing me for alcohol or anything. And you're not talking to any freaking therapist or psychologist or chaplains or anything like that. Just this, they figured, oh, he's fine. Yeah, I mean, I I was probably, I mean, I I was definitely trying to bluff everybody all the time. But no, I wasn't. Ta- you know, I had to speak to a therapist. I can't remember if it was three times a year. It was something like that. It was some very, or that might have been a VA thing. I can't remember. There's anyway, there was at some point there was a requirement to speak to a therapist like three times a year. Um, God. and that was, that was really it. Yeah. And, and I don't, I wish, I really wish I knew why it got that bad, it, but it, it did. Well, you just kind of breeze through it and I, I'm breezing through the book. I mean, I, I've skipped through a bunch of stuff where the daily grind of what you're doing, you're missing your friends in Ramadi. You're, you're not healthy the way you want to be. The, the downward spiral of, oh, I'm addicted to this shit, and the only way to stop feeling shitty about feeling addicted to this shit is to do more of this shit that I'm addicted to. Yeah. Uh, so I think you, you, the way you lay it out is actually very helpful because people might be able to identify where they are on that f- downward spiral. Yeah, and what, for me, what finally got me there, I'm saying I wish I knew what was at the very, very bottom of it, but, but the, the final catalyst was I injured my leg at physical therapy again. And I was just like, fuck, man, you know, I can't like, I'm, I'm done. like this. I've had enough roller coaster at mm-hmm. this point, you know? So I think if you're, if you're one of these people that's going through addiction and you're, uh, you, what they call like functionally addicted, whether it's heroin or like, there's only a handful of drugs that people can really do it on uh, alcohol. Mostly if you're one of these like functional addicts, you should really know that it, you might hit that one catalyst that sends you to a whole another level of it you know what i mean because mm-hmm. maybe you can ride that for a while but eventually something goes wrong and you're going to turn to that substance to help you get over that and that's going to go you're going to be at a whole new whole new level of addiction because now you just conquered another thing you know with it so and yeah like you know back to your other point thankfully i didn't shoot myself <laughs> i'm pretty happy about that now <laughs> You know, I've, I've said before, like, uh, when people get in these modes and these situations, like, there's, like, a storm cloud around their head that they think is the whole world is a storm cloud. Mm-hmm. And, like, anyone on the outside can look at it and say, bro, you're just it's just around you. And, like, you come over here. You'll be okay. You'll get out of it. But from the perspective that you are in at that time, all you see is just freaking darkness everywhere. Yeah. Um. Going back to the book here, the 15 mile drive back home dragged on. This is after you got your shit back together. Um, My thoughts drifted back to Arlington, the last place in time where I felt strong and accomplished. I remembered again how it felt to recognize how minor my complaints truly were in the grand scheme of things. My sacrifice were so little when compared to those, to what those heroes had given. I was kicking away the blanket of freedom and security that they provided me. It is my duty to live for those who can't, I had once said. Who am I to be so selfish? I was going to throw away my gift of life due to a little suffering. Who among them would not gladly trade places with me, I said to myself, hoping that it would sink in again. My commitment to those heroes rekindled. Shame, the right kind of shame, the kind that expedites transformation, washed over me. Not long ago, I had stood above their sacred resting places, offering whatever small, vicarious redemption I could, yet... I had failed at that promise. I had tried to quit my duty in its infancy, never again. I renewed my vows to them before God and whatever else was listening. I promised never to give into the darkness again. Now as I write this today, I wish so desperately that I could tell you honestly that I made good on this second oath, but I can't. That was not the last time I failed them. In fact, it was just one stumbling among a multitude. 
I was starting to feel a little better about myself. I had made a grave mistake, but luckily it hadn't been final. I've got to get my shit together, I said. So you, um, like you said, you, you redo this vow kind of thing. And, you know, and then again, you freaking, uh, fool me into thinking like, this is it. This is it. He made it out of the darkness. I'm like, cool. We're good. Uh, and you do, you know, you go up, you start squaring some shit away. Fast forward a little bit. These cold fronts and winter weather kept me shut up inside day and night. In my waking hours, I stared out the window at dark and frigid skies. When I lay down to rest, the freezing world around me was replaced by 130 degree memories and nightmares. I felt as if my life was constantly on the brink of an unforeseeable but impending doom. Depression brought me back to the blanket of the bottle and the brief bliss of medication. My hospital visits were shrunk from five days a week to three, but physical therapy was virtually non-existent. The only thing that got me out of bed each day was my hatred for the sheets. I did nothing but watch movies, play my guitar, and drink whiskey. Rock bottom is a slower and softer landing than one may think. That's why we keep chiseling away at the bedrock. That's some good writing. It's freaking depressing writing, but it's good writing. Um, another good, good piece of good writing right here. If there's such a thing as the Christian's concept of the devil, opioids and alcohol are some of the best tools he employs to capture weakened men. The instant euphoria softly whispers its lies to the heart. There are no problems I cannot solve. Addiction snags you at your weakest times like the wolf kills a buffalo. The wolf waits until the bison's gait is crippled or the snow is deep enough to entrap him. Then he pounces. Usually he hamstrings the animal first. Then slowly and methodically he gnaws away the flesh until his prey expires. Fast forward a little bit more. When I returned home, it was about noon and I was already an inebriated mess. I walked through the door, canes and bourbon in tow. The smell of whiskey radiated from my pores. Hey Braxton, I have something to tell you, my wife said. She must be leaving for good this time, I thought. She's unemotional, this time it's for real. Am I okay with that? I've wanted her to leave dozens of times, but am I really okay with it? Yeah, I think I am. How will her family take it? I will remain friends with, will I remain friends with her brothers, her dad? No. Maybe they already know that we fight all the time. They must. Thoughts swirled about my head. I think I'm pregnant, she said. What? I'm pregnant. Aren't you happy about that, she said, smiling. Of course I am. I acted as if I were. I took another shot of bourbon. I wanted to be a father badly. God only knows why I wasn't fit to be one. Still, I was indeed very happy that I may be fulfilling that wish, but was this really the best time? Was I with the best person for me or the best per- or was I the best person for her? The answer to both of those questions was clearly no. Less than a week before, we had been fighting nearly every day. We told each other that we hated one another and we meant it. Each of us had uttered the word divorce aloud. Now we were going to have a baby. Check. You couldn't have predicted that one when you read it early on, though, right? No. <laughs> no. It's, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, rough, man. <clears throat> rough. Yeah. Um, you guys were married young, and then you go through all this. Like you said, it's hard. What, what you just said, you know, it's hard to have a good marriage when you're drinking yeah. bourbon and, you know, doing drugs and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't put the blame on her for this. I, that's the way I look at it anyway. Um, well, I, you know, I had the cliche answer, which is but the real one though, is that I have my, I got my daughter out of the deal mm-hmm. and she lives with me and life's great. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this is now yep. 14 years later, yeah. but, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it it sucked there for a stretch, and it is it's just really easy to get back down in that hole, especially when you're, 
you really still don't you, f- you still feel like you don't have anything to live for mm-hmm. you know that's why i always say that like gratitude you really got to cultivate gratitude in your daily life when i read that part well when i read this like part where she's actually born and you know you, she's healthy and um you say it's amazing how much a parent can love a child i already loved her I would have de- I would have happily died for her. I still would, but in that moment, as I sat there watching them, I realized something was still wrong, not with her, with me. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm like, okay, cool, here we go. You know, we're gonna kind of make it through this. Um, you talk about PTSD. You you bring it you bring it up earlier than this, but this was the time. This is where you started like kind of conveying your thoughts on it. You say, I previously mentioned other times when I thought that I may have been afflicted by PTSD. Many times my subconscious registered a symptom of the disease that I'd read about or my therapist therapist had mentioned. Who could miss the unwelcome memories at inopportune times or the never ending need to suppress unprovoked anger or the nightmares or the illogical moments of panic. I had denied the existence of my illness for many reasons, but most important was that I just did not want to be associated with many of the others I had seen at the VA pensions for the disease or sorry, uh, had received VA pensions for the disease. I knew of a guy who had worked in the laundromat in Iraq. He got a rating of 80% disability for PTSD. For what experience exactly? I wondered. Another guy I'd heard of had been found 100% disabled from the trauma of answering radio transmissions from soldiers in combat. How could a person be so soft that they were damaged by the sounds of combat? I wondered bitterly. During my transition, there seemed no less noble an act than claiming to suffer from PTSD. It wasn't just that, it wasn't just seen as an illness that plagued the weak. It was, in many cases, an illness claimed by liars. Whether they were weak or not was unimportant. I had made many mistakes and acted cowardly and lied many times in my life, but I had no desire to have those descriptors permanently enshrined in my records. At least that was the way I saw it back then. Um, interesting thought. I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting thought, you know, that you're having cause you're a freaking tough cowboy hmm. and these guys that are saying they have PTSD cause they worked in the laundry mat in Iraq. You're <laughs> like, no nah, bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but I wasn't, a lot of guys thought that at the time. Well, I didn't, and because there's a lot of truth to it, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, dudes really game the shit out of that system and we all know it. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand that the VA is in a tough position because, you know, how do you really weed out people right. that are gaming it? I, I get it. But from the soldier's perspective, I didn't want to be, still to this day, really don't want to be labeled in that same way. Like, I'm happy to talk about you know, PTS and working through stuff and uh, acknowledging that it's definitely had profound impacts on my life and I would like to try to help people through whatever suffering they're having, but I don't necessarily want to be associated with it and that's for that same reason today, you know. Uh, I mean, luckily, I don't have to, you don't have to worry, in a lot of ways I don't have to worry about being associated with that crowd just Mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. But but yeah, it's, I, you know, but people talk, especially in the veteran community, we want to destigmatize the term PTSD, and I don't know. Um, I I think we need to destigmatize mental health for sure. But PTSD sort of took on a life of its own, and so like maybe it's time to just shed that label and go with something new, and mm-hmm. or stigmatize the shit out of it and tell people who really, really need help and don't want to be associated with it. I don't know. I don't know the right answer. I don't know either, <laughs> man. <laughs> um, <laughs> as you're working through that shit, uh, you and your wife end up getting divorced. Yeah. And initially, you, her and her, and your daughter leave for her home, which is like, Middle of the country, thirteen hundred miles away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you say, if you thought the that the heartache of divorce and the departure of my beloved child would have caused me to take a long, hard look at myself, you would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because hedonism and self indulgence provide immediate grav- gratification. The rush and excitement and euphoria make it difficult to dig in one's heels and change course. And why would you want to change your lifestyle if you've got no respect for your future? 
The simple, perhaps sad truth is of it is that debauchery can be good old plain fun for a while. For about seven years, I lived in hell, and sometimes I relished in it. You, you basically, um, you basically went hard yeah. for seven years. Yeah, I mean, I not so much on drugs, but alcohol and partying mm-hmm. and chasing girls. One, one of those times I was in San Diego, actually. Uh, yeah, we went. I had a friends that were a bachelor group, and we were all doing okay, making pretty good money, and we were just like, we're just going to party. Yeah. So yeah. we did. Yeah. Um, the evenings, like my descent, always started out in an exuberance and ended shamefully. I was not myself. I didn't know who I was. All I knew is I didn't like the man I saw in the mirror give, and given the option, I would destroy him. My chief mistake was that I didn't realize there was a cure for my illness. The truth. Had I only been willing to accept that I could have been freed of my hide, as in Jekyll and Hyde, much sooner. There were more girls and more parties than I care to remember. Not that I could remember them all if I wanted to. My first steps onto the slippery slope were enjoyable. It can be great fun to lose control momentarily, but once that on that slope, I couldn't keep myself from careening to the bottom. I hardly had control of anything in, in my life, let alone, let alone my alcohol habit. I had ripped the moral substrate out from my, under my world and descended into nihilism. Nihilism is not without benefits, though it simplifies life. There's a problem with nihilism. It leads to depravity and uncontrolled chaos. If nothing else matters, then that's that. Why care about health for the future? Unbridled pleasure was the closest thing I could find to happiness. I sought only hedonistic satisfaction, which I think is the logical conclusion of nihilistic ideologies. It's important to note that my life wasn't all that bad either. It rarely is. That's what makes it so hard to crawl back up the slope. I was still making very realistic, very real physical milestones. I had abandoned the cane altogether. I still stretched every day and did light workouts. My physical body was healing, and aside from the infrequent brushes with the law, I was having fun. The most dreadful part was that somewhere buried deep down in my subconscious in the land of all that shadow was the truth. It was all my fault. War, no war. The problems I faced were my own creation, and I knew that. Yeah. I think sometimes we use these things, uh, some people will use these things as a way to escape from the shame of knowing that you're not what you could be. You know, like people talk about potential all the time, and no one knows your potential better than you. Like, you know who you really are way down in there. And so you just come up with distractions, like useless and senseless distractions, parties and, you know, girls and whatever other venture just to avoid becoming what you're, you know, what you could be. And you said you were making money at this time. What what were you doing? I was working in outreach for a a not-for-profit company. Mm -hmm. But you were getting paid. They were paying me pretty good. And and then at some point... um, you kind of realized, you said, my life was falling apart, my credit score was tanking, my job was on the rocks, mm. every close relationship I, I had once depended on was virtually demolished. I was having too much fun to see it. You decided you quit your job. Yeah. <laughs> there was a, and, was and you wrote about that in here. Um, it's an interesting, basically, there was like an integrity issue with the place you were working for. Yeah. And you... At one point, you're talking to a Medal of Honor recipient, mm-hmm. and you just couldn't you couldn't lie to him, basically. Well, and it was just such an obvious, flat-out bullshit lie, like mm-hmm. straight up. And not like one of these white lies or stretches. Of the, it was just a straight-up falsehood at the expense of, you know, other veterans and this, you know, trying to fundraise, essentially. Mm-hmm. You know, like the lie was an attempt to raise more funds. And so, yeah, I quit. But, and you quit, so you quit your job. You still have, I mean, obviously you're getting your disability pay. And did you get medically retired? So you're getting you a medical retirement? You don't get both, though. Oh, you only get one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at least that was enough money to survive on? Yeah, especially in Cowtown, Utah. <laughs> like, 
man, my freaking mortgage was like 700 bucks. <laughs> like, I was doing fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you quit that job and you want to talk about unexpected, didn't see that coming, mm-hmm. was uh, – I don't you, know where this is going now. What? Comedian? Yeah. So you, you started doing stand-up comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was, like, I was going to college, and I was like, I want, I've always wanted to try it, so I started doing it. How, and, and you must have done all right. You did it for a while? I mean, it's still Utah, even in Salt Lake. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I did it for You're like a big fish in a small pond in Utah uh, well, comedy a, scene. A medium sized fish in a very small pond. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we did okay. I, and I got to be buddies with a guy that was really good. And so that helped. You know, I mean, I was terrible, like everyone is, but <laughs> I, I got, you know, I get, it, it was fun. I, I did enjoy it. Um, but, it, you know, looking back, even. Even the jokes that I would write and stuff were reflective of like a different person than I'd ever been. Because mm-hmm. I was like, and especially like as a young open micer, and then he progressed to like a middle act and stuff. You're, you're just really reaching for stuff, and so you're just saying horrific shit sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, just like shock value. Yeah, and I look back at some of that stuff and I'm like completely embarrassed by it. You think you're ever gonna take a crack at it again? Come out of retirement? <laughs> <laughs> I live in central <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> just go post up at the bar in Idaho <laughs> Falls or something. <laughs> hey, look, you're making us laugh, man. Yeah, yeah. You got it. Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the best things that happened was you actually ended up meeting a girl yeah. and the girl that you meet uh she has a son mm-hmm. who was a few years older than your daughter but you but he's like playing baseball and you didn't think that the baseball was really getting him what he needed so you signed him up for wrestling and it turned out that his wrestling coach was your communications professor in college. Yeah. And he knew who you were as a wrestler. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and then I coached at Miller for a while after that as an assistant coach. Oh, okay. So he, but he knew you had a wrestling background. So he basically said, Hey, if you don't freaking coach wrestling, it's going to hurt your grade. He, yeah. He, he, he straight up near straight up. Said it. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you start coaching and as you're coaching him, Wrestling season's end, season ends, then he's going into baseball, so you decide you're going to coach baseball too. Um, and then this happens. This is pretty cool. I flipped the pitch. So you're, you're coaching these little kids. I flipped the pitch to the little batter. He, softly, he hit uh, it softly in the air. I lightly trotted to it and reeled it in. Another pitch. He hit a hard ground ball a step to my right. I fielded it with ease. Somewhere in my subconscious, the thought rang, dang, that felt good. I served him another. This time he hit a hard ground ball about three steps to my left. My glove hand side. I sprinted to it and scooped it up with a spinning motion. A smile as wide as Montana creased my face. Holy crap, you just ran, his mother shouted. I know. I couldn't contain my excitement. I started charging at every ball he hit, even the ones I didn't need to. A rush of love filled me. I'd forgotten how good it felt to be somewhat capable and likely never would have run toward a ball if I hadn't been tired and losing focus. The lack of attention allowed my subconscious mind to unshackle the chains my conscious mind bound my legs with. On the next pitch, he ripped the line drive over my head. I tried to jump for it. Nope, still can't jump. (laughs) Well, I guess basketball is out of the question. I, I yelled, grinning widely. We called it quits and I immediately grabbed my phone out of my ball bag. I sent out several text messages that read, I just ran, in all caps. A few war buddies who received it called me later that night demanding to hear the full story. When I reiterated it to them, he cried. Pretty awesome discovery right there. It really was. Yeah, and I wonder how much sooner I would have figured that out if I wasn't screwing everything else up Mm -hmm. you know what I mean if I'd have just been dedicated to working on my body I could have probably had five years that I lost you know Mm -hmm. partying near the end of his baseball season at about 4 p.m. got a message grandpa was just rushed to the hospital by ambulance read a text from my mother that would alter my course forever. I called her on the phone to get the details and comfort her. If there was some way that I could, she was clearly anguishing. What can a son say to a mother who is witnessing her rock wash away? 
That night sitting on the balcony of my apartment in West Jordan, Utah, staring at my tomato plants, I wondered what I would do in a world without him. I wished to be away from the bright lights and noise of the city, sitting by a morning campfire drinking coffee with him again. I knew I had long since begun to rediscover myself, but could I stay properly aimed without him? I had started hunting and fishing again. I went back to my roots. I read a little a little young, became and became convinced of the importance of symbols, not just in a socio-cultural sense, but personally. I had begun to wear my cowboy hat in public instead of only on the weekends when I was away from the prying eyes of onlookers. Still, though this was a positive step backward, I had not truly returned home yet. And I didn't know exactly what that meant. I only knew that the answer lay somewhere in my history, somewhere in my roots. I think of it as I think it is true that clothing does not make the man but a display of what it is inside the heart. A cowboy hat may have been a trivial thing, but before I had descended to the underworld, I had worn it with pride. It was a symbol of honor, hard work and respect of heritage. It had been so closely attached to that symbol that I'd worn one nearly every second of my life before I strayed. As a boy, it was no strange event for my mom to remove a hat from my head as I slept. My hat was the first thing my ex-wife brought to me when I was in Walter Reed recovering. I wore it nearly all the time after that. It was not a fashion statement, but a symbol of all my grandpa believed in. I thought a lot about all that my grandfather had taught me as a boy. He thought there were concrete skills and lessons required of a man from the West. And he made damn sure that I learned them. And in your footnotes, you say, by by the West, you mean the Rocky Mountain West. I remembered his knuckles pressing into mountain mud to show me how a mature mule deer buck's weight causes depressions much different than a young buck or doe does. He showed me how to read the difference between an elk track that had just slid down a wet, muddy hillside and one who was on a dead run. He tied his own flies for catching trout out of our mountain creeks, rivers, and lakes, all of which were different flies and weights of flies by his estimation, and he made sure I could do that too. He taught me how to skin an animal by showing me how he did it, but he only let me practice on the lower legs of elk and deer he killed. He taught me how to trap and clean fish and game. He spent time on more abstract things like what it really means to be a man. That's a much harder concept to pin down on page. On one deer hunt, when I was about 10 years old, he handed me a raw liver from a buck he had just killed. He told me that taking a large bite of it was the only real rite of passage to manhood. When the metallic tasting fleshy substance filled the entirely entirety of my mouth and thick warm blood ran down my ran down my cheeks and neck, he let out a deep belly laugh. I realized the joke was on me. He was trying to teach me two lessons there. One, that no single physical act makes a man, and two, not everything an authority figure tells you is worth believing. Sometimes you're just the butt of a joke. You say that the positive step backward. Normally when we think step backward, we think of a negative connotation. But for you, like the cowboy hat was going back to your roots in a positive way. Yeah, not all progress is progress. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a good note. A couple days later, my girlfriend and I were back in my hometown at the church where his funeral would be held. The hallways were lined with pictures of him and my grandma, the love of his life, and his best friend. He believed that family was the most important thing in life. There were dozens of pictures of him and his brothers, his kids, and his grandchildren to prove it. Tables sat on the other side of the doors to the chapel where his service would be held. Each was decorated with his prized belongings, his fly fishing pole, flies that he had tied, and his hunting knife. On one table, atop a rack that held his recurved bow and leather quiver filled with wooden arrows, rested his brown cowboy hat. If it is true that you can tell the character of a man by the company he keeps, then I think it equally true that you can tell the type of man by the possessions his company believes he values. I stood staring at the hat for a while. I remembered asking him if I could wear it around our deer camp when I was a young boy. He dropped it on my head and smiled. 
I spent the rest of the afternoon walking around with that hat like I was like it was a crown fit for for the king of kings. My great uncle Uncle John, Grandpa's younger brother, came up to us while I was daydreaming and asked how I was doing. John was a combat controller in Vietnam. He had seen more than his share, fair share of fighting. I knew intuitively that the question was meant to get at something deeper than how I felt at present. I answered it honestly. Getting better, I think, I said. How long have you been back now? About seven years or so. Give it 10 and you will be fine, he said. You may be a mess for those 10 years, but you'll be okay after that. It will always be there. It doesn't go to go away, but one day, all of a sudden, you'll have it under control. Okay. Thank you. The host called the children and grand- grandchildren up to the casket to pay final respects. Reluctantly, I walked up and put my arm around my mother. She was sobbing uncontrollably. Between gasps for air, she whispered, aren't you going to say goodbye? No, I'd rather this not be the last image I remember him by. She grabbed my hand and dragged me up to his body. Up until that point, I had hardly shed a tear. Grandpa taught me that men ought not to cry anyway. I tried to keep my composure. When I saw him lying there, hair combed perfectly, body, body dressed in his Sunday best, I broke down in a way I never have before or since. The flood of grief and despair twisted my face. I felt like I had been struck by an avalanche of emotion. It seemed as if every little bit of anguish I had collected throughout my lifetime welled up at once. I raised my black cowboy hat up to cover my face and wept. This was a different kind of pain than I had felt before. The kind that a person only encounters when he knows he had failed another that he loved and revered. For years after returning home from the war, I had lived less than two blocks away from grandpa and grandma, but I seldom visited them. When my mother asked me why I wasn't going to see my grandpa when I, more often, I always gave the, gave the same selfish, pathetic excuse. It's just too hard for me to see my hero withering away in a bed. I don't want to remember him like this. I think the full gravity of my selfishness hit me at that moment. It should never have been about me. What an ignorant wretch I was. As for the excuse that I had been using to avoid the situation, that was only half true anyway. The whole truth was, yes, it was hard to see him like that, but I was running from everything in my life after the war. I was running from my emotions, from my responsibilities as a man, and from my own mind. My mistakes, as happens to all of us when we fail, were too often thrust onto other people I loved most around me. Sure, I was paying for them too, but so were they and they had done nothing to deserve it. I failed a man that I loved more than life itself. My my selfishness had hurt him when he needed me most and it was too late to make up for it. All I could do is weep. And that's all I did. Well, it does seem like the um, these these moments throughout the book that um, when you read them, you think of oh, this 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 is this the one? Is this the one that's going to kind of get you up on step, get you to kind of transition away from this this negative path? And it certainly seems like this one had a big impact. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely wish you could see where we're at now. Yeah. 
Well, I wish he could have seen you when you walked into my gym today um, down here in Southern California in San Diego sporting a cowboy hat. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be, he'd be hella proud. Yeah, and he loved his grandkids, and I wish he could see my kids, you know. And that's how good life is now. Obviously, I can't, you know, I can't go back and be there for him when I should have been. But well, one thing that is uh, another thing that's positive is someone sitting here listening right to this right now. I guarantee, at least one person. I don't know how many, but I know at least a minimum of one is gonna is gonna make that move and go and spend time with people they care about that they should. I hope so. So, um. That lesson that you learned now gets passed on. You, um, as you as as you go through that, you start to realize that you missed what like the various things that you missed about being in the military, the various things you missed about being in combat specifically, uh, and you realized you missed even training and getting ready and preparing, which are really positive things in life. Um, you say you say in the book, I, I miss training. I love the feeling of conquering a particularly difficult day at work. The kind of satisfaction that one only gets when he thinks it improbable to overcome the challenge before he begins. That reminded me, I did run a while back. Maybe I can run a full mile now. I decided to call up my old friend and first line leader, Johnny. I knew he had been running marathons and triathlons since he returned from Iraq. Surely he would love to be there when I ran my first mile since the suicide bombing crippled me. I called him up. Hey, bro, I want to run a mile. <laughs> uh, you, you, so you go out. You do it. Um, we finished the mile loop in about seven minutes and 30 seconds. I was proud of my pace, but something else struck me after we finished. My ego was the problem. I had discovered that I was the root of most of my psychological problems years before this, and I had taken some measures to get better. What I hadn't realized was the role ego was playing in all my suffering. I started to look back at every ill-advised decision I had ever made, every argument I'd ever been in, and the grudge against the army that I had held. Nearly all of them could be traced back to my ego. And you, 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 you talk about those. I mean, just like the, well, an example is you're pissed that the army didn't keep you in. Yeah. And yet you say in the book, you're like, hey, I wasn't capable. I couldn't freaking, you know, like carry a rock. I couldn't shoot a gun right now. How are they going to keep me in? Yeah. But in your mind, your ego was like, they should have kept me in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how stupid can you possibly be? But <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know what I thought, other than that I was pissed at them for not letting. <laughs> yeah, I mean you're right, and it, it, it's and I think it's really easy to, and it, and it is a hundred percent your ego, but it's really easy to start doing that thing where you're like, wow, the army just treats me like a number mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, man, they got like a half a million people to, <laughs> they got to, bro. <laughs> like they go, what do you want them to write you a letter? <laughs> like, like what? Well, yeah, but yeah, it really, it, it's, it is, everything is ego. Even still today when I screw something up, which is, you know, a daily occurrence, it's almost every time my own ego, like mm -hmm. almost every time. Yesterday I got pissed at something. Uh, I don't even remember what it was now. And about a half hour later, I was like, oh, that was me. That was mm -hmm. me too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the path is not an easy path. <laughs> the path is not an easy path. Uh, was my wife's birthday today? Oh, and she's she's overseas right now, and uh, I like woke up in the morning. So she's in a different time zone, right? I woke up in the morning and like I got shit to do, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got I got things going. Like work up, work out. So I wake up and there's a family group text, mm. and it says, um, you know, happy birthday. It's from my daughter that's overseas with my with my you know happy birthday, mom. Group family group text, and I'm like, okay, cool. You know, I'm hey, cool, but I, you know, I'm not gonna like. I didn't text at that moment in time, right? So I wake up, work out, uh, 
you know, do my morning stuff, go for a run, ice bath, right? Do it the whole nine yards. And I look at my text and there's a text off the family group text only from my wife. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. It says, thanks for the birthday text mm-hmm. today. Yeah, you deserve that one, by the way. <laughs> That's not the end of the story, bro. <laughs> so in my mind, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was kind of a little bit surprised and I was all, and here's the funny thing. So in my mind, I was like, I just got home from a trip, or from a work trip. I was gone for four days. I worked, how many hours a day am I working at the muster? 16. 16 hours a day at the muster. Uh, just constantly on the go, talking to people, shaking hands, blah, 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 delivering up on stage, blah, just doing all this stuff. Get home from that. I gotta finish reading your book, Braxton. Mm. Then it's Father's Day. What do I do on Father's Day? Prep this podcast. So that's what I'm doing on Father's Day. And then I wake up. I, then I got. I know I got to record this today. I had another call, a big call in the morning. And now I'm thinking my wife is like texting me, like, "Oh, you know, she's on vacation." <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I was like, you know what? Just I'm just gonna. You know, just text her and say, hey, you know, sorry about that. I was, you know, and then before I could even respond, because I was going to sit on it for a little while, breathe, you know, (laughs) take a breath. (laughs) Then my wife sends me a text on the, not the family group text, just hers. And it says, that was Rana, my daughter. So my daughter tricked to try to trick me. (laughs) I laughed about it. I was like, yeah, I knew. (laughs) <laughs> I said allegedly. I, oh yeah, I knew. I will say I was kind of. It was kind of strange that she would have written that. That's why I was kind of surprised. Uh, like was out of character. Yeah, it was out of character. I thought maybe something bad had happened, like some annoying thing, yeah, you know, yeah. like whatever made Braxton mad, something like that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> something that made her mad. <laughs> but but luckily I didn't respond. Imagine if I would have responded in anger. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, don't do that. That goes to show. That's ego. You gotta keep that yeah. ego in check. I kept the ego in check, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but it sometimes can be tricky. Good, good thing you uh, relaxed. Uh, looked around, looked made around, a call, step yeah. back, yeah, step back, put my ego in check. Just, but that's the thing. What was causing my like all that little that little trail of thoughts that I had? I was doing this and I was doing that. And yeah, I was working yeah. so hard, and yeah. you were making it. it was just like ego, 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 ego. Yeah, so I, before I even responded, I was just like, okay, you know what? And you know what I thought to myself, and I do this a lot. Good. I want my wife to be at a point where if she can be on vacation <laughs> in a foreign country, yeah. by the way, that I'm paying for, <laughs> and she can be mad because I didn't send her a birthday text yep. at 4.34 in the morning when I woke up. That's a good That's life. a good, that's, you know, that's when you know things are good for her. Good so I was kind of a little bit stoked. Mm-hmm. But you gotta watch that ego, man. Yeah. You gotta watch that thing. It's ready to bite. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is cool. This is where we start going. Man, you say from that point forward, my life began to morph rapidly. When I was a younger man, I thought courage, strength, and tenacity were traits that made a man worthy of the title, but by exercising each of those traits at different times during and after the war, I realized they were not enough. They are important, highly important, but they are not sufficient enough to make life worth living. I realized that what grandpa had been trying to teach me all along was that a good man and a good life are made of balance, growth, and selflessness. If those three things are a person's substrate, everything else will take care of itself. Strength is important, but it must be balanced with caring. Selfishness, as hard as it may be to spot, erodes the purveyor, or sorry, selfishness, as hard as it may be to spot, erodes the purveyor, the victim, and all those caught in between. If a person is focused on growth, no matter the challenge, he or she will always come out better than they were before the impetus. A mindset of growth helps us internalize our mistakes and craft better strategies for the next bout of trouble. If we can do it without crushing our spirits under the weight of our own self-judgment, that is. Here's where we get rocking and rolling. I decided to quit smoking cold turkey. It was difficult, but no, but by no means excruciating. I limited my drinking to a couple days a week and started each day at 5 a.m. This latter bit being the key to squashing low-key alcoholism most abruptly. The change in my habits helped expedite what was already the most rapid physical change my body had gone through since Walter Reed. Every morning I stretched out, then I ran a mile. Soon that turned into two miles. I was lifting weights in my garage. 
every morning and doing a 30 minute workout at night. I couldn't exercise enough to satisfy my lust for health and vigor. Once my body was strong enough to endure a little hiking, I set out looking for the teacher who had taught me the most valuable lessons in my youth, the mountain. Each mile up, those blustering ridges cut through my delusions. The mountain is indifferent to our existence. We are nothing but another speck upon its rims, no more or less important than the rock beneath our feet or the deer we chase. Ego is no currency in the wilderness. That's a lesson we can all stand to learn. I rediscovered God, or at least, or at the very least, you could say that I had rediscovered meaning but I think that's a distinction without any real difference in the vastness of the wild. The indifference of the Rockies humbled me, humility and truth set me free. Starting to feel pretty good about this book now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You started speaking. And you had been speaking. Yeah. But, well, you know, it's weird. You talk about when you're speaking, you kind of felt like a fraud. Like you'd be telling people, like, yeah, you can overcome anything. And you'd be like, I'm full of shit. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Those people hopefully like claw back their money, come and get their money back. <laughs> well, that was, for, uh, that was for that not-for-profit, though. So they okay. weren't, like, paying me. Got it. The Got not-for-profit it. was hiring me. To- uh, you do in corporate events. You were talking to, you know, professional athletes. Then you went to this summit in Vail. There was a bunch of academic people there. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those people was a monk who taught ethics at MIT. You say this, he taught us the most valuable lesson I had ever learned. Life is suffering. It is only by accepting that fact that we can lessen it. I had been saying something close to that in speeches for years, but he helped concretize it for me. I was done laying my problems at the feet of others. I got online and searched for any information I could find on brain injuries. I found that I had demonstrable signs of TBI. I remembered that the VA sent me a letter listing all the most common symptoms of both brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. I wasn't gonna read these, but I actually am going to just because it's important for people to know these things. Common symptoms of PTSD. One, re-experience the event over and over again. You can't put it out of your mind no matter how hard you try. You have repeated nightmares about the event. You have vivid memories, almost like it was happening all over again. You have a strong reaction when you encounter reminders such as a car backfiring. Two, you avoid places or feelings that remind you of the event. You work hard at putting it out of your mind. You feel numb and detached so that you don't have to feel anything. You avoid people or places that remind you of the event. Three, you feel keyed up or on edge at all time. You may startle easily. You may be irritable or angry at all, t- all the time for no apparent reason. You are always looking around, hypervigilant of your surroundings. You may have trouble relaxing or getting sleep. And then this thing that you looked up goes on to talk about TBI, common signs of brain injury, difficulty organizing daily tasks, blurred vision or eyes tire easily, headaches or ringing in the ears, feeling sad, anxious or listless, feeling irritated or angered, feeling tired all the time, feeling lightheaded or dizzy, trouble with memory, attention or concentration, more sensitive to sounds, lights or distractions, impaired decision making or problem solving, difficulty inhibiting behavior, impulsive, Slowed thinking, moving, speaking, or reading. Easily confused, feeling easily overwhelmed, change in sexual interest or behavior. And then you say this, the last 150 pages of this book and the decade it took to live it look in retrospect like an aggregate of those symptoms played out in one person's experience. I had long understood that the VA wasn't taking my brain injury very seriously, but after reading that paper, it became immediate that I it became immediately apparent that I had not taken the brain injury I incurred seriously enough. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that was actually straight from the letter that they had just mailed me. Mm -hmm. Like that's the the chart from or or whatever the memo. Isn't it kind of interesting to take all those symptoms and just send it to on a letter to someone that has these symptoms <laughs> like you won't be able to do exactly what it says like yeah. this makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> like you wouldn't even be able to read this thing because you'd be irritated you'd be confused you're having trouble like organizing shit they want you to do all this what's wrong with them <laughs> it's freaking ridiculous um you know this is important section 
What was I to do with the fact that my brain, the organ we use to process reality, was permanently damaged? I didn't want to blame my own personal failures, and there were many. This is such a key point. I didn't want to blame my own personal failures, and there were many, on something that was out of my control. I knew that was too simple an answer. The temptation to use this new information as a scapegoat was strong, but deep down in my core, I knew that taking that path would only lead me toward more suffering. I wasn't going to do that again. I decided that the best I could do was accept that I had incurred an injury that had made and would continue to make my life harder than it was before. It was time to move forward with that fact fully internalized. Scapegoating would be another cop out, more cowardice. I was done with that road. So you had a realization that, okay, you read through all this stuff and instead of saying, well, okay, now that's why I've been behaving this way. It's like, no, 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 no scapegoat. Yeah, I mean you can't. You, re- I mean you, you can maybe you can give yourself a little bit of a like because I tend to carry a lot of I tend to place a lot of burden on myself like for shit I've done in my life and maybe it makes it a little easier to be like all right whatever you know let some of that stuff in the past it makes it easier to let things in the past go, but you can't use you can't use it moving forward or you just fuck your life up. Mm-hmm. You have to just except that this is a thing. And really, like even like let's say the impulsivity stuff or the trouble organizing, well, you gotta find a workaround. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that's, a, that's a, and, and just think, if you, if you think to yourself, well, oh, I have uh, PTSD and TBI, that's why I'm impulsive. Now you're just like, oh, and I'm cleared hot yeah. <laughs> to be even more impulsive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We or didn't stand up again like a month. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or, or oh, I, I have trouble organizing things. That's why I'm late to the, you know, whatever. That's why I didn't turn in this thing. Like, yeah, you can use that excuse. Or like you said, you can say, oh, I know I have trouble organizing, so I got to write stuff down. I got to make a plan. I got to put reminders there, whatever. Yeah. Freaking actually take ownership of it. Um. A good friend of mine in a Green Beret we call Preacher stopped over around the time I had discovered this problem. While we were visiting, I shared with him my new worldview about the importance of humility and acceptance and how I felt the mountain could teach a man both things. Then he tells you this. There is a forbidden mountain hike on the big island of Hawaii that you have got to do. You have to start your ascent around midnight so you can reach the peak before sunrise. The view is incredible. Echo Charles? I don't know which one not is familiar? talking about. Not familiar? <laughs> not off it's, of it's, that. It's info. overlooking Hilo. Do you, <clears throat> is it a name? Does it Mauna a name? It's Mauna Kea, and he was being totally full of shit. It's not, <laughs> he was just trying to get me to go. It's not a forbidden <laughs> hike. Oh, he just called it that? Yeah, he just, he was like, yeah, yeah there's this trail. It's illegal, man. You got to just <laughs> jump on it. And I was like, all right. I'll tell you something about Mauna Kea. That's the first time I ever saw snow in my life. Hmm. Mauna Kea. What's the altitude? Do you know the altitude? 13.3. Oh, it's 13.3. Damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's high. And there's like, at the very top, it's hard. There, you know, there's, there is, there's like nine or 10 different peaks, like small ones, you know, whoops. Like, so, because it's a volcano, right? So there's like lots of little, like extra, it's hard to tell which is like the real peak. I mean, there's the observatory, but. Yeah. But then there's all those. I mean, I don't know why I'm looking at you like you don't fucking know. <laughs> You're like, bro, well, a little bit. He knows a little bit. He's okay. from Hawaii. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Oh. That's why I'm still not an expert on Mauna Kea, though. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you get this goal. You start freaking training. Because you're going to go climb the Forbidden Mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, on your way there, you, you, you get on the, the dating app. Mm-hmm. And you swipe right, <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> and on on a on a female, a girl named Randy, R A N D E. That's why you're sitting in the airport at Salt Lake, and then you land, and you find you land in Kona. You find out that you had she had matched, mm-hmm. dude. I did this. I'm I'm too old. For all that, like I, I mean, I was married, and I'm just too old. I missed that whole, yeah. what, that whole thing, yeah. the whole thing. To think back in the day, mm-hmm. you had to just randomly meet a female out of all the millions of females, yeah. and now you can just literally go on and just access, yeah, upon access, access upon access. Well, and the problem I didn't and pre, have was, kind of a pre-screened access too. Yeah, like hey. 
Like it's you. You're writing about. You're looking at her little profile, and she's like shooting a bow, right? <laughs> yeah. And like whatever, she's uh, got a dog. She's shooting her bow. Yeah. You're like check. <laughs> Pre-screened. Hey, I want someone that I want a female that is brunette and knows how to shoot a, <laughs> shoot archery. Yep. Like good to go. Absolutely. But I cut you off. What were you gonna say? No, 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 no. It. Uh, it I had you know I tried like the bar like. If you're in your mid 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 to late twenties, I mean I don't know really where you meet chicks. You know it's like the the bar or the grocery store, and so like I tried the bar thing. That shit don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like willing to try just about anything at that point. And a lot of people say like go to church, and I guess that's probably a good answer. But I uh-huh. I, didn't, I didn't go to church. So but I mean even if you went to church, you could meet. How many girls at church? Nine, right? Yeah, you know, maybe I mean, like yeah. 20, 20, 13? I don't know. Yeah, but you go on the app and it's like you can meet how many? A million, yeah, a million knows. girls, right? Echo Charles. I, don't I know, know you don't know either, but I'm saying because you're the technical expert here. You're the tech guy. <laughs> I, I would guess one million. Yes, sure. <laughs> right? Sure. Am I wrong? I don't know if you're. It's got to be a that. lot, right? A I, lot of people use the interwebs. Lot. It's got to be a lot. It's true. You know what? I actually do know. You know why? Because I got friends that are kind of in the game kinda still. The game. Okay. Yeah. Oh. And they'll be like, bro. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. A it's million. a million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but of those good. millions, you swipe right on the bow hunter. Yeah. And, or at least the archery. And, yeah, and you land there. Um, you end up sending her like a, just a text back. And then you end up climbing this mountain. Um, I'm gonna fast forward past the details of the climb. It's pretty cool to read about the climb and what what happened on that. You have another, uh, like you have some more, uh, let's say, moments of discovery in that. And and I'll say this: you say the Forbidden Mountain, allegedly Forbidden Mountain, is the gateway to the grandest sunrise on earth. I reflected on my life atop that volcano, all 29 years of it. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward now to the to the kind of the I guess it's this a little bit of the summation of what what you talk about towards the end of this and the things that you figured out. And again, I'm hitting the highlights. This is a book, uh, almost 300 page book of lessons for for anyone for any human being. Filled with lessons for any human being. Here are some of them. I spent almost a decade suffering things in my youth I never could have imagined. Some caused by life. Some were caused by associating with the wrong people. Other bouts by society. But most can be laid directly at my own feet. So many more, so many of our problems. It's a lot more than we think. The problems that we caused. The problems that we initiated. Yeah, look, like you said, life's gonna bring some at you. Some, some, some people are gonna bring them at you sometimes. Sometimes society's gonna bring these problems to you. But way more than we think are because of us. Back to the book. When I was wounded, I made a clear choice. One of the few choices I ever made that I'm deeply proud of. I decided that I would rather put my flesh in harm's way than have a friend of mine put at risk for reasons that I did not think were worthy. When I was lying on the ground bleeding to death, I was in a great deal of pain, torment that you cannot imagine if you've not endured it. But it wasn't suffering. I was serving my country, my family, and my brothers. I didn't truly suffer until I started lying to myself and to others about my problems with nightmares, stress, and sleep. Those lies built into other lies and those lies built into more until one day I was a suicidal, nihilistic addict. I created my own hell and it nearly destroyed my soul. You continue on a little bit further. You can't hide from a dragon or he will burn down your entire village and all that you love and care about with it. You must face him. 
When I ran from the dragons, my life crumbled, the spirit split apart and burned. It was like my soul itself was fractured. Then one day I decided I would face my problems one at a time. I wanted to own them. When I did, or at least started to, I improved almost instantaneously. Then more pumped up, more dragons. I think this is why we feel overwhelmed when we try to take on our problems. There are always dozens more than we thought there were, and it's not until we emerge from our cowardly little hiding places that we can see them all clearly. This overwhelming feeling can crush us if we have not stiffened our spine for combat. That is why I think it's important that we crush our most pressing physical obstacles before we try to take on the mental ones. If we can stop eating terrible diets that we know are killing us, if we can run when others say we can't walk, if we can put down the bottle that is drowning our soul, then we know we can do anything. The lessons we learn on the physical journey will steal our resolve for the longer, much harder fight for our mental and spiritual health. Sometimes when we first emerge and feel completely overwhelmed, we run back to our hiding places. We see so many little dragons that we are afraid of the aggregate of issues that will demolish us. Maybe that isn't the worst thing. Sometimes armies must retreat in order to regroup and acquire some help before they fight another day. We can use this philosophy as well, but we can't make it a habit. We must go back into the fray again the moment we are ready, and again. Then we become practiced. We have dulled our swords on so many small dragons that we understand their weaknesses as well as we do our own. This gives us the ability to take them out more easily, to see them for the minuscule issues that they often are. Fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. The best antidote for fear is experience. The first step then is to get the physical body in order no matter what that takes, no matter how steep the climb may be. The next is to stand up for truth in your own life all the time. I swore an oath to my brothers in Arlington. I failed to keep it many times and probably will fail again, but I am on the course right now. Those failures will happen less and less often as I gain more and more experience. You may not have a national shrine to cling as your guiding light, but maybe you're a mother or a father. You have your children and their futures. Certainly my kids are the centerpiece of my life now. What better thing could you do for them than to get yourself together, to lead by example, to face your mistakes, fears, and the chaos of life with a steeled spirit and selfless heart? What better thing could you do? Nothing. Teach them to manifest courage, integrity, honor, and selflessness in their own lives by living those virtues so fully that they cannot help but to see them displayed. Slay your dragons or they will consume you. Slay your dragons or they will consume you. Have you ever read my book, Mikey and the Dragons? No. Oh, um, God. Okay. I'll be giving it to you shortly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, how, how old is your youngest? Uh, my youngest is eight months old. Uh, my daughter's 14 years old, and my sons are three and four. Okay, cool. We, so got, eight we, months, three, we got Mikey and the Dragons candidates there. Yeah. Uh, so... The book is just outstanding. Um, so, like I said, so many lessons learned in there. You did it. Did you, you Did you go to college? I went for like a minute. What'd you study? Um, it was all like the you know, like the stuff that you have to do, the prereq stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, like your two years. How long did it take you to write this? Like I mean, eight months, a year, something mm-hmm. like that. I wrote a lot of that out of a backpack in a leather. I wrote the whole thing in a leather bound, in two leather bound uh, journals with a fountain pen because I'm a fucking nerd. (laughs) And then (laughs) I transferred that onto a computer. Leather bound notebook and a fountain pen. You still have that? Oh, yeah. I got both of them. That's pretty legit. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I don't have any cool stories like that. I'm like a like uh, sitting there with a word processor. I have no none of that stuff. You talk about a little in the book. What? But what made you decide to start writing this? I started writing it f- at first, 
almost right after they retired me, but it was just bad. And I, I, you just like knew I wasn't ready. Like what? I don't know. I just knew I wasn't ready. And, um, and then when I was doing all those corporate gigs, uh, you know, you're always constantly getting prodded to write a book. And I was I kind of thought like, why for what? you like, I don't know. I just didn't feel like there was a story in there. And then a good friend of mine kept pushing on me, and I finally thought, well, maybe I'll give it a shot. And kind of looked around, and the you know the other the other stories that were around just didn't seem to be feeling that. They just didn't seem to be conveying exactly what I was seeing my friends go through. Mm-hmm. You know, like or me. I had some friends that were doing really great. And then I had some friends that were going to jail Mm -hmm. uh, and some, you know, one committed suicide, you know, and I just felt like no one was telling the full story. And I also didn't want, it felt like the two genres of Iraq war book were either like heroism or super whiny crybaby shit. (laughs) And I'm just, the heroism stuff is great and I mean, every culture has always done. That's great. And that should continue. But like the super whiny bitch, uh, we just, there's no reason for that. But I understand the attempt to kind of try to write something different. And I said, well, I'll just try to tell my story and hopefully it'll fit somewhere not on the whiny bitch scale, you know, (laughs) and like fill that other gap. And, you know, I I mean, I knew that I couldn't be the only guy that had had. I got to think that there's at least. 10,000 guys from the GWAT that have had similar stories, you know, maybe oh, not yeah. exact same wounds, but yeah, they're, they're definitely out there. So then, so you finished the book. This got published in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are you up to now? So obviously you married Randy. How do you say your name? Was Randy? Randy. Yeah. So you married Randy, <clears throat> you got kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and what are you doing? I start Colts, um, full time. I'm a Colt starter. And hold on, can really quickly before we go on, I just want to point out that I did say in the book that he bullshitted me, that it wasn't really forbidden on the hike. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, just to, I just want to clear that out. <laughs> oh. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, that, that was eating at me. No, okay. yeah, no. So wait, wait, when did he say that? When did he tell you it was bullshit, that it wasn't forbidden? Before you hiked it? Well, he didn't have to tell me. Once I got oh, to Oh, once there, you got I there, was, there was a big oh, trail sign? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So it was before you got there. He said, hey, it's not really forbidden. No, no, no. I'm saying I put in the book that he was bullshitting me. Does this make sense? What I was saying is I just don't want someone out there listening, thinking that I was calling this a forbidden hike because people would be like, Oh, what the hell is he talking about? Right, right. Apparently, the only person that thought it was a forbidden hike was me. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. no, yeah. So, uh, but I'm a colt starter, so I train train horses, start colts, and and train some horses. And I've been working on another book for a while. Uh, nothing to do with me. To do with uh, the roots of um, like America. Um, the best way I think I would articulate it is. When people, when you ask somebody what it means to be American, they have all of these ideas of where that that sort of ethos came from. And my contention is that it was born on the pioneers, in the, excuse me, on the American frontier by pioneers from, you know, Kentucky all the way to California. I mean, like you can point to, like, if, let's say like this, if you were to ask an American to describe what it means to be an American, they're going to talk about shit like fortitude, perseverance, loyalty, dedication, love of family, country, you know, spirit, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can point to like Valley Forge and maybe a couple of battles. But other than that, the eastern seaboard was like pretty much Europe 2.0. You know, I, I'm saying it's glorious, lots of war glories there. And we fought, our forefathers fought hard to steal Europe 2.0 from them. But everything that happened on the frontier was new. It had never happened in, well, hadn't happened in 10,000 years, anything like that before. And so that's why America felt so different because it had really had a totally different birth Mm -hmm. than any of these other nations. So I've been working on that for a while. Uh, And then, you know, like I say, ride Colts, and then I run this bunkhouse deal where I take guys out once a month to train on different things. And, like, last weekend – we were doing some advanced home defense training 
in Utah with a Green Beret dude working on, in shoot houses and stuff like that. And we've <laughs> taken dudes up hunting and uh, we've, we've run, I, I just facilitate all these mm-hmm. courses, but we've done field med courses and, uh, yeah, probably we've done long range precision courses with some guys and yeah, we just, so I, anyway, these are basically my main focus and, uh, so far as work goes. And then after that, it's just family. How big is your, your ranch? I, so as a horse trainer, I can only ride. Well, it used to be I could ride about 10 a month, but now I have kind of have too many other things. So now I can only ride about six a month. So I keep about 15 head of horses at my house at any one time. And then once they're ready, I sell them mm-hmm. and then move on. And, then. and and what's the name of the company that does all like the tactical training? Uh, bunkhouse. It's the Bunkhouse LLC, but it's not just tactical stuff. Like I've taught basic horsemanship with them. I, I did a backcountry navigation course with some people. Uh, toss of uh, how to hunt basics course to people like how to hunt the mountains basic stuff so we try to spread out like jack of all trades type skills as much as we can kind of become more generalist who are your clients <clears throat> these guys well it's all it's just a membership deal so it's oh, members cool. and then they just come and we just take them out and every wednesday we have some expert for somewhere to come on and uh, we'll just do a quick zoom call and they'll have an hour like usually me and that guy or girl will just have a back and forth and then we'll open it up and they can ask questions and cover different you know whatever it how is. how many people are members of the bunkhouse we don't have a lot like 350 something like that so it's easy to get into courses you mm-hmm. know it's super easy but yeah i do that it's kind of like a side passion project thing and if people want to do that where do they go to sign up for that bunkhouse.braxmccoy.com Check. It's super, yeah. So you said that's your side project. What's your main project? Riding Colts. That's the deal, huh? Yeah, that's my jam. <laughs> I love that shit. It, 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 I love it. Yeah, so I've always loved it. But now, I think it's really good for me mentally now too, because you can't like young horses. You got to stay present and focused. You can't. You can't be thinking about other shit or worrying about other shit. You got to be on that horse. You know, like with him all the time. So I think it's good for me too. How long does the transition take before they're ready to go out to, to before you're ready to uh, give them to somebody else or sell them to somebody else? It depends a lot on the horse. Uh, it depends a lot on the horse. So if I'm riding like an outside horse, it'd be like a client's horse. I'll usually ride them for 60 to 90 days for them and then send them off. But I only do a little bit of that now because I, I wrote so many for people that they would take them and then just not ride them after they left. And the problem is, like, you get a two-year-old that you put 60 days on, and then the owner goes and just parks it in a pasture for, like, six months and then goes to try to get on it the next Oof. spring. It's like the horse doesn't even remember anything, you know. So now I only ride colts for outside horses for, for one big ranch that's a neighbor of mine. They, they run a big old spread. But I'll, I'll ride them for them because they'll take them and use them as soon as they get them back. Um, but so the average, I would say, it depends on what you're asking that horse to do. But if you're trying to build like a safe trail horse, you could get a lot done, depending on the age of that horse. But you could get a lot done in a summer, as long as the other person will take him back and use them. Now, if you're sending it off to somebody who's like good and knows what they're doing, then usually they'll ask for 60 or 90 days mm-hmm. riding on them and then take them. But like my stud horse, I bought him from that ranch I was just talking about because I was starting him for them. And I had, uh, well, Dwight Hill, probably the best horse trainer in the country, came out to help me with him, rope him for me that first day. He wanted to show me some tricks. Uh, and so we, I rode him that day. I put that first, Dwight roped him for a bit, and then I rode him. And then I took him out and roped him myself the next day. And then I rode him two more times. And then that fifth time, I took him out moving cattle for like 12 miles for that ranch. Dang. Yeah, and he was when he's a two year old. So it really depends on the horse what you can get done. Now he wasn't he sure as hell wasn't broke by then, but he was he was easy compared to a lot of other ones. He was getting there. What about your hunting? Uh I mean, what's September looking like? I'm you know, I'm hammered September. I got a New Mexico buck tag that I'm super excited about. I got a a friend of mine gave me actually he's a, a mutual friend of Micah and I's Gave me a, a wine cut bull elk tag. 
So that's I'm stoked for that. And then obviously I got my elk hunt in Idaho, and I got one buddy coming up to hunt in Idaho that I promised I'd take for a week. So I really don't have a day off in September. Is that is that all bow? Yeah, for me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Freaking awesome. Uh, what else, man? What does that get us up to present day? Is there anything else you need to tell us about? No, I mean, no. So a couple of things did happen that weren't in that book. I, that IVC filter, that it, it's like up in your vena cava, kind of behind behind your kidneys, essentially. Yeah, just so everyone, I didn't read this part, but they, they, they had to put like a filter in your body to prevent clots from getting, what, to your lungs? Yeah. And it's a, some kind of mesh filter that they put in. It just prevents bl- blood clots from going through that screen. It's basically a screen, and they had to put it in. And so you've had that in you for, what, freaking a long time, 15 years. Something yeah, like well, yeah years. well, I had it in for 12, um, and the, I went in. So I, I was running endurance races for a while, doing really good, and actually like competitive in every race. I should have won the first one. But how, many, how far? The first one I ran was a duathlon, so it was a two mile run, or it might have been a yeah, it was a two mile run, and then I think a twenty mile bike ride, and then a two mile run. It's the first one, mm. and then I was training for an ultra when I had this issue with my heart, and. I went in and they said I had a heart attack. And I was like, well, that's great. <laughs> so then I, I had to quit training because, you know, heart attack. Well, <laughs> it ended up it, that it wasn't a heart attack, which is great. So I, I go up to the University of Utah. Oh, and this the filter, the way this filter ties in here is the – I could get that out of my hands. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> and my doctor's like, it's there's a potential – that your filter is just like releasing protein into your blood, you know, because like, like I guess the way, like it's damaging that blood vessel in there mm-hmm. and it's releasing protein. Cause I guess the way that it take a heart attack is protein in your bloodstream, a certain type of protein in your Got bloodstream. Uh, and that's what they had detected. So he's like, I said, can we get this thing out then? You know, like, cause I'd really like to do this whole ultra deal. And he said, no, you're stuck with that. It's been in there for too long. There's no way it's coming out. So I came home and got, you know, on Google, we start looking and look like probably right. Like you probably couldn't get it out. So then I That's went. That's what I do when the doctor tells me something. I go home and Google, Google it. it. Yeah, like, what like, up? This dude don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> exactly. I think you got Google, son. <laughs> WebMD. What? <laughs> so I went and got on JSTOR and started looking for any article I could find. And a turn or any paper rather I could find, and then turned out there's a doctor up a radiologist I think he is I'm pretty sure up in Penn State that had done had to had removed like three or four of them or some shit uh, at like I forget seven or eight years in and I was over that but you know so the max that I could find that had been length of time that I could find that had been removed was like seven or eight years. So meanwhile, I'm doing all this heart shit in between trying to figure this out. Well, finally, my my wife was like, why don't you just call the University of Utah and just ask the radiology department? I was like, those bitches, they don't, it's like, I can't find anything from them in the J store. Like, what do they know? You know? So she calls and she's like, hey, they said that you can come up for a consultation on Wednesday and that they do this all the time. They can get it out. I was like, okay. So we go up there. And meanwhile, I'm still waiting on all my heart prognosis stuff, right? And we go up there and, and meet with the, the radiologist, and he's like, yeah, come in on Friday. We'll take it out. I was like, okay. Why is it a radiologist? Uh, because the way the procedure works is they have to keep you awake, and they put some shit in your uh, in your oh, blood so they so can, they can see track it. it. Yeah. Track. So he, he's like, coming on Friday. And meanwhile, my primary care physician told me, he's like, man, you know, if you try to get this removed, your, your vena cava could rupture. And, you mm-hmm. know, like, you're, there's no way to plug that. And so I'm all, like, stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, bro, you can give me, like, a week to think? <laughs> so it ended up getting pushed off until the next Friday. But I went in, and they got that sucker out. It was, like, I guess the way, the way this guy had done it was – so at the top of that deal, there's like a little loop. And that, I mean, that's how it was designed to be able to be removed. If So they push this thing onto it and try to squish it together like this because it looks almost like an umbrella without 
a skirt on it. Mm-hmm. So they would push a deal over it that would kind of squish the umbrella together. And if that doesn't work, then there's a loop on top of the filter, and they would try to hook a thing on it and pull it out with that. But if that thing, the reason that people weren't able to get them out is if that thing straightened out, now you just have like a sharp thing Yeesh. in there and like how to get it out. So what this guy had done, he must have grew up like blue car or something because he was like, I'll just put a damn alligator clamp on there and just <laughs> shove that bitch down. So that's what he did. <laughs> he invented like this tool. Anyway, he got that out, which was great. Uh, I mean, it was like my arm was stuck like this for a couple of days because they go down your jugular to rip it out. Um <laughs> <clears throat> so that was good. I just wanted to like update. It was good. That thing's out of there and I don't have to worry about dying. Cause they, my freaking doctor, <laughs> when I went in, he's like, he's like, well, eventually that, you know, that IBC filter will just plug up. Mm. And I was like, well, how long? Yeah. What's that? Doesn't sound cool. Yeah. And he's like, oh, 10, 15 more years, probably maybe 30. I'm like, bro, I'm freaking 31 years old. man. <laughs> like, or what was I 20? Yeah. I'm probably 30 at the time. Um, so anyway, they got that out, which was great. And then we pushed on on the heart stuff, and it turned out that my heart was actually okay. They One of the scans, so they did an echo, and then whatever that other one is where they uh, put you through a CT and they look at some shit, I forget. But anyway, they'd give you like a, a calcium score on your arteries and all this. And uh, I had a calcium score of zero. So I told my wife, I was like, I got goddamn baby arteries. Like, I want to hear no more shit about all my steaks. Is that because you had a filter in there for so long, or why is that? I don't know. I don't really care. I, I just, <laughs> I don't want like, I don't want to hear any sh- more shit about bacon and eggs and fatty steaks. Jack. My shit's good. Really Bring good. up the ribeyes, son. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it turns, it actually, it turned out I just had a scar on my heart from getting hit in the plates with the explosion. Oh, damn. So, so my heart's what good What did your now. plates look like after the... Do you know? Yeah, I could. Oh, I got them. Yeah, I can show you a picture. Actually, were they jacked up? Not really. The so I my the plates I had had a steel backer on them. Mm-hmm. There's like a, I think they were. I can't remember what level they were at the time. Um, my my uncle was. A, Did you have side sappy plates in? No, Jack. No, I took everything on the front. Um, yeah, my uncle was like a. I can't remember if he's a major or a light colonel in the Air Force, like a, a wreck investigator or something. And he had just rotated out, and he had bought these fancy-ass plates, so he just mailed them to me. Sweet. So I had those in. So it worked Dang. out. Because I took, I can't remember if it's five or six in the plate. And the craziest part is That's the, game over, man. Oh, you fucking. 100%. Two of them are like right here. I mean. Right by the heart. You'd be toast. Mm-hmm. Like, you're almost dead before you hit the ground. Yeah. Yeah, and the craziest part about those plates is I didn't realize this until one of my engineer buddies came over the other day, and he was, like, checking them out, put them on my counter, and it's, like, warped, like, wobbles. Mm. <laughs> so it's like I hit hard enough to, like, tweak it. Yeah. What was the range that you got hit from? Probably 15 meters-ish. And luckily, you know, I had my head down like this, I guess like this. Mm-hmm. So probably my K-pot took a lot of that concussion Oh, yeah. Instead of taking it all right here. Man. Um, does that get us up to present day? Yeah, man. Everything's good now. <laughs> I got four kids and life is fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking outstanding, man. Outstanding. Uh, if people want to find you, um, you got Brack- BraxtonMcCoy.com. Yeah, that's like a central location for you on Instagram. You're at Braxton McCoy. Braxton dot McCoy. Oh, sorry. All it's right, all Braxton good. McCoy. That's B R X T O N. B R A X. All right, cool. Uh, B R A X. Freaking people getting super sensitive about this. B R A X T O N dot McCoy, and on Twitter, you're Braxton underscore McCoy. If people want to follow you or uh, find you, you can find in any of those places. And you're doing, you're still, are you still speaking to companies or speaking to people or not really? The coronavirus kind of killed it for me. Check, check. Um, Echo Charles. <clears throat> yeah. You got any questions over there? Yeah. Remember we were talking about your IT band? Yeah. So where are we at with that? I mean, does it get <laughs> like jammed up or what? Because that's kind of a big deal, right? Yeah. It's I like split down the, down the middle kind of. Yeah. Every morning I, I heat up. A bath as hot as I can 
tolerate it every morning yeah and i i mean like if i'm at a hunting or training i can't but other otherwise every morning hard as i get it and sit in there for 20 minutes and just try to stretch it with my hands and then i get out and stretch as much as i can and then i roll it and just hope for the best yeah does it like like after a bout of like physical activity does it like act up or like right after or whatever especially hunting yeah especially yeah my knees get jacked and it starts to dig, dig with my hips too and my low back starts to get weird even just yeah everything gets kind of just out of place and then you said you have b ball bearings in you still yeah damn how many uh i think it's around eight or so i have to i got there's a picture on my instagram i'll look and see that's crazy and how big are these they're like uh size of a pea like a marble? A little bigger than a pea. Yeah, that's oh, a good. Marble? Smaller than a marble, slightly bigger than a pea. I just say a pea, roughly a pea. Like it, they're, literal, they're literally wheel bearings is what they are. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Like, that's they, pretty typical with S-Vest scenarios. Yeah, but, but they could put, like you were saying earlier, like they could put like nails and yeah. just random like BS. bolts, nuts, just any metal crap that'll freaking rip you apart. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Good to what, meet you, bro. What have you done with Thank Micah? Uh, I, I haven't done it. No, I have never met him. Oh, okay. We just have a mutual friend. Oh, right. I know on. a guy that knows him. You guys definitely need to link up. That's what he said. Yeah, <laughs> he's freaking <laughs> awesome. Uh, any any closing thoughts, bro? No, just thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I'm sorry it took so long, <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us. More important, obviously, man. Thanks for what you did in Ramada. You, you and the rest of the guys in the 228 did an incredible job taking the fight to the enemy and um, prepared the battlefield for us when we got there and, and also made incredible sacrifices. And we will not forget what, what you guys did. And we'll never forget your sacrifice or the sacrifices of guys like Lieutenant Colonel Michael McLaughlin and Sergeant Adam Cann and so many of the other brave soldiers and Marines who sacrificed their lives for their brothers. And we will live to honor them. And thank you for helping us find a way to do that. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. And with that, Braxton McCoy has left the building. Uh, Freaking outstanding guy and get the book the book is is just it's it's a great book i look we we scratched the surface on it there's so much stuff it's i feel like i feel like i didn't do a good job i didn't do the book justice and oh, what i read i don't know because there's a lot in there man there's a lot in there and and part of it is because you got to kind of tell the story you know what i mean yeah you got i mean at least that's what i feel i feel like you got to kind of know what's going on mm -hmm. and that kind of leads me to read a little bit more of the what's going on stuff yeah. as opposed to some of that internal dialogue and some of the discovery and stuff like that. So it's just an awesome book. Order the book. I, I feel like I enjoyed, related, mm -hmm. maybe in a weird way, more than normal mm -hmm. with Ellen. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was because of how he was too. I think just the whole thing together, I was like, I felt... Not, I mean, in a way, more into it, but more like you this connected. was like I co I connected with it yeah. a lot, like a lot more than than normal, I guess, yeah. given the circumstances. Huh. You know, you think maybe it's because he's more your age, but actually, he's not more my age. How old? I mean, he's thirty six. Yeah, I'm like forty six, eight, eight years old. How old are you? Forty four. I know I'm very youthful. I know. Mm. I know. I, know. No, I wasn't thinking youthful. Immature. Yes. Okay. That I was thinking. <laughs> okay. There you go. Um, but what, he, the the part like how he he's talking about like the alcoholism oh. and then like his anger at this and anger yeah. at that. For some reason, like the way he put it yeah. was like oh, that's so true. Yeah. Like almost like not that I necessarily felt all of that, but it was like I felt like I can see how that could be. I could totally see how that could be. And this one part that I think he like nailed was when he was like something about the existence of the devil mm. where 
alcohol and drugs are like his tools. Yeah, bro, it's so his true. Strongest tools, bro. It's so true. Like I'm almost, hesitant. I'm almost tempted to say, freak, that is the devil. That's like you know the devil's like spirit coming down For sure. and like touching people yeah. and jamming them up because it's true. Where and he was saying this. I I don't know if he said it on air, but mm-hmm. he was saying I think it was before we were recording when he was like, hey, people in school. Um, or people like teachers and stuff in school. People, when you're young, they don't tell you that drugs are like kind of good. Like they yeah. feel good. Did yeah. you say that? No, when he we were did recording? say it on there. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's like, they don't tell you that. They and lie. They lie. Yeah, and then it's it kind of jams horrible. you up. Yeah. But it's true though. It's like, and obviously different people like different drugs. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, I, I don't have that much drug experience, but the very limited that I do, like no drugs to me felt good mm-hmm. at all. Not even like painkiller. I took the all that oxy. Like, m- not morphine, but like, you know, the ones they give you for you know? surgery. Yeah. After yeah. surgery, um, Vicodin, like all these ones I Bro. took, uh, when I got neck surgery and I was like, I'm not taking anything. I'm so tough. Yeah, and then, yeah. and then I got home and the <laughs> stuff wore off and I was like, I know, give bro. me whatever they gave you yeah. to my wife. I was like, give it to me now. That's real. Yeah. Uh, but the weird thing is it didn't feel like it didn't, I didn't feel any, like even when he described like a euphoria, I didn't yeah. feel any of that. I just felt like, okay, I can go to sleep now, yeah. you know, cause I'm not in agony. Yeah. Like kills. So I didn't, pain. I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. I, yeah. I felt a little bit like weird and wo- woozy or I whatever. I didn't really even feel that. I didn't like it though. I didn't really feel that either. But then even like weed, like weed and stuff like that, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't like the feeling or whatever, except for alcohol. That's the one. That's but, your, that's your. That's where the devil gets you. Yeah. And that's where I experienced the devil scenario. Because mm-hmm. it is. It's like, oh, especially when you're having fun or you're bonding with someone and you guys are both going down memory lane all hardcore and you just don't want it to end. You're like, oh, this is, this is the best. <laughs> like, oh, this alcohol is helping it. It's helping me. You see uh, what I'm saying? Help me feel. And then like the next day, that pray. I remember I was drinking with cake nuts. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm not going to tell you when. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter when. Um, it sounds and like it was a very <laughs> recent scenario. <laughs> we and we I am working up, at the mustard. We and you ended up out drinking. <laughs> we ended up like good ex- thing you had that later flight on extend- Saturday, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Extending the good time like way past like the plan, mm-hmm. and just you know, and we're just they were doing that going down memory lane, talking trash, having yeah. a laugh, huge laughs, talking huge. Football. Oh man, it was the best. It was the best. Then the next morning we're because we're on the same not on the same flight but same time, so mm-hmm. we're all going to the airport together, and like we're sitting there. <laughs> Like, bro, why do we even do that? Like, is it how I feel right now, it's like not even worth, not worth it. it. Like, even last night was super good fun, but it's not even worth yeah. feeling like this. How much percentage of fun could you have had without alcohol the night before? Um, I I don't know. Like, let's say you had let's say you had ninety percent fun. Yeah. Without alcohol the night before, how much fun would you have had? I don't know. Hey, I don't know. I mean, because I'm tempted to say, well, yeah, 90, probably yeah. 90 or 89 or whatever. Because uh, I think but I can't, it could have been maybe like 25. I, I think I can truly have like 90%. Yeah. Like all the fun. I understand. With I or understand. without. Yeah, I understand. But like not everyone's like that. Yeah. Straight up. Where just because mm. like, especially Cake Nuts, he's kind of a reserved like person. Oh, so you, you know? had to break down that. But when we're together, it's cool. But then you could tell because there's other people mm. like Main Tai was with us mm. at some point. I don't oh, know. <laughs> they got that. It was like that, huh? <laughs> We don't even know where Main Tai was. <laughs> like, we don't know when he showed up, when he departed. <laughs> Sorry to freaking bus and throw him under the bus, yeah, but sure. nonetheless, it was like, you know, certain things you're like, oh. Um, but the key point is the next day it wasn't even worth it. wasn't worth it. And we were literally talking about how it's not worth it. So it's like a deal with, in the moment, yeah. it's more than worth it. Bro, you can, I'm thinking That's about the flight. It's, it's a, it's a complete lie. It's a complete lie, but you feel it like, to your in your bones that it's worth it at the mm-hmm. time and the next day you know the reality mm-hmm. that's the devil right there that's yes. how sneaky it is it's true and so how he put that i was like bro you're spot on spot yeah. on nope he definitely you know i even that last underground podcast we did where a guy asked you know hey you know how you know how much drinking should i be doing you know i um I, right i got yeah. the friend group they would they don't really want to drink you know how hey, what's a good way for me to drink yeah i'm just like i can't even i can't even give and as a matter of fact i saw i talked to somebody at the at the muster who was you know who's had issues yeah. 
And he said when he heard that question, he was like, please, Jocko, please say say the right thing, say the right thing. And I was like, you know, I can't even support it. He's like, yes. He goes, you can't because it's a freaking lie. Yeah, it is so, at the end of the day. It's, it's a lie, man. Let's stay clean out there. Stay clean. Stay clean. Uh, another thing he said about the ego, which like conceptually was like a lot of times, the, like you'll say this, but he said this very specific thing where he said, oh, the army should have kept me in, even mm-hmm. though he knew he couldn't have dipped yeah. in. But it's weird because like you kind of have that feeling. Yeah. It's almost like uh, under certain circumstances, obviously, like, you know, it depends on who you are. But it's like, you know how it's almost like a more advanced version of the the simple idea of like, you know, the classic like, oh, they didn't invite me to the party, yep. even though I didn't want to go. Yep. But like, yep. I still should be invited, you know, kind of because it's me. It's like a weird illusion. And if you really if you really pull the string on that, like you can blame everything like, oh, they didn't keep me in the army. That's why I'm drinking right now. Yeah. Huh. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm doing that. I'm out here. That's why I got, you know, that's why I'm in this relationship with this person. Like you can, it's, everything is just rooted in this one thing because they wouldn't keep me. That's yeah. a trap. And luckily he figured that out, man. Yeah. Luckily he figured that out. Yeah. Uh, and it's good yeah, that luckily. other people hopefully can recognize these things. You know, um, another big point, physical. Yeah. The physical well-being yeah. is paramount. Yeah. You gotta be, you gotta, man, you gotta get, you gotta get up in the morning. You yeah. gotta get after it. Yeah. You gotta get up at 4.30, no. Do you gotta be at five, no. But getting up consistently, doing some work, yeah. so good for you, man. So good for you. So, oh, yeah. ton of lessons there. Yep. So get the on board. that. Instead of drinking vodka. Yeah, I got a better idea. We'll drink the discipline go. Yeah. How about that? Drink a monk. Yeah, or a monk. Yeah, both. Drink a monk, Daily. drink some go. Drink some, maybe even wanna drink a little bit of that. Pre workout discipline go. Sarah goes, uh, my wife says, um, she was like, you know what you should do? You should make a video. And it was, this is like such an old concept. I've right? yeah. seen videos like this. Dude, God, bless her. Don't, so, don't, bless her. Don't do, don't do her like that right now. <laughs> such a, she just doesn't watch a good that much. idea. Go she ahead. just doesn't watch I like her idea. What was it? She doesn't watch that much TV like I do. So, on Sarah. But she, Sarah Charles. She was like, I got you, Sarah. She was like, you know what you should do? You should do a video like showing like how discipline go. The energy drink is like it's an energy drink, but it doesn't have sugar in it. And then show this other energy drink that you can't show the label, label of course. And then just show how much sugar is in it. And then do the equivalent. You know how they used to yeah, do yeah, the yeah, scoops yeah, yeah. of sugar yeah. and be like, this is how much sugar you're drinking. She's like, do a video like that. It's yeah. like, that would be good. I was like, you know what would be yeah, funny is if we started idea. the video that, like that, but then we started saying it like, oh, and here's a scoop of rat poison <laughs> and arsenic. And we just started pouring like actual. <laughs> Just boys good there. We'll do it. I'm good. Yeah, good idea. See? See, AD Jocko over here. Yeah, but it all originated with Sarah Charles, creative genius, creative director. And you're over there naysaying. <laughs> Maybe you need some discipline. Go, homie. <laughs> Uh, if you want to get some discipline, go. You want to get some milk? Go to JockoFuel.com. Hook that up. Go to the vitamin shop. Go to mm-hmm. Wawa. Go to HEB down in Tejas. Mm-hmm. Yep, we got it going on. So we're spreading, check that stuff out. Also, originusa.com, origin forgot to tell Braxton that we got hunt gear coming. He will, he will get to hunt in some American made gear. You know he doesn't wanna buy stuff from China or from overseas, 100%. He, there's only one kind of hunting gear he is wanting, and that's American made hunting gear. So we'll get you some of that, originusa.com. If you want some of that, if you need jujitsu gear, if you need a t-shirt, if you need a sweatshirt, if you need a pair of boots, jeans. Jeans, I, I got probably, two, two I, pair on yeah, the way. Yeah, I should I should oh. have talked to Braxton about that as well because you know he wants to wear American made everything. Yeah, yeah, I do um, fully. It's with it. OriginUSA.com, JockoStore.com, what do we got there? We've got some, a lot of, uh, how should I say, yeah, the various things, but mainly it's apparel, <laughs> apparel. <laughs> you wanna represent. On this path, apparel, uh, discipline equals freedom. Yeah. Good. We're restocking some stuff. We're going hard. Yeah. Oh, wait. So we ran out of stock. We That's what out. I'm hearing <laughs> from. I said, you just put yourself on report. Oh, <laughs> it's it a re- life I live. Hey, look, it we're doing better. It was pretty cool to see at the muster of people representing with the shirt locker shirts. Yeah. You can see that those are, it seems like they're kind of hitting. Strong kinda representation. La- as you like to say, landing. <laughs> they're landing. People are kind of stoked. Very much. People yeah. are kind of stoked because that's just, that's just like full representation. Like, yeah. I, like, yeah, I'm in the game over here on oh, my yeah. side. What about you? <laughs> it's it's funny too because people will like come to me and ask me like, "Hey, where did that guy get that shirt?" Sure, that shirt locker all day, bro. all day. But yeah, that's how like that's so what's how the deal? Can people landing. buy an old shirt from the shirt locker if desired? Yeah. So basically, it goes like this: 
Join Shirt Locker. Membership, subscription, 34 mm-hmm. a month. Yes, you get a new shirt every month. And if you want. If you want, you have ex- access, exclusive access to like, yeah, all the, all the other stuff. You it's like a private the, store. Okay. You can buy anyone, anyone from See, the See, that's, that's, that's what's called observing the feedback loop. Yes. The feedback loop was some people wanted some of those uh, other shirts that yes. were, had come out. Yeah, they so they thought they missed it. So it's like, oh, I missed that one shirt, and that's kind of you know the one. And then maybe two, three months later, they're like, oh, I All missed this, that one yeah. again. You see what I'm saying? So it's like they they felt like apparently that was almost like a like a gamble, mm-hmm. you know? But it's not a gamble. There's no gamble. No gamble. It's a win. It's Success. a win win. Uh, check that out. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to Jocko Underground. JockoUnderground dot com is where we're, we're we're answering a bunch of questions. We're talking about topics. We're getting deep into uh, aspects that we might not hit here but that are very integral to living and crushing and doing well. So jockounderground.com, it's also where we are because in case we get kicked off of this platform or some other platform, uh, we got our own platform, jockounderground.com. If you wanna join, if you wanna help out on that, $8.18 a month. And if you can't afford it, we look, it's okay. We want you in the game. Email assistance at jockounderground.com. Check out the YouTube channel. Check out Psychological Warfare. Check out Flipside Canvas with Dakota Meyer making cool stuff to hang on your wall. That's a good idea. Books, you can get a bunch of books. I wrote a bunch of them. Also, Braxton wrote one. It's called The Glass Factory. When I'm saying this right now, whenever you're listening to this, there's only 300 hardcovers left at at braxtonmccoy.com. They ain't gonna last long. If, If they are, get one. That's a first edition that you ain't, you know, you ain't coming by again. If they don't have that, cool, get it from Amazon. Um, you'll get a one that's printed on demand, which is still awesome because it's a great book. So many lessons learned. Only cry for the living. Check out Holly McKay's book. She's been on here before. Wrote a fantastic book. She risked her freaking life to write. So go check that one out. And then I written a bunch of books. You know what they are. Get the get, get the kids books. I just realized I didn't give. Braxton, a copy of Mike and the Dragons. I'll have to send it to him. Braxton, hit me up. Um, so I've written a book, a bunch of books. Check them out. Echelon Front Leadership Consultancy. Just just finished the muster, as we were just talking about. Uh, next one is Atlanta. Hot Atlanta. October 12th through the 14th. We're going to sell out. COVID's over now, officially. A fish. Officially over. Because people do not care. <laughs> and... Uh, we're, we're back to the pre-COVID numbers at muster. So it's going to sell out. There you go. Battlefield. We're doing EF Battlefield at Little Bighorn. It's almost sold out. I think there's literally two more seats. Probably not by the time you listen to this. But if you want to go to Little Bighorn with us, uh, check that out. All that stuff, echelonfront.com. Also, we have the Academy, extremeownership.com. We're teaching this stuff all the time. Just did a live event today, interacting with everybody that's on there. If you have questions on how to handle a situation, just go on there and you can ask me and we can interact. You can give me the details, the deets. Have you heard this expression? Yeah, from you. It's lame, isn't it? <laughs> no, bro, I like it. Good, keep it. Uh, if you wanna help out service members, active and retired, their families, Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee, she has an awesome charity organization. What she does is she helps people, helps veterans that need medical help that the government's not paying for. So if you help her, she will help veterans that need it. America's Mighty Warriors.org. Also, we talked a couple times about Micah today, his organization, heroesandhorses.org. It's the first time I've gotten that thing right. So it's dot org. Mm-hmm. He's taken vets up into the wilderness for 41 days. 41 days? I think so. Yeah. 41 days on a horseback. Dude, it's freaking awesome. And uh once again, Braxton, what a what a what a stud, what a hero, what an awesome guy. You can follow him. He's on the web if you want to talk to him. BraxtonMcCoy.com. His Instagram is Braxton.McCoy. His Twitter is Braxton underscore McCoy. Hit him up. Of course, on the Twitter, on the gram, on the Facebook. Echoes at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willink. Listen, you go on there, cool. I don't mind you going. I don't mind you checking in. Don't don't dwell. Don't hang out there. Don't move in there. Don't say, oh, I'm going to look at this other thing and this other thing and this other thing. And just like that little dopamine grabs you by the, by the freaking throat and pulls you in there. Don't do it. 
Otherwise, like at my house right now, I had a couple people. I had a couple people from the underground. Mm-hmm. Dopamine, dopamine. Dude. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know that don't have the JockoUnderground.com, at my house right now, if you pull out your phone yeah. with my family, people just start going dopamine, 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 <laughs> dopamine. So, it's real. Yeah, it's real. It's a real thing. It's. It's it's what we're doing. It's keeping people in check. I'm putting my phone back away because it's yeah. annoying, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. don't let that happen. Uh, but you can find us there. Just watch out for the algorithm. Special thanks to all the military personal personnel out there, especially our wounded warriors who continue to fight long after the war is over. We salute you and thank you for everything you have done and everything you continue to do for our country and our way of life. Thank you to the wounded vets. And also to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, all the first responders out there, you also sacrifice every day to protect our way of life here at home. And we thank you for that. And to everybody else, remember these lessons learned from Braxton. They're, they're, they're so important. And look, they're so hard earned from Braxton for what he went through to figure these things out and then to pass them on to us. The lessons, do not lie to yourself. That will be the main source of your suffering. We often create the vast majority of our own problems. And listen, I get it. I get that you can't control everything. No one can control everything. But take ownership of what you can control. And it's usually a lot more than you think. And then sharpen your sword. Sharpen your sword. And by that, I mean your body, your mind, your spirit. And then go out there into the world and slay those dragons. And until next time, Zeko and Jocko, out.